and Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Please, please, please never do that. Yep. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 466 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, everyone? The season has started. Lots to talk about. We're in Boston. Got the gang together once again, two weeks in a row recording together. Let's start it. Paul, biz nasty, biz nut, the traveling man, wood shaking. All right, you're fucking humming right now. Uh, this might be the best start to the season I've ever seen this guy have. He's feeling himself. And <laughs> he I looks it. good and too. I love it. I look too early. Look good. Maybe almost put a little weight back on it him as opposed because yeah. you went through that huge weight loss without working out or anything, which was somehow a miracle. But <laughs> anxiety. Yeah, I, 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 I got to pump your tires too. Well, Biz, go ahead. What, what have you been up to? Buddy? No, I want to hear the story you got. So I, um, I went to the uh, BU US National Development Program game Saturday night, and USNDTP put a beat down on 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 my terriers eight one dude cole eiserman hattie cole eiserman is a freak um I'll, I'll say that like the team you know bu's had a little tough start they lost to unh friday night then they had the exhibition kind of a tough showing their two backups played so it wasn't the starter but but it's a little bit of of a of a rough start in terms of being number one preseason but a lot of hockey left you'd rather have it happen now than in march so you jump on the wagon and don't, even bring, don't <laughs> even bring it up don't even bring it up well i said i'm gonna end up getting like fired and be like george costanza like i don't even work here <laughs> so uh no it's it, it's it's it, the story's more about after the game um matt gill Roy, who's a good good buddy of mine, he played in the NHL a while and in Europe with Tampa, uh, right? Yeah, he was with he was with Tampa. He's with Florida. He's with a bunch of different teams, and then um, he was at BU after me. But then when I was over in the KHL, he was playing over there. So whenever we'd play each other, we'd have dinner and stuff like that. He's now the assistant coach of the under eighteen team with uh, Ryan Bork, who's who's Ray Bork's son, Chris's brother. They're the two assistants, and uh, got to meet you know the head coach and talk to the team a little bit. I just went in and just talked to him for about a minute and then went around and shook everyone's hand. And as I'm walking out, they said, um, where's RA? But a couple guys yelled it. And I said, holy shit, you guys, RA fans? They're like, fucking rights, we're RA fans. We got to meet that guy. I said, this guy is buzzing so right even now. the kids love him. The kids love him. And then after I was talking to like four or five of them just for 10 minutes, and they were just asking me all about RA, asking me where he came from, what his story <laughs> is. They need to meet him. What they if, want what him on, they want can, him on, they, they bring RA They in. want him on sandbaggers. I said, Jesus <laughs> Christ, these kids, they didn't even want to talk to me. They were like, get the fuck out of here. Giving where the, Where is the rear admiral? Giving you the dead fish. <laughs> Where's rear? It's like, buddy, <laughs> shake my fucking hand. Won't even look me in the They'd eye. sniff his fingers and before they like, shake your hand properly. How did he get the name Rear Admiral? I was like, ah, we'll leave that one out. I saw the coach looking at me, but um, <laughs> no, it's it, it's the season of RA. Yeah. The, the guy's coming out hot. I mean, he's got those, I don't know what's next to him right there. They look like a those couple. Kleenex? Yeah, the Kleenex. Oh, yeah. That's okay. So as long as there aren't boogers on there. Oh, sorry. No boogers. Just a little sorry. All right. Well, well, well it's it just need, needless to say. You're feeling yourself, and I love it. All right, big keep, gambling keep, Sunday yesterday too. Yeah, yeah. I, of course, I didn't post any of it, but like I've been so bad, I, I'm not gonna post more losers. But I think it seems like the more I post, the more I lose. Yeah, yeah. I had a pretty nice day. All pretty much all football too, which is America. It, isn't it an Asian thing where they have the year of the tiger, the year of the dragon? Chinese. I think every year is a year. Like yeah. the year, there's a Chinese year of the year. rat. I'm always like, that ain't yeah. a great year. Nah. Um, <laughs> Snitches. I mean, yeah. if you're born like your year is the year of the rat. Yeah, like, not that's great. what I'm gonna be. That's what when Grinelli was born. Year of <laughs> the rat. The year, the the war- year of Splinter. Year of the warthog. <laughs> yeah, the year of the warthog. That's that's this year. This yeah. year is the, the year, year of the hog. Next up, the Whitdog dog Ryan Whitney. Well, I never really said oh, what I've been up to. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. How was TNT, buddy? I felt like I was in a car accident after uh, the, the <laughs> two days at Chicklets Cup four oh, games. It's not even. Yeah, it's, it's not. hard. It, I, I, we need a little bit of cushion on on the pavement. We got to get that sport yeah. court, man. My knees yeah, and ankles it. are just in shambles. Uh, still dwelling over the loss in the semifinals. Uh, definitely talking amongst no, you're the not. team. No, but I am a little bit. I'm in embarrassed like people even online be. are like buddy you stop drinking and you train for a month and you can't even get out of the fucking semifinals no, it's embarrassing I see one one quote it's was like yeah like dude you haven't drank all you do is work out this was like the year of um big deal selects and then you lost to a bunch of plumbers and carpenters that never work out and drink all the time so so it was a g- pretty good point so after some more thought and a great interview with kevin dolman which we'll be dropping probably in the next month i think next year we're going to ri- roll the same lineup but we're bringing in the Russian gas. 
He went, okay. to, he okay. went to the KHL. You've had your experiment with it. I think that if we have the Russian gas, it will help with our old legs and help us cruise, at least to the finals for a rematch against Nose Face, because that's what the people wanted and they were let down. Aside from that, got over it, got to go home for a night, see my folks. And then it was off to TNT and a great first broadcast. We had the five man panel going, uh, got to hang out with Wayne uh, and, and, and Hank. And uh, it was cool because we got to watch Bedard, who's now, you know, one of the faces of the league and going to be this generational talent. Great start for him. And I'm sure we're going to get into it, but also to hear Wayne's thoughts on it because he went through that exact same process yeah. of coming in and, and Mike in your face, Mike in your face, all attention, all eyes on you. And uh, so to get that broadcast there and then to talk about mushrooms later on in it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was, was a dream come that true. Was, I was laughing out loud <laughs> on my coach. I'm like, I, I think this guy will never ever be told what he can and cannot say because he's talking about micro dosing with the great one right now. On TNT. <laughs> it was so good. I don't even think he knew what that was when I said it. I don't think but briefly what you just said so Kevin Dahlman I don't know when he'll drop but yeah. I'll, I'll just um, maybe tee everyone up and preface it with the most in-depth like five to six minute description of Russian gas we've always talked about it I think so many people are interested in that yeah. aspect of the KHL he went into a deep dive on exactly how it goes down the feelings they had some funny stories of other guys doing it so whenever that drops you'll you'll be interested in that one yeah it was a great what's wild is like the different ways We've heard the Russian gas being ingested like four four different ways over the years. Like sh a shot, like the gas mask, whatever he described. We won't spoil. Like it, seems like you could, I was, uh, yeah, I was. My gas um, <laughs> example was the the IV, which yeah. I think was. I don't speed. even think the doctors over there know. They're just no, experimenting. No, no, no. Yeah, you. they're like they they got a broomstick and a huge bowl, and they're just <laughs> like Doctor like, Kavorsian, <laughs> like a frat, <laughs> fucking like, going to town. It's it's legit. Like who's the guy from Breaking Bad? Walter White. Walter, Walter White. White. They're yeah. just mixing it up rando in the back. And but they dress like Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. Like a fr fraternity <laughs> mixing like cuckoo juice for their frat pot. Yeah. So take a shot of that. The wit dog, Ryan yeah. Whitney. What's going on, buddy? Not much. Uh, as Biz said, I mean, coming off Ireland, Rome, and then, you know, Chicklets Cup. It, it was one of those things where I got home, felt horrific. And, you know, any 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 parent out there will tell you, um, you come back from like a guy's trip or for any of you ladies come back from a girl's trip, you, you're just pushed right in. You know, it's like, all right, you got kid. It's kid time. And, and so I came home and I was just a wounded man, I'll say. Now, the problem is I was texting my friend, I can't stop drinking. Uh, I'm on a little bit of what they call a bender right now. And that pretty much started in Ireland, into Rome, into Chicklets Cup. And now I'm home every night. Like I'm opening up a bottle of wine. Well, you're Mr. Pink or, or Whitney pouring too. It's some hard, pink, right? Or every pouring some pink Whitney. Yeah, my my face is going to be the official color of the bottle very <laughs> soon, like permanently. So it's one of those things when you're on just like drinking a lot, um, it's hard to get off of it. Yeah. So uh, I think right after you guys leave, so Wednesday morning, because I'm not going to stop like tonight and tomorrow because we're all here. Right. Wednesday morning, I will just... Uh, do that like weak, cold, sober, start eating better. I haven't had a salad in, in, in a month. Um, so I'm feeling pretty gross and feeling pretty shitty about myself. But you guys cheer me up. You make me feel better. And, yeah. and looking at these bottles of Pink Whitney, I, I do want to pour myself it, a drink right now. It's another thing too. I think Max Homa sent a tweet out a couple of days ago and he goes, there's something about when you go on a trip with your buddies too, where you hope to maybe take it easy at some point, maybe sleep in a little bit, especially if you have kids to catch Not up on one second. Do you, you just go full throttle and you put your body to the limit. You need a vacation when you get home from the vacation. And at this point now, the anxiety of going home and like dealing with life again oh. is worse than the excitement leading up to the trip. Yeah. Like maybe that shows I'm 40. How many times have 60. you contemplated just running away and, and buying a second passport going Jason Bourne off the grid? Well, I could barely get a U.S. passport to even <laughs> leave originally. So getting another one, I don't think that's possible. Okay. But yeah, I have a buddy who even said he went on a three night guys trip over to Nantucket and then you know, uh, Saturday night, it was supposed to be, you know, the last night. He just kind of like quietly took off. He's like, I was done. I just went home. He and, tapped out yeah, early. And then, and then he got the old, yeah. like, and then you're the hero when you get home, right? Like, oh my God, you came home early. So it's kind of a win-win. You get away Your from the madness. Thumped. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. You walk in and you walk into <laughs> a gangbang, as they said in old school. Was that old school? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm excited to, to have the season going more than anything. And, and I think that having the games yeah. just... All of a sudden, every night. Now, obviously, Sundays, unfortunately for Biz, there's only two games, maybe one game. He wants a full slate during NFL Sunday. Fuck off. But I, I, I just love, 
you know, you got the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday night, like seven to 10 to 12 games, and you're just watching all night. The next morning, the ones you miss, you watch the NHL.com. And I'll get oh, into the, oh, the app. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to save it because there's too much positivity in this yeah. moment <laughs> around this league right now. So we'll get into that later. The NHL.com little five minute recaps of games was, was awesome for the ones you miss. You see all the goals, you see all the big hits. So at least if you don't catch a game that night, you can watch the next morning. The, uh, the Jays do a Jays in 30, the, the whole Jays? game in 30 minutes. Now, do does like the Boston, Bruins do? Uh, Bruins Nesson do does the, uh, I think it's Bruins in two hours though, or maybe an hour where, you know, that's not the whole game, but you see pretty much everything. But yeah, 30 minutes is way better than, than two hours. I don't want to get too far off topic. I was watching a clip of Jack Edwards about the tissue comment did you see his most latest i, I can't believe he's still announcing it's all set like some i don't of the know stuff, how he's still announcing. i kind of i'm obsessed with it though because the clips are amazing you get a good chuckle but as a bruins fan like how many times throughout the course of a, a three-hour broadcast are you left shaking your head yeah i mean i've always been a jack guy he's a homer they're all homers but there's clearly something i'm missing and it's likely medical i doubt he's impaired on there and they're letting him work in that, in that well way. he I mean, so so i thought last year there was rumors it was it like there was almost, he was so bad that they're like, ah, oh, they might be making a change. And I guess they decided not to. Apparently, and I've heard this. I don't know. I, I can't confirm it, but they put him at a different side of the hotel when they're on the road because he loves to rip the bong. Like he loves, he loves the weed. Have you guys heard that? Uh, really? Yeah, from you about two years ago. Okay. All right. so, <laughs> I, so I've created this rumor yeah. in my head that Jack, it, I would love to rip the bong with him and get him on the podcast for a sit down. That's, a, that's a, a public invite to Jack Edwards if he ends up catching wind that we want him on. Would you guys be cool with that? 100%. Would yeah. you rip the bong with him? Absolutely. Okay, good. Be the longest episode ever. But, <laughs> and he's not beholden to give us his medical, uh, you know, situation. No, no. It's just that, you know, like I said, the tech, it's a, you know, it's an NHL team. It's a professional team. And, yeah. And, and it's a tough standard to, to keep up to. Him, and he's been struggling lately. And I mean, we, I wish him the best, but I was it's told just they're not gonna on give, I was told they're going to give him a lot of nights off this year. Okay. okay. Yeah. The years to pass. Do they Al know who the other guy Alex would be? Faust, the kid from Northeastern, jumped in a few okay. times during the a preseason. Alex, Alex Foss, the play-by-play the -play guy? Yeah. He was oh, great. He's incredible. He was awesome. How do you know him? Alex, he was with the Kings. Was yeah, he? yeah. And he still is, right? Uh, or maybe he moved so. over to baseball. I think actually something happened with Bally's, so he yeah. had to move on. But he worked uh, with TNT a little bit last year. He's one of the bright young awesome. voices in Wait, the so game. Why did you say, what do you mean Northeastern? I think he went to Northeastern. Oh, I thought you meant yeah. he was like doing games no, he, I'm pretty them. sure okay. he did play-by-play okay. play at Northeastern back in the day. Yeah. So well, I'd know him if I saw him or heard his Now, voice speaking sure. of play-by-play, -play, guys. Yeah. We do have an amazing oh. guest on our hands for today's show. A pretty good natural segue there. I'll leave it to you, R.A. Took the words right out of my mouth. Kenny Albert, he has a book coming out, A Mic for All Seasons. The only announcer in North America that's currently calling all four major sports. Terrific guy. He's been with Fox for like 30 years, I think. Sean One of the McDonough? best in the game. Kenny Albert. Kenny no, Albert. Sean McDonough's not doing all four? I, apparently not right at the moment. Oh. Yeah. He does I, He does hockey with the ESPN, yeah. right? He does college, oh, college football, yeah. but he doesn't yeah. do the NFL. Wah, 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 wah. Sorry. Well, I just thought of other guys who I've, <laughs> oh, I've seen, seen and heard doing, doing four different sports. But yeah, Kenny Albert, what an interview this yeah. is. I mean, he's just been around so many legends of all these different sports that it was great hearing his stories and obviously raised by a legend in terms of Marv Albert. So it was, it was a blast catching up with him. And just such a classy guy and such an easy guy to work with. Everybody loves him. Them. like the, the dinners they get to have on the road with that crew with Edzo well it used to be Jonesy too they would have oh. tons of laughs now they got Bush in the mix so just a, an unbelievable guy to, to work with and a true professional and never doesn't have a smile on his face he's just happy to be doing what he does and uh, we appreciate him and his time and congratulations to him and not only his career but this book coming out and, and keep humming Kenny you're the man, Kenny yeah, I bumped into him with a uh, bees game last week said hello to him oh did you period. yeah he is a great guy can't leave out our producer, Mikey Granelli. What's going on, big guy? Uh, not a lot for me, but a lot for Chicklets. Big couple weeks for Chicklets here. We got the Big Deal Selects video dropping on Wednesday. The following Wednesday after that, we have the first episode of Chicklets TV. So Chicklets TV is going to be a new rebrand on how we film behind the scenes and kind of everyday life of Chicklets. After that, the next Wednesday after that, we have a sandbagger. Oh, Jack cool. Eichel, Noah Hannafin. Featuring R.A. And uh -huh. fans got their wish. R.A.'s in this uh, one, too. <laughs> Some of them did, he's, I guess. <laughs> he's physically there. Yeah. Well, By the end, I don't necessarily know if mentally he's all, all there, but it was still a time and a half. I, I'll, I'll apologize now. I was filming R.A., the camera is definitely going to be shaky with how hard I was laughing. Okay. okay. He That's had me thing. going so That's he had thing. me laughing as hard as I've ever laughed on that. I think it was the 16th or 17th hole. And and the BU kids got their wish. So last last one, we posted a video in the midst of the Getzlav uh, BXO one. And people were wanting RA to get in the mix as far as shooting. 
Well, this one, we had uh, one of the rules. We get these lifelines, right? Redo a shot. Uh, what are the other ones here? Like uh, one, one club. club hole. Yeah. So there was a point where each team could have RA shoot one of the other opponent's shot and that was implemented and things got very interested. So we got that a lot coming. Disappoint. <laughs> we got a lot coming to the Spit and Chicklets YouTube channel. We're actually sitting at 299,000 subscribers right now. So we're almost about to hit the 300,000 plateau. Thank you to everybody who follows. And uh, yeah, as G said, if you want an inside look of what goes on in the Big Deal Selects locker room and all the drama and all the banter, Make sure you uh, stay tuned in the next couple of weeks for They're that rollout. Losing. Yeah, I was just taking Witt's order. He said, uh, Ari, get buckled and do something. So I took his orders <laughs> and, and did something. So great time. I can't wait for it to drop. Before we continue, guys, I need to know, do you think any of your friends are the ultimate life of the party? If so, you can nominate them and you could win a pink Whitney New York City trip. One lucky winner will receive an epic New York City trip for them and three friends, complete with a tour of Barstool headquarters. 10 secondary prize winners will receive Pink Whitney party packs with everything you and your crew need to take your shot and throw the ultimate house party. It's easy to enter. Just go to pinkwhitney.com to enter your info. Nominate your life of the party friend and describe how they always make the party next level for a chance to win the ultimate Pink Whitney NYC trip. And of course, make sure to head on over to your local bar and order up some Pink Whitney. Boys, uh, let's talk some hockey. Let's do it. Connor Bedard, obviously, that's the big story everywhere. Uh, his first game, he, they beat the Penguins 4-2. to two. He got an assist in his first game. He had 21 minutes, 29 seconds, 10 shot attempts, uh, 5 on net. That iconic photo of him and Sid at the faceoff, that, that's going to be in the Hall of Fame. How about Kelly Sutherland, though? Have you ever heard a ref like say something like that before, guys? With, you know, generational talents about uh, to square off. I thought that was one of the coolest last things. Last year, they yes. started that. Yeah, like let's get it on. It was a, it was even like goofier last year. I think I don't remember exactly who the ref was or what was said, but it was a little. And then this year, he actually like personally said, "Well, I think he said, what, welcome to the NHL con' or something like that.'" Yeah, and Sid's like dropped a fucking puck. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And Sid worked on the him. face off. He worked. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I don't know if we talked about this last podcast or maybe it was in the group chat, but Colby Armstrong, who who works with us, does game notes. I don't know when the next one's coming out. Hopefully soon. But uh, he went there for NHL media tour with Sportsnet. And they actually did some fun face-off thing between Sid and Bedard, and Bedard had beat Sid. So this is what was the I took it personally moment where I don't think, at least through the first two periods, Bedard hadn't touched the puck in the face-off circle. I lost know. every single fucking Did draw. you see the clip of him mic'd up going up to the ref being like, I, I can't beat him? He's like, <laughs> he's like, I, I haven't won a face-off. I haven't even come close to beating him yet. And don't put it past Sid in the competition preseason. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, let, I'm going to let him have a couple. Mental I know warfare. I got him first night. <laughs> I'm not going to show him my A stuff. Yeah. I'm going to show him my C- minus stuff and then just snap him back I'm on surprised him in the first you didn't game. give him a fucking bag tap off the oh. opening one right in the junk just whoosh. i'll i'll say this though that i i'd only seen Connor bedard play um world juniors and i remember seeing him play under 18 it was in like frisco texas might have been under 17 um so I, I knew about the goal scoring but i always kind of thought of him as just a straight up pure goal scorer which he is you can tell i didn't know like my first thought after the Pe penguins game is like he's he's all that like it's the creativity carrying to the neutral zone. Didn't know he was that good, like kind of a human breakout in terms of getting yeah. it and just immediately creating space for himself. The hands, the vision, like he could have had in that first game, five, six points. Yeah. He was around the blue paint a little he, bit too. He was, he was like, yeah. he basically the first NHL game you see him, you're wondering, you're like, this is a guy who's going to get 80 points this year. I think he's going to have a point per game if he's healthy, no doubt. Yep. I think that he's going to be a 100-point guy, 50-60 goal guy. Like, he is actually as good as advertised. And I know some people are like, oh, wasn't that impressive? Like, Whoa, that didn't age, watch. That age, you didn't watch close enough because he looks like a seasoned vet out there, minus yes. the face-offs, and the game comes so naturally easy to him. Added to the fact that he's a psycho in terms of being a professional, his diet, no drinking, all the things we've talked about. Yeah. It is a generational talent that I cannot wait to see play the entire year. Up. I, I think most players who come into the NHL soon realize face-offs is one of the hard, hardest things. Yeah, to get Sid was brutal at the beginning. Sid was not very good. Uh, and then also you tend to get a little bit more of the advantage when you're a vet in the face-off circle. I remember when I was uh, picked up by Phoenix and we played San Jose so much, Thornton Stick would literally be in the middle of the face-off and he was playing tummy sticks with the linesman where <laughs> Boyd Gordon would have to take draws against him and be like, what the fuck is going on out here? Where <laughs> Joe is just laughing, cruising up ice, knowing that he gets to cheat a little. But uh, 
overall, um, they, they released the analytic numbers as far as how many times he was carrying the puck out of his own end, as you, you mentioned, like a one man breakout, how many zone entries and just really poised with the puck. Uh, probably the one thing that stands out right now is maybe for how small he is, the lack of speed where he seems to be normal speed compared to everybody else. But yeah. he'll that'll come also with age. But he, you could tell he's so smart at getting into to the areas where he can expose certain passing lanes. So the brain and the, and the neurological play is really where I'm so impressed for how young he is right now. And you mentioned yep. you mentioned quickly, sorry, the 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 point of game sucks that he's now lost Halsey. Halsey's playing tonight, buddy. He's playing. They said he was I fucking know. week Halsey's to week fine. or month to month. I, and, I, and that Brandon Carlo ran him over in the second game uh, against Boston. Upper and and I was, he was, he went off and it looked like one of those shoulders because he's kind of had his arm to his side. I was like, fuck, like Halsey. an AC joint or yeah, something. And then apparently I just was listening to the radio that he's going to be going tonight. So look, that is huge for not only like Bedard, but the entire Blackhawks team. And how about the stat of Halsey I think you said, oh, yeah. that, what is it? He's assisted on like five first overall picks, first goals. Yeah, so yeah. he's been associated to teams who have had the first overall pick, what, five times? Uh, I got it right here. Yeah, well, but that's what is first against the Bruins. Number 2010, number one overall pick, Taylor Hall got an assist on it. He's now assisted on the first goal for four different number one overall picks. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Nico Hesha, Jack Hughes, and now Connor Bedard. That's insanity, right? And he could I have mean, had McDavid's, I'm sure. He did He did a little media today, and he said, uh, this is interesting because I know you wanted to talk about yes. this. He said, it can be a little, in, in regards to Connor Bedard, he said, it can be a little much at times. He doesn't say it, but we all feel like it is. And this then, is Halsey? Yeah, it's Taylor Hall. Okay, so this, this is, is talking topic. about the, the media and constantly being bombarded. And this was to be expected. Actually, Jeremy Roenick had some interesting comments like, hey, it's a little bit of overkill right now. It, I can see both sides. I can see both sides too. Because I, it, is, it is a lot, but... Buddy, how, how many people watch the first game on ESPN? 1.2. Great for the game. It's so good for the game. TNT, do you have the numbers with you already? No, I don't. I, I know. think it was the second it most watched game, not including uh, out, out, uh, Winter Classics on, on cable. Right. Yeah, Jeff said it was the highest rated game on ESPN. Then the next one, TNT, with you guys, was the highest on that. So both regular season games. So, so people are clearly interested in, in what he has to say and following this story of this you know generational talent coming in the league. And I'm pretty sure that they were following McDavid and Sid and Ovi just as closely, maybe with the way social media is yeah. now, especially with Instagram and, and Twitter popping off the way that they are, that it, it seems like a, it's a lot more intense, but I, my, I'm just worried about the person. I'm worried about this kid getting burnt out. And I mean, with the schedule, they got him on to start the year off. Like that is very much possible where this kid could be burnt out by the media come Christmas time. First so five we, games, national television. Yeah. I mean, I asked him to come on chicklets and yesterday we were talking. He's like, I don't have one minute right now. He's like, if I had 35, 40 minutes, I'm jumping on with you guys. I'd love to come on. But he's like, I don't have a minute to do this. He's just so busy. Yeah. So to, to try to concentrate on what he's trying to do on the ice and then navigate everything else, I commend the kid because that's a, a tough burden for a guy at 18 years old, but he's doing it. He's doing it with a smile on his face. He's being playful with the media. And I do, I do not envy that for a second. And the good thing is, is your moments of like release and being able to relax is actually during the games. And, and when you're on the ice for practice, like I can remember Sid's rookie year when it was the same madness minus Twitter in terms of like, once you get the gear on for practice or a game, you're like, oh, I just get to do what I love now. I don't have to deal with everything else. In terms of the coverage, you're never going to have something perfectly done. I would much rather this than all of a sudden, or, or if they decided to not pump his tires as much, if all these games weren't on national television, like you're never going to have it perfect. So this is way better than not enough coverage in my mind. And I think after seeing him play, I've watched the, the first two. Um, and, and unfortunately, we won't be able to watch tonight in Toronto. That should be a great one. But I've watched the first two and seeing him, I'm like, I'm glad they're doing this because he's that good. Yeah. So just keep pumping him to everyone. At some point, it will slow down. Yeah. It has to naturally. But the first 10 games of this generational talent, just get his name out there. It helps the Hawks. It helps him. It helps the league. So a a as much as I've been like, oh, my God, like more Bedard, I get it. Uh, two other things that we need to mention. Uh, the boos from the Montreal Canadiens fans booing Connor Bedard, which is fucking hilarious. Don't. Giving him. 
Give, I, I, I donkeys. No, I, I, I like that. It's just giving them a warm welcome to the NHL. They're true fans. They want to hate the other team's best player. I mean, at least they get some fucking voice out of the or, or some sound out of the, the bottom bowl compared to Toronto. And we'll get to that later for fuck's sakes. What does Austin Matthews have to do to get you guys to throw a fucking hat on the ice, pull a rabbit out of his ass? And then uh, what was the other thing uh, Bedard did? Oh, no bucket. First game. Mm-hmm. Took the twenty five. First game for us, fine. Yeah. Took the twenty five hundred dollar ching ching. He doesn't give a fuck. Not at all. Another note on that goal. Uh, wait, I know you sent it to the group. I had it. His first career goal came twenty six thousand five hundred and thirty three days after his great great uncle James Bedard scored his first career goal against the Bruins as a Blackhawk. It was the only goal of his uncle's uh, great great uncle's twenty two game career. Uh, so, Connie, you're on the clock. You got to beat your uncle. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Maybe I he sticks around after practice and keeps shooting just to wait wait for the media to get the frig out of there. So they won't wait him. him. They won't. <laughs> <leave>. I'll <laughs> wait him. Uh, a couple more numbers here. Obviously, three points in three games. Uh, Face off percentage, 26.5%. We'll pick it up after that first game. Only 1.6% uh, percent of his shifts have started in the D zone. He's got one hit, two penalty minutes. He's drawn three penalties as well. So, uh, what, did anything surprise you about him? Like, to just kind of take you take it by surprise first game in the pros i noticed like how small he was i know that's been what i was talking about but out there with the big boys he was a little little sprite out there but he's a water bug man just all over the place and they're giving him tons of minutes i mean 43 minutes after his first two games then they they like play basically the take the leash of off him. Yeah. yeah do it play him play him all game i mean like it's not like he as a younger guy like you want to play as much as you can actually any guy in the league wants to play as much as they can but for him get him out there get him confidence the more ice time the more touches the better yes. he feels and the, the the only other thing I'll say besides the faceoffs is I think you saw him get knocked over quite a bit, but that just kind of comes with the territory. It's like he's never played against D men this big, this strong. Um, so it, it's going to be an incredible season. And the shot, like his one goal so far, obviously it was a great little wraparound after a quick shot against Boston. But we haven't even seen one of these snipes that you'll see thirty so, of this year. So a great example, we actually were able to show it on TNT because uh, he had it against the Penguins in night one on the Tuesday, and we had them in the Boston game but he was going down one-on-one on graves and keep in mind so through the neutral zone just like mcdavid and all these other young players they have their head up and they're crossing over through the neutral zone so it's hard for d men to gap up properly and know what side he's going to pick so he started the play coming up in the neutral zone on the left side goes to the right side and when graves he, had, he didn't have a great gap because of it so when he goes out and he's got stick on puck bedard's able to toe drag it and move it about 18 inches as it almost he, went in too it almost that went was in. first period first period so he changes the angle for the goaltender so the goaltender squared up to where the shot is and then graves goes stick on puck and then he pulls it in towards his body 18 inches and because his stick is so tall see how hard so high is uh his i top saw that elbow has to, did. i didn't realize that it's his interesting top elbow is fucking tickling the rafters and he's able to change that angle so much and get off a laser through that stick on puck which that's that's not easy to do in full speed. So look for that coming uh, this NHL season. I wouldn't be shocked if he scores 10 goals off the rush, exactly how that play broke down. The best players, the last thing I'll say is the best players are somehow able to always cut to the middle. Like that's that's McDavid, right? Like he's just, you're like, oh, you got to try to angle him off. They're so dynamic that they're cutting to the middle. It creates all these passing Jack and shooting Hughes lanes. right now, too. Jack, Jack oh. Hughes, we're getting to him. Yeah, get me Holy my fucking, shit. get me my lotion. Holy Double wrist are coming for you, Jackie boy. Exactly. That's, that's the same thing. That's the same thing. And, and Bedard, right away, I noticed it. This is a guy who's just able to get to the middle. And those are the best in the league do that. Um, I, I got to ask you, you play with Sid coming in. Uh, speed wise was he already there speed oh yes. that wasn't something that was holding him back Sid right no 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 right. he was when he came into the league it was it was like the fastest player anyone ever seen it was kind of like McDavid has now taken that as the fastest player anyone's ever seen with the puck that was Sid right off the hop remember how often he was splitting the D early in his career his speed was was above Bedard so sub out Bedard shot yes. where Sid didn't necessarily have the shot where Connor's got to work on the speed aspect yeah I don't think his speed is is like bad i just don't think it's i it, think it's, it's high maybe high. slightly above average for the yes. league but that is something where i mean time and space is is what gets taken away at that level and that's one thing that you have to work towards so that's uh, he'll be doing sprints all summer to probably gain that half a step and and kind of like the way uh clayton keller did when he came in all uh, these small guys one last note he had uh, 30 shot attempts his first three games 16 shots on net. i had a preseason prop 
I was Badad, 350 shots or more, eight to one. I took it too. Did you say I took it too. Let's nice. go. go. So buddy. eight to one's nuts. Crazy, dude. But but it, it's all about staying healthy. Exactly. Right. That's the, that's that stat in terms of like you got to play all the games to get that. He actually probably wouldn't need 80 games to get 350 shots because you sent that over. Yeah. With the plus 800. I was I was blown away. And then you see how often he's shooting. You're like, that's a hell of a bet. All right. He's been firing away. Uh, RA's the, the year of the warthog. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx, buy me a Coke. All right, your boy, Austin Matthews, man. Austin Matthews became just the second player in the last 105 years to open an NHL season with back-to-back hat tricks. Give the Leafs a 2-0 start out of the gate. The only other guy to do it was Ovi, so I guess you could say twice in the last six years as well. There you go. We, I talked about the greatest goal scorers, and, and Ovi got to 300. He, it took him nine less games than what it took Austin I Matthews. I can't believe that. Nine less games here. We're talking about a generational talent, folks, and there's these dummies online that were talking about him getting overpaid with that deal he just got. Smoke another one. Get, get your hand out of RA's treat bag, for fuck's sakes, if you think that's an overpayment. Yeah, be careful if you dip in there anyways. Uh, one other note, how about this assist? I'm mean, assist, Hattrick. The ninth of his career, he's already fifth all-time on the Leafs list. The first Leafs to go back-to-back -back since Wendell Clark back in 94. It's a long time for back to back. Wendell Clark also beat the shit out of like three people in those two games, I'm sure, too. Listen, I think people forget. I, I, I took him 12 games last year to get to six goals. He's already got 15% of last year's total in the first two games of the season. He came in last year with that hand wrist injury, and that's what was holding him back. This is a guy who can easily score 70 goals in the National Hockey League. I, I, if he stays healthy, I think he's got 70. I think, getting, I think getting 70 to 75 goals in today's NHL is just as impressive as when Wayne was playing and he got 92. The way that the, the defense overall and the goaltenders evolved, 75 goals in today's NHL would Insane. be fucking banana lands. And I, I can see this guy getting close to it. And another thing too, game three, this pod, podcast comes out after, after they play the Blackhawks. Another team he could very likely have a hat trick. I know. So he could have nine goals by the time this fucking podcast rolls out. But overall, as far as the Leafs' performance, little shaky against Montreal, but a gutsy win. Austin Matthews scores those two goals to send it to OT. Was hoping he was going to get the shootout winner, but overall, a great start. They got all their guns blazing. Marner looks awesome. Nylander looks like I'm ready to hand over 11 sheets a year to him because he's a fucking beast right that now. That goal he scored the other night. <sighs> Who do you embarrass? I think it was maybe Golagoski and another guy. It was sick. And then he just waits it out. Yeah, that's going to be – you. He, the, what he's done, like, obviously it's two games, but then last year, like, you can't lose him. You got to pay him. Figure it out. Whatever you have to do. He's that good. You got to you gotta keep this core together. You got to believe in him. You got to do exactly like they did in Washington. They kept trying to run it over and over, and finally they ended up adjusting and figuring out a way to win. So you know um, I'm a big fan of Falls? Like a good fall in an NHL game. Just yeah. So funny. The TJ Brody with with could be one of the best of the year. Just at the blue line when Jake Evans goes down, makes it one nothing. Just an all time classic fall. And whenever I get a good one or Rob Scuderi, he sends me the good ones. <laughs> I send him the good ones. And I sent him that one. I go, oh, look at this. And he goes, they always score. And it's oh, so yeah. true. Oh. Like, as a D man, if you have a horrible fall that gives a guy a breakaway every single time, you're like, please, please, please. Oh, fuck. So it was it was a classic uh, kind Mike's of blue. Others used to make sure they all ended up in the in the video session, but yep. at, at the end, the worst is when you're a D man and you're pedaling back, and then you dig your heels into the ice and you and you fall back, and then your stick ends up going into the crowd and There's it a just yard sale. launches into the meshing and gets stuck up there. But um, I got a bone to pick with the fans. What is going on? The other night he scored the third. I was like, is, there, is, is, is this like a replay with no volume? But what is going on, dude? There might have been five hats on the ice. Ugh. I'm not even like the hats, yeah, but the noise. Like, are they cheering? I think they got to ban cocaine in the lower bowl and start giving them psychedelics or something that'll get them a little bit of I energy. Like RA, you're the drug like, guy. What I feel like is, they need cocaine? No, I feel like maybe they're doing too much and they're just getting stuck in their seats and they're they're overthinking it. It's just like just fucking cheer and throw your fucking hat on the ice. The, the guy just got a back to back hat trick and pulled them out of a two goal deficit in the dying fucking minute. And it was even before that it started when they're doing the player introductions. Yes, Mitchie, Mitchie Marner's coming out. Fucking guy who's a hundred point guy for you plays on the defensive side of the puck. It's a year where this core group, like you're, you're, you're going into their years now where they could potentially win a Stanley cup. I don't even think the, the people stood out of their, their goddamn seats. They put their claps together. It's, it's Brutal. a tough atmosphere bar. It's the yacht club. It's, it's nuts. Uh, and you've, you've said it for a while now, but watching the other night, I mean, beginning of the year and, 
just silence. It's it, the silence is deafening. I think what they need to do is they need to swap out the upper bowl and the lower bowl for one game and see how it plays out. Get the hardcores who can yeah, only afford the upper bowl seats to get down below and then send all these fucking suits up top to go do the fucking coke off the ugly granite in the t- upper deck. <laughs> ugly granite. Uh, the other highlight of that first game, Wi-Fi versus Revo. Revo uh, buried that uh, defenseman Goulet. Then they scrapped. Did you think uh, he got jumped, Revo? We got to have a little conversation because you seem to think that you mentioned that Reeves got ragdolled in the fight in the group chat. I said, I said he he bullied him into the net. I is I, I believe what I wrote. And okay, so jump like I don't I don't necessarily think it was a complete jumping, but it definitely was. He had his gloves off before Reeves. Knew it. Does that count as a jumping? You, so, you're a, you're a fighter guy. Listen, is I that a jump. I that's that is a, a full on jump. All and right, getting, I, I take it back. Getting Look, the advantage jumped. early on. As much as I want to pump uh, Montreal fans for booing Bedard and giving them the welcome to the National Hockey League, you guys are such fucking homers online. You guys are saying that he dummied Revo's, Revo and threw I him I never around. said he dummied him. No, no. This is what the fans are saying oh. online. You said that he ragdolled him, but you were still questioning whether the fact he's jumped. He yeah, jumped and now him. you're telling me like that. And I knew it wasn't a fair like square off. So I guess if it's not that, it's kind of jumping. I just meant at the end, I've never seen Reeves like pushed over like that that's what i meant you would be hard pressed to find a video of me online if a a tough guy went and ran one of my players if i'm fighting him i'm skating over i'm hitting him on the shin pad and then i'm backpedaling too to say we're going and we're squaring off 100 it actually happened to me in training like felino did to reeves the next night bingo he tapped him and he backed off and that was a square off and that's the way it should be done. Now, we talked about this last podcast not knowing that the fireworks were going to happen that early on. I did. But the heavyweight belt is up for grabs right now and it's hungry in that Atlantic division. They're fighting every game from now on, especially with... Oh, can yeah. we roll Revo's comments? Yeah. I kind of want to match with Jack I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't like getting jumped. I, I don't... I don't know if I've ever really jumped anybody. Um, you know, if you want to fight, just ask me. I'm always around. You know where to find me. Once you got going, what was your perspective on it? You don't usually see the net kind of involved like that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he did it on purpose to end it or or what. He just kind of. I don't know. Once I kind of stood up and he had to grab me, he just kind of tried pushing me for the rest of the way. So I yeah, felt like it was on purpose, but uh, we got him two more times. I'm sure or something might happen don't want to go out like that so he clearly states that he was jumped georgia rock topped online and had things to say about it and he's Did oh, he? oh yeah he doesn't he thinks that that wi-fi took him down and gets the w on that one where to me the wrestling aspect sure did he out muscle him when they got wrestling yes but considering he had the jump and he didn't dummy him with the punches that's a draw in my books and it's still very much up for grabs and neck i don't know what time then when's the next time they play because it's happening again and that's when the heavyweight belts up for grabs i do have this Laura quote here he said bra you hit goulet from behind you knew he would be coming and you had many you had many chances for a rematch later in the game and you didn't take it then with the laughing emoji okay so i don't i i, I cannot imagine that there was a moment where wi-fi said you want to do this again and reeve said no there's no chance that happened he probably actually asked him again and maybe wi-fi is like i don't think i just think that that wi-fi is a is a legitimate killer he's a he's a he, top five and he's hungry which and he's also fucking good like is shot from the point like he skates well i didn't i thought when he was kind of coming in and last year we, we heard the nickname and everything i didn't know he was also a player like that's a hell of a hell of a, a signing and a guy to have like in your team considering he was what working at a store like walmart when he when he ended up getting picked up yeah. and, and i guess his brother was drafted by montreal this summer and he might be tougher so there's obviously a guy there that's like muscle for the canadians who's willing to do anything but now that you're saying it I'm going with you. It was a jump. And by no means do I not like this Wi-Fi kid. I just think that in that situation, you got to tap the shin pads like the next game against Minnesota where Felino backed off. They score up. But uh, ultimately, after a few games, the Revo experiment, in my opinion, is A+. plus. The guys love him in the locker room. He got the belt after that game against Minnesota. He he really got the tone that set. That was a good fight. It was a good scrap. Shout out to Felino as well for going after the big boy to, to protect his teammate. But that's one thing that I think the Leafs needed. And then you, with guys like Bertuzzi and Domi and other guys getting to fill in that middleweight to light 
what, what would you call domi? Uh, like a, a lightweight? Welterweight. A welterweight? Yeah. Just yeah. to have those toughness in layers. And I also mentioned it for the Boston Bruins and said it on the broadcast too. Trent Frederick is a, a good offensive talent, but without any other tough guys around, Frederick has to be the guy who, if a guy gets hit, he's got to worry about going to do that job. With Lucic in the mix now, he needs he can play second fiddle, focus more on playing, and I think that's going to excel his numbers. I mean, he did have career high with 17 tucks last year, but in that in that first game, you saw him with that beautiful tip-in goal, where that, to me, plays a big factor for not only the other guys who have to do it in the lineup, but for the skill guys, you're telling me fucking Matt Matthews and those guys are going to be laughing in guys' faces this year. Said, "Oh, you want to talk to me? Yeah, Revo. All right, time to go. Bertuzzi, time to go." Well, Revo got announced uh, in the starting lineup at the home opener and just gave it this one. <laughs> and then the camera shot up to Tree Living. He, he was just started loving laughing. It. He was loving it. I'm like, that's awesome because you don't know if a GM's like, oh, hard OGMs. He was just laughing at that. And then yeah, I think Revo. I also think like how he is with the media helps a ton right with the and, other guys as well yes right? because like people want to talk to him reporters want to talk to him. they know they're going to get a quote they know they're going to get a sound bite and it just may take even if it's minor minor um less stuff for marner and matthews and neiland have to deal with it's just a little less because they go to, they go talk to revo so after that hit in that fight with felino yeah i'm down with you so far it looks great people were um, bitching about the hit but fuck off man that's a good hit I, dude. I, I i think the pendulum is swinging back we got old school hockey coming you want to hear something today. crazy they don't play again till march 9th what that's like the oh man we gotta get the flex schedule going put um, it on a sunday matinee yeah sunday during super bowl <laughs> um uh domi um put down in the lineup uh for their game tonight against the blackhawks and actually uh sheldon keith made a couple comments yes, about saw that. kind of throwing the puck away and i saw some clips it was justin Bourne on twitter throwing out that i think the leafs are all about and i remember ken hitchcock when we were at camp with st louis was always talking about no hope plays in the offensive zone and Correct. holding on to it and grinding them down and there was a couple clips of domi just trying to throw it out front right to a guy in the wild so he drops down to the third line and obviously like there'll be times he's moving back up and but but i think because of that you'll just see you got to get used to our system we're not throwing the puck away in the offensive zone i have the quote here if you guys want yeah to and it. there was also a clip of him talking to him on the ice during practice and a and I love Max Domi's game. He was an offensive player in junior, and even at some points in the NHL when he was playing with Arizona, with weaker teams. Kind yeah, of. he. You know, sometimes when you feel like that pressure to produce and, and put up points, yeah, you do have some brain farts in the offensive zone where you're making blind plays and you're throwing these backhand sauces or you know trying to create these seam plays where maybe a pass off the pads is is the right move and or just hold it. Yeah, so d decision making becomes very important, especially when you're a guy who's in that middle six range, right? So, listen, I think that he's going to figure it out, and he's probably just trying to impress guys early on with making plays. But at a certain point, you have to manage the puck, and if you don't, you're going to end up on those bottom lines. And Keith said, "My focus with Max is how he managed the puck offensively. If you don't take care of the puck offensively, you have to defend that much more. We want to do a better job when we lose the puck, but in Max's case, it's how he can." keep his group on offense more and, and and there are times where he has been more responsible with it and has had a little bit of a lesser role like I'm thinking about puck management when he was in Carolina when he went there at the deadline I thought last year in playoffs with the Dallas Stars he looked great so if he can get back to playing a little bit more simple game and even a little bit more physical and in your face I think that that's where he's most effective and he's a great middle six guy uh, after the game Revo and Felino got together she had a hug and a but Felino got to catch up with Revo's kids. That's from Mike Russo. Just, you know, oh. perfect example of guys leaving it all on the ice and still boys. That's uh, when afterwards. tummy yeah. sticks is okay. You get all the, the, the junk out of the way first, and then you can play a little tummy sticks. Uh, not done with the Leafs yet. They thought they had a, a new goal song for this year, Biz. They got rid of the uh, Hall and Oates. What was uh I can't think. Making that's my out. dreams come yeah, true. Yeah, make my dreams come true. They had Steve Aoki's 2012 dance remix of Kid is it Cuddy. Is it Kid Cuddy? Cuddy. Kid, Kid Cuddy's. Cuddy's. I'm a fossil. Kid Cuddy's Pursuit of Happiness. But hold the phone. Uh, our pal Nick Alberga tweeted Saturday night. Don't expect to hear Pursuit of Happiness as the goal song for Leafs games anymore. Told they won't be using it any longer this season. Heard the Leafs receive some complaints about the song's message and or lyrics. Apparently there's a Pursuit of Happiness reference in there somewhere. Um, and then Dave Pagnotta said the Leafs are rotating multiple songs for certain games like the original six matchup and throwback Thursdays. But either way, it looks like that song is done. So because well, uh, I'm complaints. talking about guys in the lower bowl rip and rail. So I'm probably not the guy as far as the song's yeah, message to really break true. this all down. Uh, love the song. Love the movie Project X. 
those are those are how I used to party back in the heydays. I don't need more, but it's a song that gets you going. I like the remix. Uh, it's way less of a snooze face uh, or a snooze face is that the, a snooze, snooze fest. fest than the than the other song they used to have, and it wasn't bringing them any any luck. So it's time to move on. But I do like the fact that they are going to rotate and see what ends up gelling. Are, is there any recommendations that you would have for a tune? No, I'm so bad at picking songs. Like if I was on the 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 teams now that have players pick their own goal songs, which is a cool idea, I, I'm telling you, I'd have nothing. I'd be sitting there. I'd ask people to pick one for me. I'm just brutal at that. Really? No creativity, no imagination. I just don't have that I feel that like you would pick bag. a Coldplay song. You're always... Yeah. <laughs> like Why? a sad one? <laughs> I think that... It I, was all... All yellow. I think like everyone's just, <laughs> like, is, why is he do picking a song after the color of his teeth? But uh, talking back live, <laughs> I do think that the Red Wings better not do shit with their song because them bumping Eminem was a nice touch. Okay, okay, it was a real nice touch what, in dum, Detroit. Dum, 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 no, dum. it was um without, without me. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, and it just the place was rocking when they scored Supposedly a couple. Supposedly they just brought back the old goal horn too. I guess there was a unreal goal horn. Uh, the Leafs, yeah, no, the no, the Red, Red Wings, Wings had oh, a leg. Yeah. I never even knew it went away. Yeah, so they when they left Joe Lewis, it went away, but they just brought it back to the Little Caesars. I'd like to see uh, a couple sneaky bangers of you fans tweeting at us, letting us know what you think the Leafs' goal song should be. Uh, well, I think of this though, like the Bruins is Zombie Nation, and if you said that, you'd be like, "What?" But it actually works for them. Like, I'm sure there's. It's some all Bruins about fans. the snippet because you're not playing the whole song. Yeah, yeah, it's the snippet exactly, Biz. But I think that most people, if you said Zombie Nation, be like, "What? That sounds awful." And there's probably Bruins fans who are ready for a change. But I seem to think it hits. It hits when there's a, when when Pasta scored on that shootout goal against Nashville. All of a sudden, Zombie Nation. It kind of works for them. So the way you throw out names of songs, they may sound brutal, but then if you get in the atmosphere of the crowd going nuts, unless you're in Toronto. All of a sudden, you're like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. You Can Call Me Al by Paul Simon. That would be bad. One, right? nice. There you go. I like that. There's, there's no way Detroit's going to get rid of uh, a local guy's song like that if, if people complain. I think, I don't know, is it a, a PC thing? Like, there's yeah, complaints about it? I don't know. It seems like a fucking weakness. Well, anytime Every, you cross the border, that's when people yeah. are going to have the non explicit version. Yeah, I mean, exactly. they're going to have Shania oh, Twain in there. some guy in his basement oh, in Burlington, yeah. Ontario, like wearing a, a mask, <laughs> complaining about the song. I, I, they should do, like, in baseball, individual goal songs. They don't, like, pick a fucking song every time a guy scores. Uh, I, I also think up. that's a little cheesy. I'd rather okay. pick one right. song as a team and roll that out. Right. So, interested to hear your guys' opinions on that. And I'll, I'll think of a few sneaky bangers in the meantime. What's up, guys? Before we go any further... We want to take a minute to talk about the Camberfly sneaker from our friends over at Peter Millar. The Camberfly takes inspiration from the curvature used in aviation and architectural design. The shoe features an ergonomic arc shaped outside the sole draws from this inspiration while dynamic lines showcase an innovative style perfect for the season. The textured mesh uppers allow breathability and flex while an interior foam heel cup provides the support you need for all day comfort. A custom sole gives you durability and traction. Guys, if you want a sneaker that showcases innovative design and features incredible slip-on comfort, you've got to check out the Camberfly from Peter Millar. Head on over to petermillar.com slash chicklets to explore the Camberfly and the rest of the Peter Millar line. Wit, your Oilers, uh, tough start. <laughs> Vancouver beat them 8-1 to one in the home opener. Then they, they lost 4-3 in Edmonton's home opener. Uh, how about this? In Vancouver, Jack Campbell was pulled after giving up four goals on 16 shots in 27-30. Skinner then gave up four goals on 16 shots in 32 minutes, 30 seconds. Then in Edmonton, Skinner gave up four goals on 16 shots during the whole game. So three performances from the goalies, all the same fucking thing. That's pretty wild, the statistical. Very anomaly. wild. Um, not exactly the start you were hoping for in E-Town. Um, that probably goes without saying. Now, after the game on Saturday night, the second one, Skinner was saying like he's very happy where his game is. He's really confident. I and I was like, ah. Uh, I love that. I mean, of the four goals on on the four three loss, the only goal that was kind of bad was the fourth goal by Lafferty. Who Lafferty's a player. I, I mean, obviously there's so many guys in Toronto, but Vancouver he fits right in. I think Talk loves him. Loves he's him. Playing a decent amount. Yep. He's got a high motor. He's a prick to play against. That goal was weak. 
But the it's not just goaltending. Like the goaltending right now is a worry, and and unfortunately, it's like every year preseason brings these different thoughts and and hopes of fan bases that they see guys perform a certain way. And Campbell looked incredible, and so all of a sudden he comes out with a stinker in, in Van that first game. But they they make some of the dumbest decisions. And I know I've been on the Darnell Nurse train in terms of stop worrying about how much he's making. He's a good player. The decision he made the other night, I mean, you you tie the game up to That was a two. whit pinch. It's, that was a whit pinch <laughs> to the core. Just wanting a cookie. It's two to two. You just tied it up. You got four men on a rush, a four on two. Like, you're the fifth guy. You just just stay back. They got plenty of guys on offense there. And and I think it was Fogel who misses the net, wrap around. And, you, and I, I'm watching, and the, the puck goes around. I'm like, oh, two on one. I'm like, two on oh? What the? What? And, and then I saw the replay of Nurse jumping in. It's just kind of like boneheaded decisions. Now, it is so early. It's two games. It, the problem with a start like that is like you got to win the next one. You lose three games, then the noise gets louder oh. and louder, and the fan base gets worse. Trade McDavid. And after they had the eight-one loss, I think they had to do a signing at the West Edmonton Mall. Too. No, that yeah. was that clip was real. Which one? Well, there was a clip that was out there where they were they had to sign specific things, and then there this might be an old clip too, but I, it was at the West Edmonton Mall where a kid was also trying to get some shirt signed. And McDavid's like, I can't. And then the kid turned around and goes and throws it in the pond that was right behind them where they were signing. Now, is this an old clip? Gee, he's I didn't trying even to see this clip. It might be an old one that's been recycled, but the fact that they had to go to a signing after that, hey, how's the what's going on with the power play? Oh, yeah, we're working God. on it. Well, the po the power play, I mean, they were two for seven Saturday yeah. night. So, like the power play last year, the the greatest power play ever. I'm not really worried about then. You know, that that part of their team, it's just you got to get some saves. You got to just get smarter hockey. Like you have to be willing to play like a boring style when you're that team. Like if you're not a couple, if you're not McDavid and Nuge and Leon, it's like you got to understand your role and just get the puck in, play in the other team's zone because defensively, that's not their strong zone. I've never said they're a great defensive team. Yes, I picked them to win the Stanley Cup, but at, at the same time, I understand like you're going to have to really change your game at certain times of the game specifically to be able to win in this league. You can't just win on the power play. Like personally, I, I, sometimes I'm a fan of the early season struggles. And when Pittsburgh ended up winning that first cup, they were not very good in the first half. I think they ended up. I was still on the team. Well, they ended up moving on from, from uh, uh, Tarion and getting Bilesman in. Yep. And then they ended up going on this run. So they're going to have to figure things out. Cause that's a, that's a tough division too. Pacific has always been weak the last couple of years, and all of a sudden, might be the best. Uh, probably the best division right now in hockey. I have five teams coming out of the Pacific. Now, I'll ask you if this continues and things are rocky after about 25 games. I mean, we didn't bring this up in preseason. Could you see them potentially moving on from Woodcroft? It would have, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be around Christmas time. And that's not like, a knock on him. You'd have to be but around Christmas time really struggling. I mean, if you look at his record since he became head coach, it's very impressive. I, under I understand. And sometimes the de decisions get very difficult. But when you have this type of group. I'm not even willing to address it yet. Because, okay, fair. Because it's not fair after two games to go into a complete I'm not panic trying to mode. kick up dust either. Oh, I know you're trying to kick no. up dust with the oil. No, I'm not. I know you're trying to hey, fucking any, pull this no, no, shit no, off any, right Anybody now. listening right now, I'm not. Because I'm saying pressure is so high where if you get out of the gates after, let's say, uh, 25, 30, 30 games, and you're fi playing 500 hockey with this group and the expectations that came in. I'm sure some of you Oilers fans are saying, I look more towards uh, the GM for maybe the nurse signing, not addressing the goaltending situation where last year they signed Campbell. But a decision has to be made at a certain point if you're not getting the production out of the group. I wouldn't even know what type of coach they would bring in and who's on the market for that type of thing. Babs? <laughs> well, Biz, here's the thing. There's fun. about eight to ten teams that you could kind of say the same for. I mean, okay. obviously, like there's oh, yeah. how many with expectations as high as Edmonton? Toronto. I mean, if they ever were like and, struggling and around I Christmas, I don't know. They just resigned Sheldon Keefe, but it's like I, I just think there's a lot of teams that you look at and you okay. think if they're 500 at Christmas time, the coach could be on the hot seat. Every year we see in this league, five coaches fired, right? Three to five coaches. So it, it it's a fair question, but it could be asked to anyone. The other thing is too, is people that, are also like, we're two games in, stop hitting the panic button, but, but we're, we're doing a show where we kind of like have to talk about what's happening, but I agree. It's okay. so early. It's so early that it's really hard to, to get too overwhelmed by any slow or fast start. In terms of the Oilers, though, 
Matthias Ekholm, he came over. I think they were 18, one and two. It was this amazing run after they acquired him at the deadline. He played with Bouchard. He really helped his game. He was the the per- perfect number one defensive for the Oilers. He didn't get any preseason, right? And he didn't play in the opener. And then he plays Saturday night in his first game. It's like, you don't have the runway. You don't have the beginning of the season to get out the kink. So obviously when he finds his game, that's an enormous thing for them. You got to give him a little bit of time. He didn't, he was the one who got beat by Lafferty on that fourth goal. I don't think that happens if he's feeling a little bit more mid mid season form. So I'm not going to get too rattled right now. Obviously like they, they, the first game was embarrassing, but that's just a blowout. It sucks when it's the first game of the year. If that was in January, no one says a word. The second game, their start was actually what I'd really hoped for. They came out flying. They came out buzzing. They still, I think they had over 40, 45 shots. Yeah, they dominated so it all was, that I mean, stuff, it was, yeah. it was, a, Casey DeSmith was battling. He made some unreal saves. So it's like, they played definitely good enough to win that game. It was the nurse pinch and just not getting a win in the home opener that really sticks out. Uh, we have to give Vancouver because we haven't had much positive things to say over the last Pedersen, couple of years. Dude. Buddy, I better say I know I'm going to fucking eat my shit on that one. I said nine and a half in that range and maybe question how he plays on the defensive side of the puck. Some people were saying he had a couple votes for the, the Selkie or not the Sel- Selkie. Yeah, the defensive one last year. But overall, he's trucking guys right now. Yeah, he's he making hits. plays. He's battling his dick off. Six points, two games. And I, at this point, it's looking like 11 million, 11 and a half even. He made he a great, a, oh, sorry. Babe. No, go ahead. Great little play on, on that 2 on oh, Like he kind of got nurse's lane just enough to like buddy. throw him off a little bit, like subtle little he thing. He moved yeah. it and just took, yeah. it, it was his ice as much yeah. as it was nurse's. Yeah. And he just moved over enough to give a little bit time to the goal scorer. So Stallion. He, so he the, is so good, dude. Between him, JT Miller, who I thought was awesome and, and was a bit of a wet, wet blanket five on five against. He's uh, also a motherfucker. He's a motherfucker. There. He, he looks like he plays the game. I would have done anything if in my DNA I had this. He's angry. Ryan he's, Kessler 2.0. He's, yes, he plays the game so pissed off. Like he's just looking to snap on someone. And then his shot, you saw the goal he scored in the first one. He, he's an unbelievable player. He's so fast. Great on face off. So I, I said, I said, if Vancouver gets in, Pedersen's going to be up for, for MVP. And I think with talk and how much they respect him, and if they get the goaltending like DeSmith showed, and uh, it's just, it, it, it could be a surprise season. And Quinn Hughes, just so oh cool, God. calm, and collected. He can give you 28 minutes. He's a freak. Totally makes sense that he was named captain. It's, it could be a very exciting year. Uh, we have to mention Brock Besser. Mm-hmm. I could not be happier for this guy. He's dealt with, uh, he had a d- couple difficult yeah. years, uh, lost his father, mm-hmm. uh, obviously struggled a little bit on the on the ice. I, I don't know if that was a result, but obviously a lot of things happening in his personal life. So for him to open the season with four goals, uh, apparently he trained his balls off this summer too and really came in uh, looking to make an impact impact and I, I couldn't be happier for the guy because he's one of the nicest guys going to Texas hat trick uh Thatcher Demko I don't know if he was at the Chicklets Cup or not but he had to leave the game with 12 minutes left puking no, in this mask no so th- so th- there was a blues bu- going around the, the, the flu was going around the team so just overall for the first two games and the mindset coming into the season for talking that group to battle through that and get four points just a gutsy overall performance uh Demko puked in his mask, had to leave that first game at the end. So shout out to that team right now, man. They're they're battling their dicks off. And not the easiest of situations because they don't have a great arena uh, situ in Vancouver. I, where they're, what do you mean? Th- just they're 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 not practicing at their regular rink all the time. So they're constantly having to do the dress and drives. They're practicing at UBC. They're practicing. Well, they don't have a practice rink facility. They don't have a practice facility right now. And wow. that, that arena is normally sold out for concerts and stuff. So they had that going on for them. That's uh, a pain in the ass. Pain in the ass. They did a little bit of training camp over in Victoria, but had that first home game. And now they're on the road for seven, the first of which was in Edmonton. So now they're going out east to Florida. So a very difficult start as far as scheduling. If they can get four of these next six on the road, that's a, a perfect start for the Vancouver Canucks to get their confidence back. And then all of a sudden, oof, I might regret not taking them a, as a playoff and, team. And then staying in the Pacific quick, because I know we're kind of hopping around. Yeah. Vegas. <laughs> oh, man. They are 3-0. and all. They've won 4-1 to one every single game. Eichel scoring highlight real goals. They have the same fucking team back, minus Riley Smith. Amadio is an unreal player Play who's getting him. a bigger role. They, they, they are, like, like, just the fact that they're, like, kind of, like, not brought up in terms of, like, 
powerhouses going into the season. And maybe that's an understatement. And people were like, Vegas is the same team. I thought it might be maybe a slow start, but three games, they look so good. They look like the best team in the league. I know it's Gary Lawless and he works for the team, but he said Kelly McCrimmon's probably one of the smartest hockey minds in the game. And just with these sneaky pickups, that that Mike Amadio, I play with him in the AHL. He just has something that you can't teach where he's always, he's, he skates pretty straight up. So he's always scanning the ice. And when he's got the puck on his stick, it's almost like his heart rate drops. He just doesn't have that, you know, you know, when guys pick it up and all of a sudden they're like, you know, 180 heartbeats per minute. He's, it seems like he could slow everything down. So just a sneaky, great player helped me, uh, or actually he wasn't there when we won the Calder cup, but I got to play with him when he was with the rain with the LA Kings. And He's just an, an awesome player. And as you said, man, they only lost Riley Smith. And that was the best fourth line in hockey all of last year. So if anything, those guys could get a little bit more ice time. And they're just humming out of the gates. Uh, also, they raised the first ever banner for Las Vegas. First time they went on yep. a major four championship. How about those rings, man? They had a little special compartment if uh, you need to hide something while you're in <laughs> Vegas. I, I thought that was a perfect ring for Vegas. Yeah, and they have a, a little mark of all nine goals where they were scored yeah. from on the ice the game that, we were at the clincher is pretty, pretty unique oh, there's a little x like a little x where all the nine goals score and of course vegas being that big strong team there's like six of them right around the crease yeah that's just how they how they dusted florida you but mean the game we should have been on and won a gazillion dollars i should have yeah. that was i'll never get over that yeah I uh, also want to say welcome back to Logan Thompson. We met him at the All-Star game. He hadn't played since January uh, for, due to his injury. First game back, he stopped 22 out of 23 for the W. So good to see him getting back. I also, dude, we always talk about other team centers, but you, you look at Vegas, man. Stevenson, Eichel, Carlson, Roy. I mean, th th that might kind of got to be one of the top three fucking center. center I, I, think I, I, think I, miss, I think I misspoke when I said the Kings had the best center ice in all the league when I was trying to pump their tires and uh, pick them as my Western team. Uh, given that they're champions and they have guys who have proved in their lineup and Roy easily probably the best fourth line center in the league right now, I would have to agree with you, R.A., best center depth going. And, uh, Stevenson's going to get a payday. Oh, oh yeah, <sighs> absolutely. Uh, Brett Howden won the uh, first Sussy of the year pool. Got two games for Cream and uh, Brandon Tanev when they played Seattle. But we got to circle back to Vancouver for a sec, boys. Uh, Connick Allen scored the first Canucks goal of the season. But just prior to that, Elliot Friedman reported that the Canucks granted him permission to talk to other teams. And his new agent, Judd, is uh, doing just that. They need a cap room. And uh, Jim Rutherford didn't sign Gallon, so he doesn't really have any, I guess, loyalty to him. But it shouldn't be too hard to get rid of this guy. He's fucking shifty. Good, good well, no, it's going to be hard five, because he makes he? five. Yeah. He makes five for, I want to say, the next two years after this year. Yeah, until 2020, 2025, 2026. Yeah, and I, I like Garls. He came on the scene, um, you know, as a, as a fourth liner in, in Arizona, finally getting his shot when there was a few injuries. And just through him forechecking and working his balls off out there, he started, you know, climbing up the lineup, you know, started playing in the top six and started getting points. And I don't know, sometimes, you know, maybe when you get your payday, you, you get away from the things that brought you success. And I think that exactly what I said about Max Domi, whereas I think that if he gets a little bit more back to his old game and maybe mix with a new, uh, some new scenery, uh, he could find himself in a happy place. Uh, I think that his game has maybe tailed off a little bit since getting that contract as to what he brought, at least what I saw with the Arizona Coyotes. So a little bit more salt and pepper to get back to what brought him that original success. Hounding down pucks on the forecheck, you know, getting in those greasy areas. And I think that he is, a, I think that he's probably a 20 to 25 goal guy around that 50 point range. And for me, that's a, a great pickup for a, a Stanley Cup team on, on a third line role. Mm -hmm. But the problem being is, is there's just no cap space anymore and he's making that $5 million tag. But sometimes we've seen it before. Guys aren't happy, they're complaining, they can't necessarily find a trade for him, but he comes in, has a great start, and it ends up all working itself out. Jake so DeBrusque happened in Boston the, with Jake DeBrusque. The, 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 there you go, there's a prime example. Yeah, but when when Cassidy got left go, didn't he immediately take back immediately the trade? Immediately rescinded it. But um, Garland would be sick on the Bruins. They and where did, and, and, he'd be great on and, the Bruins. And where did he have a success? In Arizona when talk was coaching him. So he's got a little bit of time to work with him here, and I hope it all works itself out. And his goal was 
will probably be one of the top 10 passes of the season by Pedersen. He sauced it. Oh my gosh. Just over. I don't Lunar. know. The, the D, who's the D man? Lunar me? sauce. Oh, it was, but it, la it landed it was, an inch over the defenseman's stick. It was a directly Bouchard? flat. I don't remember. Directly flat on Garland. It was sick from the far wall. So uh, I, I'm, uh, he's a Situ guy. That's where I'm from. So I, I'm rooting for him always. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Jack Hughes earlier. He had the uh, big chicklets text thread riled up the other night. He got uh, two goals in that first game, three assists in the second game. But this kid, is he top three forward already, Biz Jack Hughes? Oh, he, he is I, so sick. I would say outside of, I mean, I would probably even put him in McKinnon range right now. But outside of McDavid and McKinnon and maybe McCarr, he's the funnest player to watch. If Regardless of the team, just to watch a hockey game to see the things that he does. I he's don't floating. He's he floats on the ice where when he goes, when he stops his feet moving and he gets the defender to bite, to stop, to kind of match the momentum, the way he's able to put on the jets now and then create that separation instantly is becoming second to none. So with along with that, with the skill set and his um, his eagerness to even go to those hard areas by like cutting to the middle. I mean, you saw that goal the other the other night where he had two. Who who was that against? Without I think it was Detroit. against Detroit. Yeah, yep. He is he's worth the price of admission, and you're fucking toast if this guy stays healthy. You're going to be snapping off three hundred k to Pasha. I, I said you're done last year. Like I know that, that I, I I've been over this a million times. The guy won't even take a twenty three hundred dollar buyout. That scumbag Pasha. Shout out to uh, Pasha for a funny little man on the street segment in New York, uh, where he just fed the answers to a bunch of randos about how much he hates the Rangers, but. Hughes, if you can take a look and somehow go back and watch overtime the other day, oh, he he, <laughs> it was a one man show. I've never seen anything like it. He could he could have ended the overtime four different times. He and now granted it's three on three, which fits into his game perfectly. But the way he's skating and how quick he looks and like he's just so sick. His hands. You saw the assists over to Brad on two of those goals. Just perfect sauce. Brad and him work so well together. And Brad actually had a comment, something about how obsessed Hughes is on becoming better. He goes, you don't see him in the gym much, but in terms of on the ice, his game on the ice, he's completely obsessed with becoming the best possible player he can be. And it is so, I'm, I'm with you. It is, it, there aren't many guys that are more fun to watch play hockey. It's, un, it's unreal. I was at that opening night game and I was saying this to Biz last night. When you watch Connor McDavid live, it kind of just seems like he's like on fast forward. Like he's just a yeah. little, he's cranked up a little bit fast faster than everyone else. Jack Hughes now is like that. Like every time he's on the ice, he's yeah. just like quicker and faster and getting to pucks more. And he just, he looks like a man amongst boys. If you yeah, don't have does. a great gap on him, at least from, even from a forward perspective where you're matching his speed early when he's coming out of his own blue line, you're, you're toast. Like I said, he'll, he'll often stop moving his feet where he'll get the defender to. And then the minute he's got him, he just turns on the jets, mm. blows by him. And you mentioned that overtime, he had that same cut in play three times. I think. <laughs> yeah. Where he's not shy to go to the net either. And I think, I think 150 points is not out of the question. If he stays, whoa, healthy. Whoa, 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 whoa. if he stays healthy, I mean, McDavid has never had 150. Is, what did McDavid get last year? Not 150. What's what, what's what's Hughes have right now? He's got uh, five points in two games. Okay. Yeah. So you basically have to do. Yeah. I think if yeah. he's healthy, like 120, no doubt. Okay. But 150. He, that that's a crazy. You want to bet? Well, <laughs> well, McDavid had 153 last year. Okay. Uh, he, he can probably kiss the lady Bing goodbye. He's already got two penalties. He only had three of all of last year. So game. that's another <laughs> thing, too. He's got a mean streak going right now. I forget who the defender was, but he gave him a little... He kind of stepped over top of him after, like after he, he hit he him. He dragged his balls on his yeah. head, man. He dragged his <laughs> nuts right across his forehead, and then he gave him a two-handed whack, and, and he was not... He was barking at the official. I thought it was a little soft at the time of the game in which it was called, too, but that's another thing you love to see, too, as a fan, where he's got his snarl and his bite Kind of like we, we see from McKinnon, right? I want to yeah. see a bit um, of a snap show. You oh, yeah. want you want that drive and that intensity from your, oh, it your leader. It makes you even better, and it creates space for you too. Even if people say it doesn't, it ends up working out in your favor. But I am interested because Devils fans 
Pasha and, and a bunch of others included, they've loved Meyer ever since he came over. I, I haven't like seen offensively like what he's making yet. And this is included last year, which obviously in the in the in the series against the Rangers, he took that huge hit in the final game. But it's just more about like I I I'm interested to see what he puts up for numbers this year. And I think because he's not gonna have to get those number one matchups because they're dealing with Hughes, he still should be able to produce a lot. But I haven't seen like the nine, ten million dollar man since he's gotten there. I think that's a fair assessment. He played well in playoffs last year, didn't have the point production. But he, you, but it's, you're not playing well without point production if you're him. You're I, not. I, I understand, but even watching these two first games, I haven't noticed them as much as I'd like if I was a New Jersey Devils fan, have handing over that much money for that much term. But sometimes I find like the bigger guys do take a, a, a few weeks to get into the rhythm of the season. Just a, a bigger body guy catching up to the pace of speed. I know like Ra a guy like Rafi Torres. I don't know why that name just came to my head. He was a notoriously slow starter where he would have brutal camps, brutal first 15 games of the year where coach was like, wake the fuck up. Why but is that? Why do you think he's got to get the train going? Yeah, Start just keep, so, yeah. But some why guy, are you, you're saying the bigger guys though? Like why? Why is it bigger guys? Do you think? Uh, I just think that uh, I feel like at the beginning of the season, like it's harder to play. I guess more physical because they call more penalties. Uh, I feel that it takes you maybe a little bit longer to shed some lbs to kind of catch up to these little water bugs that are out there. Um, and I just find that it's notoriously guys who who make their money in harder areas where it takes them a little bit longer to go get going. What an answer by me to put on the spot. Great, Great answer. job, Great answer. Good job, buddy. Pat me on the back, please. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, all, uh, all three Hughes brothers are in the league right now. But this is the first year biz since 1976 without a Sutter, a Sutter brother or a son either playing, coaching, or GMing in the league. First year since 76 wrote a Southern in the league. Yeah, yeah they got to get that sperm bank working back again on the, <laughs> on the farm. Uh, also, uh, Friday, that same game, your boy Logan Cooley, two assists in his debut along with two shots. The second was unbelievable. The no look backhander to tie the game up. Uh, and did you see the Coyotes? They got a new well, game belt. Like they picked up either a rugby ball or an yeah. Australian Roos football ball, and that's their new uh, game belt. Yeah, Kells, Kells yeah. ended up giving out to, uh, to Cooley. I, I thought Cooley looked awesome. Uh, he ended up what, finishing the game with one assist? Two assists, yeah. He had two, yeah. okay. Yeah. You, I think you just mentioned that. But aside from that, he was also making other plays that could have ended up in the back of the net. Like even that shift that where Schmaltz he ended up scoring on the short side, he had a few dishes in the midst of that. So as far as a young guy coming in, man, this is a guy who's going to get plenty of reps because he's playing with the Coyotes. They're going to want him to, to develop. He could challenge, and and you've been barking this since the since training camp. G, he could challenge Bedard for the Calder Trophy. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent believe that, and I also think if we're redrafting that twenty twenty two draft class, I'm drafting him first overall over Slavkovsky any day. I mean, I know it's still early, but like I, I love what I've seen from this kid. Slavkovsky's hurt all the time. Simone Nemec went too. I don't know. I just feel like Logan Cooley would have been the first, a better first overall pick. And and I've always talked about Armstrong's ability to draft and develop. It could have been easy to go after the dangling carrot in yep. uh, who went Slavkowski. fourth. Slavkowski. Who went fourth? Oh, uh, uh, Shane Wright. Shane Wright, right? Everybody, oh, Shane Wright was going to go first. Oh, and all of a sudden he's available third. And he was adamant that he had his guy in Logan Cooley. So shout out to Armstrong for taking him. And Looks then he was able to get him come out. He exactly. wasn't going to come out. And then, he announced and, he's coming back. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I think that um, him and Clayton Keller have the same agent, right? Yeah. And, and, and things were things. Uh, they probably said, li listen, like, you are ready. Like you do not need to go back. And I think there was some unfinished business with Minnesota losing in the national title game. But luckily for for Arizona, you got a guy that was ready to come into this league. And they need here. some luck. I mean, like you've always said, like they just can't get that first overall pick. Never. Well, it seems like in that 22, 2022 might, draft, like you might have got the first. So overall they've pick. had. I want to say this is their third or fourth third overall pick. They had Kyle Turris. Um, who was the other one they had third overall? They had Strom at third overall. And I want to say maybe Mueller was a third overall pick. No, I think he was fifth. M fifth? Okay. So they haven't really struck on the highest of picks that they've had. Who was their other third overall? Is this is that their third? I'm still trying to find it. Here. Okay, no. But finally to hit on one, along with some of these other young guys they have, like if Gunther can take that next step, we've talked about Michelli. I think he got sent down, Gunther. I know, but he's but, yeah. but still, if he, if he can I don't pan, hate that. Yeah, I, if he can pan out. Barrett Hayton started showing signs of coming around the corner. He he was a fifth overall pick. So Doug, uh, uh, Bill Armstrong's done a great job and, and hopefully uh, uh, these guys continue to develop and elevate this team. But they looked- They're going to be tough this as year. As a team, 
They looked excellent yep. against the New Jersey Devils, and they are not going to be an easy two points anymore. And Armstrong's best move after getting Cooley to leave was was Jersey. He scored a mm -hmm. rocket in that game, and he looks really good. I loved him in LA. So that's a that's a hell of a hell of a signing right there, or a trade, whatever it was. Yeah, good replacement for losing Goss to Spares, having that other offensive defenseman to yep. come into. He'll get his reps. I thought Dumbo looked great. Yeah, get a goal too. Guys love him in the locker room too. He's a blast. So I'm glad we got to cover the Coyotes early and, and give a shout out to Cooley. Buddy. I got you, buddy. I got you four other teams in here, too. So don't worry about it. Uh, Logan Cooley, right? The 14th player to make his debut on Friday the 13th and the first one to record a Why point. Why are you going to go dark on us now? No, no, not the movie. No, it was a good thing, dude. Oh. First guy to ever get a point. The 14 plays in NHL history, their first day of their career was on a Friday the 13th. <laughs> <He's> the <f> <laughs> Good luck. I'm not a horror movie guy. No, no, me neither. I literally can't even watch them. I, I used, I used to, to watch kid, the one. I would have to watch a horror movie in daylight. Oh, I'm a big um, Halloween guy. I'm not kidding. Halloween. I'm a bitch Who, guy. Uh, I think it was the Halloween one. You'd always get to see like a set of tits in them. Oh, like the once. Slash of that's, that's, yeah. that's what made me early on yeah, be yeah, a big that's, horror that's movie biz, guy. That's why Biz likes You'd see, the, see the, some titties. They have the... Um, the ski tits, the slope ones. Oh, like like the, 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 the woman yeah. in slap shot. Oh, yeah. the Those best the ski tits of all time. Ski titties right there. Suzanne Hanrahan. Suzanne Hanrahan. Oh, yeah. Suzanne sucks pussy. I know. I, I know. Mean, <laughs> I mean, I would pay a lot of money to do a bump off those ski tits. Jesus Christ. I mean, come on. Wouldn't you? Jesus Christ. You, <laughs> I mean, you bet three grand that Hughes wasn't going to get 100 points. You wouldn't pay a Gino to fucking no. bump off ski tits? No. Come on. For Christ's sake. Just the bunny hills. They don't make them like that anymore. Uh, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Right, you kind of got ski tits on you. I'd do a bump <laughs> off yours. <laughs> we can, I'll we tell can you talk. This. We I'll, can talk. I'll tell this. If the Leafs win the cup, I'll do a bump off your nipple, all right? Okay? Uh, yeah, I guess. I will we'll commit to that. So that's Okay, there yeah. you go. Uh, do, you, do you have like, a favorite horror movie, Biz or what? Do you like, I know you don't say don't watch it, but you, you know what I used to love? Oh, it. You know what I used Scream. to love? Okay. You know what I used That's to love, even a horror movie, and you would it? definitely yeah. see tits in these. Was the Leprechaun ones? I used to watch those ones. Oh, geez. the Leprechaun I horror movies. Never watched them. Yeah, yeah, heard Jennifer of them. Aniston was in the first one, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. The first Saw I saw, Ooh. that wasn't too bad. The Saws were great. Those were good. that was a revolutionary type horror movie, in yeah. my opinion. What was the guy's name? The bad guy. Uh, I never, I never saw. Oh, I never saw a Saw. What's his name? No, the no. guy from Sawfish, what? Jigsaw. Jigsaw. All right, before we go any further, I want to let you know that Spittin' Chicklets is brought to you by Body Armor. From sports drinks to sport water, Body Armor keeps us hydrated all day long. Whether we're talking, watching, or even playing sports, Body Armor is our go-to choice all the time. It's real hydration, real ingredients, packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial. Body Armor has great flavors like strawberry banana, blue raspberry, and a whole bunch more. And the best athletes in the world hydrate with body armor, like Ronald Acuna Jr., Christian McCaffrey, Alex Morgan, and the latest athlete to join the team, Joe Burrow. I've said it before. I'll say it again now. Strawberry banana is by far my favorite. Gets me through the day, the night, the weekend, everything. We record late night, need some body armor, boom. Slug the water down after the chicken's cup, boom. More of the water. So anyways, go out and get yours. It's available in stores nationwide. Head on over to the body armor store on Amazon and get yours today. All right, boys, a few signings uh, since the last time we chatted. We just left Buffalo, and they just locked up uh, the young defenseman, Owen Power, a seven-year, $58.45 million extension. Uh, he's got a modified no-trade clause for the last two years. It's an 8.35 average annual value. He'll be 28 when the deal ends. He's in the last year of his ELC right now. Biz, uh, what was your take on this? Buffalo locking him up? Yeah, I think that's the market rate. You saw uh, Sanderson from the Senators get it roughly around that exact same number. Um, I think if you ask Kevin Adams, he shows every sign of a true professional where he's going to continue to excel his game. Uh, I don't know how high his offensive window. Especially with Darlene there taking with, the power play. Yeah, down. I think that it's a home run if he ends up like a Jay Bowmeister. That would be my, that's my feeling on it. A guy who might get you like 40 points. Yeah, like that 40 point range. A guy who is very reliable on the defensive side of the puck, easily a, 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 an excellent top four. I would probably put him in that number three role. I, I think you're hoping for 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 top two, right? I mean, now yeah. granted they have their number one, but with that money, even though in, in seven years, the money will look 
like not much. I think, you know, you're, you're not hoping for a third defenseman with that. Yeah. But I think overall, this isn't necessarily a gamble. You might be paying a, a little bit high of a price if he doesn't continue to exceed offensively and that's it. But to get good quality defensemen with his size, uh, it's, it's hard in this league. So you gotta, you gotta lock those guys in early. And it just goes back to what we said last podcast about it feels like Kevin Adams is trying to give these guys the confidence moving forward to not have to worry about any type of contract situations where he's saying, this is our core group of guys. I believe in you. You got the money in place now. Now just go worry about getting better and figuring it out together and and going to win some hockey games. But from an overall standpoint, um, and I said this in our preseason predictions, I thought that I might end up regretting not picking Ottawa as the team to get in as opposed to Buffalo being ready. And that is is looking like it's going to be true because I was not impressed with the team game in the in the first two games. Uh, the Rangers, they, Rangers dominated. The them. Rangers did dominate them. I tweeted about this. I thought that that fucking penalty on Benson, which ended up they went down two nothing on that power play, was absolutely horseshit. All you Buffalo fans know exactly what pay I'm talking about because when they put it on the jumbotron, you guys lost your minds. But aside from that, they got worked. They haven't looked good. No point so far for Tage Thompson. So hoping that these guys get going soon because if you find yourself outside of a playoff spot come uh, American Thanksgiving and you get off to a slow start, you guys know what the, the the numbers tell you. If you're outside of a playoff spot, you're in one. You're you're in one, especially in a division where I think Detroit has played very strong. Do I think that that they're better than Detroit? Absolutely. But as a team, Detroit's looked good out of the gate, and Ottawa, after dropping that first one, oh, they look fucking strong. And if they get Norris back with those three defensemen and and Corpusalo kicking, look out. And and Buffalo in terms of Buffalo. The second game, bright side, Benson. <laughs> two apps. Two apples. Looks so good. I mean, if he's like a couple inches taller, they ain't getting him where they got him in the draft. So I think they they probably hit a home run with that kid. The fact he came in, made the team, and then looks this good. The Devon Levy thing, probably not his best um, through two. And, and I think that that's probably why they did keep those three goalies, right? Because I know, granted, they could have lost one on waivers, which Kevin Adams was talking to us about when RA was was in one. But I think that they're not exactly sure. Like everyone's kind of hoping Levi could maybe be like a, a dark horse Calder guy, but it's it's just so hard. Like I, it's not common for a guy to play college and then be a starter in the NHL next the next season. It's just it's 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 not easy to do. The league is such a big jump, and so hopefully goaltending being the hardest position easily, to jump in easily. So luckily they do have three guys there in, in terms of Comrie and what's the other guy's name? Uh, the other it's goal. A, it's a Euro name, isn't um, it? Yeah, I'm drawing a blank. But Buffalo, yeah, the, that's not not the start they wanted. Ottawa with Brady Kachuk is like, you see his celebrations after the goals, like he's just flexing to the net, crowd. Net front, you can't move. No, you can't move him. And like, he's just battling away. He's never out of the play. And yeah, Ottawa looks looks great. Now, granted, they didn't have Stamkos. Tampa didn't have Stamkos when they beat him on Sunday. Or a goaltender. That was a... <laughs> Yeah, the goal, well, that kid, I was happy for him. I think it was just, I can't look up his name. It was 29 years old getting his first start for Tampa. And he made some great saves and, you know, he gave up four. They, they got the empty netter. Um, but it, it was it was more about just Ottawa, just putting their will on them and not stopping. Joseph got a beauty. Um, so if they can get Norris back, I don't, I still Matt don't. Matt Tompkins was his name. Yes, yeah. So congrats to him. You know, waiting that long to get your first first NHL start, that's a great story. But I, I don't know about Norris. He's not on long-term IR, so you got to think he'll be back soon. Both, and, both of those teams, Buffalo and Ottawa, dealing with a major injury up front. Because Buffalo needs to get Jack Quinn back, just like yep. Ottawa needs to get Norris back. Norris is at what? Is he a 30 goal guy? Yeah. I mean, and, and the deal he signed, they're expecting big things. So that's just just what Ottawa needed. And and Brady Kachuk gave a, an interview, one of those interviews that's that's kind of broadcast to the entire arena and just mentioned we love playing in front of you. The crowd was unreal. The owner was getting involved with the fans. He Handsome was like, guy. Yeah, eh? guy's a stallion. I mean, if you can be the billionaire and a good looking guy, oh, it's man, fucking, probably Jesus. got a wrench on What an too. absolute animal. So um, and then in Detroit. Right away to bring cat. Boom. That's what you're hoping. You know, him and Larkin have that connection. Larkin gave him a sick dish for a goal the other day, the other night. And so Detroit's coming out flying. Cider looks good. Um, that's one thing where I think if Huso can kind of have a bounce back here, they're going to be better than I thought. But it just seems like 
of the three teams we've talked about for at length in the offseason with Detroit, Ottawa, and Buffalo. Uh, Detroit and Ottawa's first few games look a lot better than the Sabres. Yeah, and uh, shout out to the Liver King, the NHL Liver King, Chikrin, two goals. So that that top three defense for Ottawa is yep. lethal. Yep. They can bring it both sides of the puck. And uh, between Shabbat, Sanderson, and, and Chikrin, they got uh, they got some good depth on D, R, A. Some good depth. Four goals already for Brady. Uh, another sign, and the Avs locked up Devon Taves. Seven-year, 50.25 million. Comes out to seven and a quarter a year. Uh, he's got a no-move clause for the first two, a modified no-trade clause for the last five. He'll be 37 when the deal ends. Uh, he's currently in the last year of a four-year, $16.4 million deal. What about what you expected? A win-win. Right. And I and I think he definitely left some money on the table if he goes to the open market. Speaking of the open market, we're do, we're done. We're done ever having yeah, free agents. Good free over. agents. Pedersen next year. He we won't be. No. It's if you're he'll really have, good. He'll player, have Aquilini's balls in a vice by Christmas. Free agency now will be not fringe guys, but they'll be, you know, the the depth guys and the fifth and sixth defensemen. It's just, you have to lock up your talent. You can't allow a, a, a superstar to get to free agency and lose him for nothing. And so that it, it, it ruins July 1st in terms of covering it and rooting for the old school big signing days. But Devon Taves, while leaving a little bit on the table, gets to be in a city he loves on one of the best teams in the league that will be for the next, I'd say, five years competing for the Stanley Cup. So it's like you get your, you, you're set for life if he wasn't already. He now has that monster deal. He now gets to play with Makar for, for the rest of his career, basically. And then you, it, if you're Denver, you're, you're like, yeah, may, maybe at the end that deal's like a little high, but you're 36, 37. They don't care about that right now. Yeah. They care about the next five seasons, the next six seasons, competing every year for the Stanley Cup. So if you're an Avs fan, you're fired up. Devon Taves is set for life, and the and the GM, uh, Joe Sackick, is looking at it like we have a great number two defenseman now locked in. I'm actually surprised with that uh, that AAV that he couldn't get that eighth year. Just because of how I was shocked it came in at what seven point two, right? Yep. Yeah, seven two five. Yeah, that's that's and, and, just, and, and some people could say, well, he gets to be the number two guy behind uh, Makar, and in playing with him is obviously <laughs> makes things a lot easier. But I think in an open market with the lack of free agents, I think a team would easily give him eight and a half nine million. Obviously, you, you can't give him that eighth year, and that's where maybe because of the low a, lower AVV, I thought he would get it. But you just said it's a win-win for both sides. This is a guy who gets to solidify playing with a great team for they're, they're going to be a cup contender that at least the next three four years with the yeah. way that they're built and the way the cap's going up. So you got to be happy to just stick around. And and we all know that that things living in Colorado and not necessarily under the gun in a big market and having a good team like that. It just makes life a lot easier when you know you're going to be winning 45 to 50 games every year and having a chance at winning a Stanley Cup. So Saka keeps doing his thing. They keep that core together. And uh, since we're on the Colorado topic, I think that we have a new most underrated player in the league. Ratanen? He, Ratanen is the most underrated player. When's his player. deal up, Jay? He's, he signed a long-term deal. And He's he, locked? He, 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 he got a nice ticket too. I think he makes nine and a half million. He signed an eight year deal, but because you have McKinnon there and because 9.25, 9.25, 9 just off, I'm with my numbers. Yeah, you're right feeling now. it right Holy now. Holy shit. Hey, he yeah. is, um, I think I said it last year. He's, um, 10 years ago of Genny Malkin. He reminds me of Malkin, the way he moves his shot, how big he is. He is, you're right. Not talked about enough. And it's because of McKinnon and McCarr. Star player. He makes the fucking play every time. And he's a horse. He's a horse. Those he, Finnish guys, just dude. oh, big yeah. ass, strong on their you know feet. He, you know he can crush his vodka too. And uh, I think the first time in a long time, or it might even be the first time ever, where a player had four points in back to back season openers. And he, he he did so in that first game. I forget who they played. Uh, or no, it was LA. It was LA on the TNT broadcast. And he put on a show. And uh, and yeah, overall, that Avs team is looking filthy right now. Uh, the Ducks claimed Ross Johnston off a waivers from the Islanders. He's got three years left at 1.1 mil. Nice little heart and soul type guy. A little uh, gritty grinder. Who? Ross Johnston. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no no no. Sorry, I black. No. I literally blacked out as soon as you started talking. <laughs> who, who did he sign for? And, uh, well, he was signed with the Islanders, uh, and they waved him, and the Ducks picked him up. He's got three the years fighter. left at one point one. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. he's tough yeah. as nails. No yeah, worries. Absolutely. Uh, also, I wasn't yeah. trying to be smart. I don't want this guy uh, suffering. No, you sounded no. like an owl. Who? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, the Devils extended head coach Lindy Ruff with a, a multi-year deal. He was signed through this season, so they take away any, uh, what do you call it, La, lame duck status. Well deserved. Yeah, absolutely. From, from, from the ch the fans chanting fire Lindy opening night to to having that season they had. and, and then Well, looking Posh like is chanting it again because they lost to the Desert Dogs. Yeah, Posh is a dirtbag. <laughs> uh, terms were not disclosed. Uh, some news about one of the uh, former coach, uh, Barry Melrose, who's been working with ESPN for like Terrible close news. to the last 30 years. Uh, very sad news. Uh, we want to send our best wishes to Barry. He announced his retirement from ESPN because he has Parkinson's disease. So he's going to retire and spend some Great time video time um, that ESPN put out. Or I, I, I think I saw Steve Levy and, and Bucci, Bucci yeah. Ross put it out. I remember when, when I started kind of really getting into the NHL, I always say it was the 94 Rangers Cup run, and he was just NHL tonight with Boutrigras back in the day. He had the great suits. He had the, the gray wings in his hair. And, I mean, what he did coaching L.A. to the finals and, like, how highly Gretzky spoke of him on that video, kind of narrating in it, he's always been a part of kind of American hockey fans' lives. I think everyone's always enjoyed. He's done the Final Four with Bouchergrass in terms of college hockey. So we're really thinking of him. That That's just brutal news. And hopefully he's able to spend a lot of time with his family and and deal with this as well as he can because that was that was shitty news to see. Yeah. What yeah. he did for the game as far as a coach and, and – uh, and in media, he's been going at it. Uh, Kelly Cup champion, I believe, in the ECHL. Or no, sorry, Calder Cup. And he won He won another championship as well, didn't he, as a coach? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but that, imagine 30 years ago that, that Kings team was on the finals versus Montreal. And that's, that's so crazy. I'm glad you brought that up because Wayne got to touch on that on the broadcast because when they went to the Stanley Cup final against uh, uh, Montreal – and they beat uh, Toronto in that conference final. I think one of the best games Wayne said he ever played. He said that uh, he really let the players' personalities shine. He always wanted the players to be themselves. And 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 back said, then that wasn't back, common. Back then that wasn't common for coaches to allow that. So to have a players' coach back then and to make life so enjoyable and be the amazing guy that you keep hearing throughout wherever you hear about Barry Melrose, all you hear about how unreal of a guy he is. Um, it, it, it was cool to hear Wayne talk about him on the broadcast. So our heart goes out to the family and, and hopefully he can, uh, you know, he can keep battling here. Mem uh, cup and a call their cup. Mem cup. That's what he won. Yeah. yeah. Memorial uh, cup. Well said biz. Uh, another guy on TV, we talked about a little while ago, Kenny Albert. I think we should probably bring him on right now. His book, a mic for all seasons, wherever you can buy books. So let's send it over to Kenny Albert. Who was this Paul? What was the politician's name? The story he tells. Oh, uh, Bloomberg. He tells this fucking oh, yeah. <laughs> Bloomberg story. It's one of the funniest stories I've ever heard on the podcast. So to Kenny, you're a true pro, buddy. Thank you for coming on. A true gentleman. Interested for you guys uh, to Buy the, book. the podcast. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Chevy. Chevy has convenient ways to research and shop electric vehicles online. When researching, utilize Chevy My Way. Vehicle specialists and hosts give a virtual tour and help answer your questions. When you're ready, you're able to buy online by reviewing available EV inventory or build your own at participating dealers. You can do as much or as little of the buying process online with help from a participating dealer. You can configure finance and lease payments, apply for credit, upload documents, and finalize your purchase through our secure checkout process. You can even schedule vehicle delivery at home or at the dealership. And if you'd prefer to purchase the traditional way in person, their nationwide dealer network is available to help as well. Learn more at Chevy.com slash electric. Well, we're very happy to bring on our next guest. If you're a sports fan here in the States, there's no doubt you have heard many of this guy's incredible calls over the years. He's the only announcer in North America who currently calls games for each of the four major leagues. You name it, he's done play-by-play -play for it. Of course, he's on TNT right now. In his new book, A Mic for All Seasons, my three decades announcing the NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB, and Olympics is coming out in October. You can pre-order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and other places where fine books are sold. It's great to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Kenny Albert. How are we doing, my friend? Kenny! Great to be with you guys. Uh, <laughs> just saw Biz last week in Atlanta. Uh, love the podcast. I've been listening for years, and it's an honor to be on with you guys. Oh, it's, a, it's you an honor much, to have Kenny. you. Thank you very much. I got to first meet you at the Winter Classic when Mini played, I think, was it St. Louis that year? Oh, was that was so Minus cold. 20 out. Yeah, it was cold. It was cold yeah. that weekend. Yeah, yeah. But that, that jersey, for anyone watching on YouTube, that's a sick old, is that an old All-Star Game jersey behind you? 
it is an all-star game jersey. I'm not even sure exactly where I got it. It's from the late 80s, early 90s. No number on the back, just the NHL logo on the front. And funny story. So during the pandemic, we didn't go meet with players and coaches in any of the sports. We did Zooms. And I was working a Buffalo Bills game. And Brian Dable, now the head coach of the Giants, was their offensive coordinator. And I had never met him prior to this Zoom call. And he's a huge hockey fan. He grew up in the Buffalo area. He was born in Welland, Ontario. And he turns on his computer, and the first thing he says, is that a Wales or a Campbell conference? <laughs> so he's old school. He knew. He knew. Oh, yeah, right away, man, right away. Uh, it's a good-looking jersey. Uh, I guess, uh, Kenny, was it a classic case of wanting to do what the old man did? Obviously, your dad, Marv Albert, one of the great uh, play-by-play guys of all time. Just, just I want to do what dad, dad did. Yeah, right from an early age. I was five or six years old, and my parents gave me a tape recorder for my birthday. And I was never pressured. I was never told, you have to do this. You have to announce games into the tape recorder. You have to go into sports casting. But I loved it right from the start. Uh, both my father and my two uncles, his brothers, Al and mm-hmm. Steve, were longtime play-by-play broadcasters, hockey, basketball, boxing, other sports as well. So, you know, they would come over for holidays and special occasions. and I was a little kid, and it, it was like I was listening to a podcast or the first <laughs> radio station. They would be telling stories about the games they did and the teams and the players and the coaches, and I would just try to soak it all in. And when I was old enough, I would start to bring the recorder to Madison Square Garden, Shea Stadium. I would sit in an open area uh, with not a lot of people around, and I would call games. And it's really all I ever wanted to do. I did some writing in high school and college, but always wanted to do play-by-play, and And a huge break when I was in high school on Long Island in 10th grade, a local cable station came to my school by total coincidence uh, to film a girls basketball game. And I was there to cover it for the school paper. I volunteered. They didn't have any announcers. They clipped a microphone on my shirt. I sat in the third row behind the team bench. The people around me probably thought I was nuts talking to myself. (laughs) And I spoke with the producer on the phone the next day and he offered me this opportunity, uh, you know, didn't get paid, but who cares? I was in high school. I just wanted the experience. So it was like an internship. And I would do games all over Long Island, uh, hockey, basketball, baseball, soccer, lacrosse, you name it, probably 75 to 100 games. And I would bring friends along as color commentators. And I felt like I had such a head start because back then you couldn't really do this until college. So I had two and a half years of these repetitions, actual games, um, you know, that were broadcasted on television, on delay, on local cable. And uh, it was just great. And I would also uh, tag along with my father. I would, I would do stats for him when I was old enough at hockey, basketball, football, and really learn via osmosis. Um, Just listening, watching the preparation, listening to the communication between the announcers and the production truck. And, you know, I get the question a lot. There are you know, thousands of people who go into the family profession, whether it's doctors, lawyers who have parents in the business. But when you grow up around it, um, it, it's the best teacher you can ask for. Did you come out of the womb with that voice, that deep (laughs) voice? Well, you might be surprised, Biz, about some of the stories in the book. It's a crazy story. I was actually born three months early, so I'm not sure what I sounded like back then. I was one pound, 15 ounces No and wow. in an incubator for two and a half months. So I don't think I had the voice right away. Oh, um, but, you know, it's funny. My kids refer to it as my, quote, fake announcer voice. Um, I'm not sure what I do differently when I'm on an interview or uh, once the microphone comes on. But I guess I sound a little different when talking in, in real life. So um, my daughter told me before I had to make a speech uh, for her, she said, you better not use that fake announcer voice. <laughs> <laughs> Just running your show. So oh, so you shit. got this recorder. So you would go to games and you would record on it. And would you go home and would you listen over to like to work, like work on your, your game, so to speak? Yeah, I would. And, and even before I started bringing it to games, I would use it in my bedroom. So I was eight years old at the time, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. And I set up my bedroom like a studio. You know, I had the desk and the bed in the middle and the TV. And I would call games off the television. And we kind of came full circle during the pandemic when we were all broadcasting a lot of games, not on site off monitors. So it brought me back to those days, but I would do it at home. I would bring it to games. Um, when I was in college, I went to college in New York at NYU, but I would go to Rangers and Islanders games and, um, 
which I had access because I had an internship at the NHL office. And then I started filling in on some Islander radio pregame shows. So I had access to sit in the press box and I would announce games into the tape recorder and you get better with each and every rep. Um, I would listen back and my real big break at that time, you know, after the, the Cox cable in high school, um, I was asked to fill in on, on four Islander games on radio. I was a senior in college in, in 1989. And I, my first game, first NHL game, was a radio broadcast, Islanders in Winnipeg. Now, most people at that age or at that time in their lives, you try to get the minor league job first, and then you use those tapes to get try and get to the next level. In my case, I actually had four NHL tapes and sent them all around. And I was so lucky to get hired by the Baltimore Skipjacks of the American Hockey League, the Capitals affiliate at the time. And two years in Baltimore, uh, the greatest. I wouldn't trade it in for anything. Um, not only doing the broadcast, but helping out in PR and marketing and sales. I was a terrible salesman, uh, but uh, but I did it in the summer. You had to do it all, right? Anything, do- anything they wanted you to do. Go pick a player up at the airport. Um, <laughs> you know, unload the equipment, right? We, we had a 10-hour bus ride to Portland, Maine. And uh, Rick Bonus was the head coach of the Maine Mariners. Yep. And no oh, we arrived... Man at the arena and there was Rick Boners, the opposing coach at eight o'clock in the morning, helping us unload the gear off the bus to bring it into the locker room for that night's game. But uh, two years in the AHL and, you know, I know you guys played at that level and um, so many memories, you know, guys that played in our team coached uh, my, my first year was ninety ninety one. So our assistant coach was Barry Trotz and I was his roommate on the road for two years to save money at the minor league level. The 22 year old radio broadcaster was assigned to room with the 26 year old assistant coach. So for two years, my roommate was Barry Trotz. The Capitals acquired a, a veteran defenseman named Joel Quenville. Uh, oh for my death God. On defense. They wound up sending him down to Baltimore. So for half the season, we had Barry Trotz and Joel Quenville on the same bus. 32 years later, they're the second and third winning as head coaches in NHL history. That is fucking insane. Uh, I just want to go back to one of the first things you said when you were doing it early days and like going around to these gymnasiums. You said you would bring your buddies around to do color commentary. Like like you must have some funny stories of bringing some of your buddies around. Yeah, Yeah, they they would come along. And then even even with the skipjacks, we didn't have, they didn't hire a, a color guy, a color commentator for radio. So I would use injured players. Um, friends would come along on occasion. You guys are probably familiar with Dave Starman, who does college hockey. He's one yeah. of the, he's one of the greatest voices in college hockey. He's been an NHL scout. He's a coach on Long Island. So I knew Dave from New York. We played uh, pickup hockey together uh, back in the late eighties at Sky Rink, the old rink on the 16th floor of a building near MSG. And he said to me, if you ever need a color analyst, he heard I got the job in Baltimore, I'll meet you wherever. So he would drive to New Haven, Springfield, Binghamton, just to get the experience. He would meet me on the road and do color with me. There was one game in Binghamton where the equipment wasn't working. We had this antiquated radio equipment. We had to set it up ourselves. Dave and I actually called the game, handing a phone back and forth to each other. <laughs> and it was, the first cell phone. it was an actual rotary phone. And we did the entire game. At one point, he handed it to me during play and said, here, it's for you. It looks like you should have a rotary <laughs> phone in that office with that that wood paneling. I oh, love yeah. that old school look. You know, I, I, I turned to my left earlier, right before we started. So I have the wood paneling. I have newspapers and VHS tapes. I'm an organized hoarder. But I save <laughs> all of my game sheets. And the next time I have a specific team, I'll look back and pull out some of the information. So I have a file cabinet with about 95% of my actual game sheets, uh, spotting boards in football, et cetera. And I happened to pull out. So this is from October 11th, 2006. Does that date mean anything to you, Wit? October 11th, 2006. October 11th, 2006. It wasn't his first game against the New York Rangers where he scored on Lundquist, was it? No, because I didn't make the team out of camp. This was was Henrik's second season, so I'm not sure if he scored on him the first year. But No, that was my rookie year, though. 06, 07. Yes, yes. Because I didn't make the team out of camp, and... Then I got called up, and my first game was against the Devils, but my first goal was against the Rangers. What do you MSG. got on him, Kenny? What do you got? You didn't score any of the year before? 
I don't think so. All right, so this game, because I specifically have on this sheet that two of your teammates, Jordan Stahl and Chris Letang, both scored their first NHL goals. Oh, so no, scored. that wasn't that was my second year then. I oh, know, I, I remember this, this game. Too. So Jordan Stahl and Letang scored their first NHL goals in the same game. I have no recollection of that, by the way. Good thing I saved this stuff. <laughs> and uh, Ryan Whitney, two goals in the third period on Hank. You gave the Penguins a 4-3 lead, assist from Crosby and Colby Armstrong. Then Nylander tied it for the Rangers. Then you score to make it 5-4 from Armstrong and our friend Dom Moore. Yep. Brandon Shanahan ties it four minutes later, and then Crosby wins it at 1956 of the wow. third period. A wild game. Holy but shit. I, re- I remember it well because my goals were on uh, ESPN Top 10, and I watched it over and over and over that <laughs> night. I didn't go to bed. <laughs> Just like, cranking oh, himself man. off. <laughs> I'm the man. I own MSG. Put one on your, your belly button. Career, I looked it up. Your first career two-goal game. Yep. And how about the other guys that scored in this game? I mentioned Stahl and Latang. Yager scored in the second period. Oh, my God. Shanahan scored in the third period. And then Sid scored the game winner. Jeez. I mean, what what a game. Uh, Crosby had a goal and three assists. Yager had a goal and two assists. 6-5, flurry and goal. But you probably can't see it, but right there in the third period, Whitney, two goals in my final count. two goals, Biz. Try that one out, buddy. Yeah, no, never had one of those. It last ain't time two I had a times two- opening the door for somebody getting off the ice. Yeah, two last pucks. time I... <laughs> Last time I had a two-goal game was, I think, a novice. And I, I think I might have had four in that one, and my dad came down through the through his hat on the ice when I got the hat trick. Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> and then asked but, you to go get it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the cool stories, too, is is in uh, on your sixth birthday in 1974, your father took you along to a New York Rangers game. And for whatever reason, one of the statisticians at the time had to leave the game midway through. So you took over as the stats guy? Right. So that was in Washington. And actually, uh, I know for years it, it was on the internet that it was 1974, sixth birthday. I got it right in the book. It was seventh birthday, 1975, because okay. that was the Capitals' first season. So they wouldn't have played in February 74. But uh, we did go to Washington, and it was my birthday present. My birthday is February 2nd. So he took me along to Washington. We did the, you know, walk by the White House, took pictures, you know, did some sightseeing. And then I I was going to the game uh, that night between the Rangers and Capitals, tagging along. He was doing the radio with Sal Messina. And I'll never forget it. The game was delayed like two hours. The Ice Capades, one of the ice shows, Disney on Ice had been in town the night before. So the ice was still colored, blue and red. They couldn't get it. They couldn't get the colors off. So they didn't face off until about 930. So whoever the statistician was that was working the game had a really early flight the next day. So he left. He left after the second period. So I took over as a seven-year-old Holy and shit. wrote down the goals and the assists. It wasn't really heavy lifting. I had to listen to the public address announcer, but I wrote down the goals, assists, the time of the goals. So I guess that was my first official uh, foray into the uh, world of professional broadcasting, um, actually working at, at some kind of a sporting event. What What is the, the most fun for you, game, like sport to broadcast? Because I, I think it's incredible, and I'm kind of curious. Is there one harder than the other? Like, but for you, what is your favorite? And then maybe what is the most difficult? I get that question a lot um, yeah. when I speak to broadcast. I'm a bad question asker. And No, it's a great question. Basic bitch. You know, I always, tell people, <laughs> I always tell people it's like asking which kid you like best if you have four. And I'm fortunate enough to have two kids and work in four sports. But... Growing up, loved all sports, um, you know, with my father broadcasting hockey, basketball, football, boxing. I got to uh, tag along to a lot of different sports. Um, but I always loved, I mean, hockey was probably a little bit above the others for sure. Um, skated from a young age, loved playing hockey growing up. We had a local rink, twin rinks in Port Washington on Long Island. And I, I would spend the entire weekend there. They would have public sessions in the afternoon on Saturday. Then they would have uh, intramural hockey. They would have puck shooting on a Friday night. We would shoot against goalies. So I spent so much time at the rink, probably from the age of eight until about 13 or 14, and then played on a club team in both high school and college. But again, really loved all sports. And my goal uh, throughout high school and college was to broadcast hockey on the radio. That was what I wanted to do. And again, my first jobs filling in on the Islanders. 
Baltimore Skipjacks. Uh, that was it. And then, uh, like I said, I, I worked a variety of sports during high school and then got hired by the Washington Capitals at Home Team Sports in 1992. So that was my first full-time NHL job for three years, was in D.C., and also was assigned to do many other sports, college basketball, filled in on some NBA and Major League Baseball games, um, really whatever they asked me to do, I would never say no. So I had that variety, the experience. And then, you know, an amazing stroke of luck for many of us in 1994, uh, the 94 season, but late in 93, Rupert Murdoch makes this crazy bid. Fox didn't even have a sports department at the time. Um, you know, they had the Simpsons and, and Married with Children and a couple of those shows you, you guys would remember. <laughs> <laughs> and Rupert Murdoch makes this crazy bid for the NFC package. CBS had had it for about 38 years. And Fox won the bid. Um, they decided to hire the, the best of the best, Pat Summerall and John Madden, as their top football broadcasters, uh, veterans Dick Stockton and Matt Millen, a terrific number two crew. And then the decision was, we're going to hire four young play-by-play announcers um, who all have a little bit of experience in the business. And we're going to try and grow with them. And the four of us who were hired at the time, aside from me, it was Joe Buck, who's gone on to an unbelievable Hall of Fame career. Uh, Kevin Harlan, who's had a great career now at CBS and Turner doing football and basketball. And Tom Brenneman, who was at Fox for 25 plus years doing football and baseball. And it's, it's hard to believe that this is year 30. I had the Jaguars Colts game to begin the NFL season on Sunday. And, uh, you know, that really changed all of our lives. The fact that Fox took a chance on four young broadcasters between the age of 25 and 32 and uh, hired us to do NFL games back then. So, you know, when I look back at, at 30 years of football, 33 years of hockey, I'm so fortunate. Um, you know, I've worked in Washington, Baltimore, MSG Network, Rangers Radio now for 28 years, uh, national hockey on, on NBC and now TNT. So hockey and football, it's like apples and oranges. I mean, they're both so great. You know, there's nothing like the hockey playoffs and, um, you know, love each and every hockey game that I get to work. And, you know, football, it's only one game a week. There, there are millions and millions of viewers. Um, the preparation for both I really enjoy. Football is a lot more uh, just because of the nature of the sport, how many players are on the teams, and you don't do the same teams every week. And then I also get to do about 15 basketball and 10 or 12 baseball games a year. So I enjoy all of them, you know, love going to many of the historic ballparks and stadiums, but, you know, hockey and football have been the staples, I guess, ever since I started, but hockey was the goal. That was the original yeah. goal. And just so lucky to call uh, two of the last three Stanley cup final series on TV and eight others on radio and uh, to be uh, hired with the unbelievable TNT crew. Uh, you know, with Eddie Olchek and Keith Jones the last two years and now Brian Boucher and the unbelievable studio team with Biz and the gang, uh, you know, couldn't be more excited to get started this season. Yeah, Kenny, looking at these stats, it's incredible. I mean, uh, 2014, you called all, all of the conference final games in, in both uh, both sides, both East and the West, New York, L.A., Montreal, Chicago. Do you just kind of go to like robotic mode just to like, you know, just to go from one place to the other? Because it's so much yeah, that just wears you down. That was a crazy time. And uh, you know, the way that all came together is, um, and I've done the Rangers radio, like I said, since 95, and I don't do all the games. Uh, the MSG executives are so great about allowing me to juggle the schedule when there's a Turner assignment or a Fox assignment, but I try to get to as many as possible. And that year, the Rangers advanced to the cup final. So after they uh, beat Pittsburgh in the, in the second round, it was on to play Montreal. Uh, the series in which Carey Price was injured in the first game, the collision with Chris Kreider, Rangers win the series in six. Hendrick was unbelievable. One of the best games I've ever seen him play in game six to advance to the final. But that was also the first year that I was asked by NBC to work uh, the other conference final. Doc Emmerich and Eddie and Pierre worked the one series, and I was asked to work the West, and it was the Kings-Blackhawks, the, the seven-game series. Alec Martinez scored the overtime winner in game seven in Chicago. So, you know, all of a sudden as the, as the second round is moving along and the Rangers are, they come back to beat Pittsburgh in that game seven, they were down three, one in the series. So now the schedules come out for the, for the conference final. I'm trying to figure out flights and piece it all together. And 
There were a couple of off days during that stretch. I think it was, I missed the first game in Montreal because of logistics. It was impossible having to be in Chicago the next afternoon, but worked the last 12 games of that, of that round, all of the games in the West and the last five games in the East. And there were red eyes, you know, LA to New York, morning flights back to LA, Montreal, Chicago, it all worked out. And, and somehow uh, the voice stayed strong. I think the adrenaline carried me through, but it was such an exciting time. And um, then the next year, the Rangers actually got to the conference final again and played Tampa. So there was a lot of back and forth between New York, Tampa, Anaheim, and Chicago in 2015. Jeez, wow. Uh, I'm shifting yet. gears, uh, my buddy. So he didn't want to tell me the story, but he said it's unbelievable. He didn't want to ruin it for me. He said there's a, a Mike Bloomberg story about requesting an interview after an ALCS game. And he goes, Biz, you're going to fucking lose it. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, that's in the book. So it's a two-part story. So Michael Bloomberg was the mayor of New York. And I was assigned to work the uh, post game. I was the sideline reporter. One of the rare times I wasn't doing play by play, I was hired to do the sideline and then the post game locker room celebration. Uh, it was the Yankees Red Sox 2003, the, the Aaron Boone game. I know some of you might not want to, uh, you know, reminisce about that one, but the Red Sox did beat them the next year. So Aaron Boone hits the home run. I'm down in the bowels of, of the old Yankee Stadium, uh, watching on about a 12 inch black and white monitor with some uh, police officers down on the locker room clubhouse level. Because as soon as the game ends, it's the 11th inning. I have to sprint to the winning locker room. So Boone hits the home run. I go to the left towards the Yankee clubhouse. I almost get trampled, you know, by some of the trainers and and other uh, uh, staff members who are running out to celebrate out on the field when, when the Yankees won the game. So now I do the interviews. We have Joe Torre up there and Mariano Rivera, some of the other Yankee folks. And it's like one in the morning because the game went 11 innings. It started at 8.30. Yankee Red Sox games always go four hours anyway, right back then. Oh, God, yeah. So we wrap it up. The producers in my ear are telling me to throw it back upstairs to Joe Buck and Tim McCarver. And I hear them then throw it to the late local news. They sign off. They're off the air. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Mayor Bloomberg off to the side of the podium waiting. You know, it's apparent that he probably wants to be interviewed next on national television. So... He had a, a PR person with him, a younger gentleman, who comes up and whispers in my ear, can you interview the mayor next? And I said, well, we're, we're off the air. They, they're in the local news already. And he says to me, can you fake it? So he didn't want to lose his job. <laughs> so the mayor comes up, and I said to the cameraman, I said, can you look into the camera, make sure it, you know, it appears like you're recording this? So Mayor Bloomberg comes up. And I have to make up questions, you know, for the next three or four minutes. And I knew he grew up in Boston and his mom was a Red Sox fan. And now he's been the mayor of New York. So I asked him five or six questions. I told him it was going to be taped. I didn't want him to think it was live at that point. But we did the interview. Fast forward six years later in the new Yankee Stadium. I'm in the same spot. Post-game interviews after the Yankees Angels. Yankees clinched game six ALCS. Now, it's a much bigger platform. We're in the new clubhouse. It was the first year of the new stadium, first or second year. And same thing. I'm doing the interviews. Joe Girardi's the manager. I have A-Rod and CC Sabathia and Jorge Posada. All of a sudden, the producer, Pete Machesca, who I just had dinner with last night, by the way, he's in my ear saying, and I could, so I'm turned to my right interviewing one of the players, and I could sense somebody has come up onto the podium, and he's, he's right over my left shoulder. And the producer, Pete, says to me, don't turn to your left. Don't ask the mayor a question. So now I'm aware that it's the mayor six years later. And he's telling me not to ask the mayor a question. Don't even turn to him. Now, this shot was on national television. The mayor's in the shot on TV at that point, on Fox. And it turns out that it was an election week or an election month. And if I had asked Mayor Bloomberg a question, his opponent could have requested equal time on Fox oh, on a national yeah. broadcast. Yeah. Fair so they were well aware in the truck about the FCC equal time rule. <laughs> uh, the mayor's people weren't happy about it. They threatened Fox the next day uh, that they were going to, they thought the mayor was embarrassed because he was seen on TV and I never turned to ask him a question. They threatened to take away the parking spots for Fox at Yankee stadium for the oh, television. For Fox. <laughs> but once, they, once it was explained, uh, the equal time rule, they backed off and they understood. But 
uh, those are a couple of the stories. This Bloomberg seems like a piece of work. Where is he at now? Uh, How does money? He could, probably, he could probably buy uh, the entire network if he wanted to. But um, <laughs> he just bought TNT. Couple, <laughs> You're done, of, Kenny. Yeah, those are a couple <laughs> of stories I saw in the book. Along with, I mentioned Barry Trotz earlier. So he was my roommate during the the years in Baltimore, and he still loves telling people this story thirty years later. Whenever I see him, if he's coaching. Uh, or now in the future in town as the general manager with Nashville. So I would interview either Trotsy or Rob Laird, our head coach, uh, prior to every game for the pregame show. And we had a game on the road somewhere, and I did a taped interview on a cassette machine with Barry. And he said something that came out funny. Whatever it was, the word didn't come out right. I, I didn't use it on the air. And what I did was on the bus ride home, uh, I played it for a couple of players. And they got a kick out of it. Whatever. I don't remember what Barry said, but it came out wrong. So he found out about it, of course, right? The hockey locker room bus culture. Uh, there are no secrets. So Trotsy heard I was kind of making fun of whatever he said. He said, I'll get you back one day. Don't worry about it. So about four months later, we take our only plane trip of the season. We're going up to the Maritimes in Canada uh, to play like six games in eight days. So we fly all day. We had three flights. We went Baltimore to Boston, Boston to Halifax, Halifax to Sydney. And it was a small plane, a regional jet. There might have been five other people on it aside from the team. And we had been told that because of all the hockey equipment, the bags, the sticks, that our personal luggage might not make it till the next day. It might have to come on flights uh, a day later. So we fly. It's about four in the afternoon. We land in Sydney, Nova Scotia, really small airport. We get off on the tarmac. And I go down the steps and there's a gentleman at the bottom of the steps, uh, an official, you know, in an official airport uniform. And he has a clipboard and he has some names on there and he points to it. He says, is this you? I said, yes. He says, come with me. I thought he wanted me to identify what the missing luggage was going to look like so they would know uh, whose it was the next day. They bring me into this small room and he starts interrogating me. Is your passport valid? Do you know anyone that's in trouble? Do you have anything illegal in your luggage? And I knew that I didn't, hadn't done anything, but I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then they bring me into an unmarked car. These two older gentlemen, um, there was computer equipment in the front of the car. So I knew it was an official car. It wasn't being kidnapped. And they start driving. And again, they're asking, uh, uh, do you know anyone that's been arrested? Are you sure your passport's valid? And, you know, I'm not really thinking that it's a practical joke. I have no clue what's going on. All of a sudden, they pull up to what looked like a hotel, and they said, we have one last question. Do you know Jimmy Wiseman, who was the longtime security chief for the Capitals? And we all knew him, and his brother was the police chief up in Sydney. They set this whole thing up. They would do it every year. They would get somebody, a trainer, a player, <laughs> uh, a rookie broadcaster. So the fake arrest set up by one Barry Trotz in Sydney, Nova Scotia, back in the early 90s, lives on to this day. You That's know what they say about payback, but uh, one other guy you worked with at that era was uh, Keith Jones, uh, absolute character. You must have some Jonesy stories because he's a beauty. <laughs> well, Jonesy, he joined the team. He joined the Skipjacks late in my second season calling the games. He had played at Western Michigan, and uh, the Capitals had a lot of draft picks either in college or junior that came in at the end. Steve Connor-Walchuk was another who had a long NHL career. And I remember Jonesy sitting behind me on the bus on a couple of those trips and we would chat and I called his first professional goal in 1992. He scored a goal for the Skipjacks, first goal as a pro. And I was calling it on the radio. I still have the scorecard just like yours, Whit, and I've, I've showed it to Jonesy. Um, but he, he's, you know, he's the absolute best. You guys have had him on. You've gotten to know him. Uh, so I would see him through the years during his playing career. And then he became a broadcaster with the Flyers. So I'd bump into him. And then we became colleagues at NBC. He was mostly in the studio, so we didn't really work a lot together, a couple of games here and there. But then the last two years with, with Eddie Olchek and Jonesy have been just so much fun, uh, you know, both in and out of the booth. Um, you know, two great hockey people, obviously. And, uh, you know, we're sad to lose Jonesy, but we're so happy for him and yeah. wish him all the best. And you won't find a better person uh, than Keith Jones. But I, I was there when he scored his first goal. Ironically, Eddie and I sort of go back even further. In, in 1984, <laughs> I was 16 years old, and I collected autographs at the time. And Eddie was 17, and he was on the U.S. Olympic team that was heading to Sarajevo. He was on the diaper line 
with Pat <laughs> LaFontaine and David Jensen. They were all 16, 17 years old. It was the first Olympics after the miracle, so they had high expectations. And for some reason, I decided to write one player on that team a letter. I don't even know where I sent it, I guess, to the headquarters in either Colorado Springs or, or somewhere in Minnesota. Somehow I had an address. We used to do that back in the day. We'd actually send letters with stamps on them. And in 1984, I decided to send a letter to one Eddie Olchek at the age of 17. And he sent me back an autographed team photo that hung on my wall uh, throughout the rest of my high school and college years. And sure enough, you know, I wound up meeting him when I started broadcasting and now we're partners. So uh, 39 years ago, amazingly, uh, and Eddie had a great uh, uh, line and he, he was nice enough to write a blurb, Eddie and Jonesy both for my book. And Eddie started off by saying, have you ever met anyone through the U.S. Postal Service? Well, that's how we met 39 <laughs> years ago when our broadcast partners on TNT. So, oh, that's hockey that's world, amazing. The hockey world's a small world. It's amazing. So he was he was incredible back then, obviously, Edzo. I think he was probably, what, the second best player behind Mario at that age. And uh, he yeah. was telling me a story when we were um, at TNT that Laval came to visit his parents' house and they had 50 grand cash at that time, and they offered him 50K to go to Laval to play with Mario Lemieux. Wow. So there was a chance that he – and then you know his parents ended up making the decision where they're like, no, no, we're going to do what's best for our son, and he didn't end up going. But could you have imagined that him and him and Mario would have been playing together? Crazy. He, and, he, and he wound up coaching Mario, ironically, later on. But Eddie was the third overall pick that year. It was Mario Lemieux, Kirk Muller. Eddie Olchek. So he was selected third by his hometown Blackhawks, the team he grew up watching. And that year in Chicago, the Blackhawks and the Bulls both had the third pick in the draft. The Blackhawks selected Eddie Olchek. The Bulls selected with the third no pick shit. Michael Jordan. That is that is wild. That's good. and as Eddie Full as circle, Eddie man. likes to say, one of them has a statue outside the United Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you, was it Fox who introduced it, the, the introduced the the puck that glue up the glowed yeah, on the ice tracks. or whatever? Fox like, tracks. what were you guys thinking about that when you were when you were calling games? Like, obviously, you guys wouldn't see it, but you would look over to the TV and see you'd see it. Right, that was David Hill, who's a brilliant man. He's from Australia, and he was uh, put in place by Rupert Murdoch to run Fox Sports along with Ed Gorin in uh, 1993, 94, and Fox acquired the rights to the NHL in '95. And we had it for five seasons, Doc Emmerich and John Davidson with a lead broadcast team and uh, Sam Rosen, Joe Micheletti. Uh, I worked with a number of analysts, uh, Craig Simpson, Dennis Potvin, uh, the late Peter McNabb. So it was a terrific time uh, broadcasting NHL games on Fox. Fox's motto for both football and hockey at the time was same game, new attitude. And they like to try new things. It was David Hill, who I just mentioned. He was the first on Fox football. Now, whatever game you watch in any sport, you have the score up on the screen, right? The score, the time, up in the left-hand corner normally. That wasn't the case before that. Fox football in 1994, thanks to David Hill, was the first time. It's called the Fox Box because he invented it. And you watch old games from prior to that, and the score would pop up on a graphic every so often. But it wasn't up there continuously. And there were still some other networks then that wouldn't do it for a couple of years because they felt – like during a basketball game, for example, if a fan happens to tune in and it's a blowout, if it's 60 to 40, that the viewers would turn the channel. So they didn't want people to know the score right away. They wanted viewers to stick with the game. <laughs> That's a little whack. And it was David Hill who brought over the glowing puck. Um, he had been a longtime TV executive in Australia and England, and they had tried it out there. And he also saw it on some of his kids' video games some uh, you know early version sports video games back in the 80s and 90s where they would use all kinds of graphics and technology. So it was ahead of its time. I know a lot of people north of the border didn't like it because yeah. they felt you know, it, it yeah. broke from tradition. But now you watch a golf match, you basically see the yep. glowing puck. The tracing, you watch yeah. baseball, you see the glowing puck. So yep. David Hill was ahead yeah. of his time by a generation – my feeling back then was if it helps the viewers who aren't used to watching a puck go around the rink, then why not, right? Yeah. But now you see it in so many sports. Yeah, it's funny. When you watch old games, just, just the, the scoreboards, and like you you would have to wait till halftime of the NFL game right. just to find out right. the other scores around the world. Now now you get them instantaneously. Now we're uh, bitching about digital boards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What's back next, then, Kenny? Clean boards, white boards, nothing on the ice. The players looked a lot slower, right? 
Yeah. Uh, Ken, was there, was there uh, any piece of advice your dad gave you about the business that really like was a great piece that like you kind of, I guess, guided you through your career? You know, there really wasn't one specific piece of advice that he gave me. You know, he, he, he it wasn't like he would sit me down and hold lessons. It was mostly learning via osmosis by watching and listening. The biggest thing I learned from him, though, was the preparation. Mm-hmm. I would see it at home. I would see it when I would travel with him in hotels and on airplanes. He was always doing something, reading, uh, writing notes, preparing the charts. And that that's the biggest thing that I learned. And and I'm an over-preparer. Um, you know, I'm the same way that he was. I feel like that's the, one of the most important aspects of this job. Um, you know, a typical football game, it's probably 20, 30, 40 hours a week of preparation. Now, that includes um, going to practices and talking to players and coaches and having the production meetings. But Monday to Thursday, we're on our own, you know, watching each team's previous game, preparing charts, reading, going through statistics, hockey and, and basketball. You know, it's not the volume of hours because in football, there's over 50 players on each team. It's different teams every week with hockey. You know, we become so familiar with the teams. They play three or four games a week. We're watching, uh, we're working other games. So we are preparing, but it's not the volume of hours that goes into it. Uh, similar to a football broadcast. Did he say, don't even think of going in my catchphrase? I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. That was his big goal you know, for the year. People ask me <laughs> once in a while to do it for them, but that, that's his yeah. thing. You yeah. know, people go up to him, you know, uh, on airplanes, in men's rooms, at airports, you know, and they'll ask, he'll ask them to do it if they, uh, if they bring <laughs> it up to him and he'll, he'll grade them on it. I think he would have given you an A on that one. Oh, well, thank that you. That's pretty good, good RA. Thanks. Appreciate but, it. You know, I never really, you know, tried to steal any catchphrase. Um, you know, back in the day, there were some t shirts made up with team logos and yes. So I would wear the t shirts, but, Never would try to mimic the catchphrase. Kenny, any any um any legendary like maybe fuck ups by you on air or anything or or, or so, maybe something that sticks out like oh boy. Yeah, I hope not. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you hate to make mistakes, but it happens. It, it's a live sporting event. Yeah, and you might mention a wrong name or fact or statistic, but I think you have to you know be human about it and correct it. People realize that you're not perfect. There are some funny stories. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier calling a game through the phone. Um, on one occasion, I remember a, a hockey game in L.A. I felt the hiccups coming on. Oh, and no. you never know, right? You never know when, it, when it's going to come out. So, uh, you know, we all have the cough button. They call it the cough button in front of us to knock the microphone off. So, uh, you know, I would try to reach for the, the cough button. So the hiccups hopefully wouldn't go out on the air. Um, one of my claims to fame might be that I worked a 20 inning baseball game and never went to the bathroom, never left oh, the no. booth oh, to go no. to the men's room. Were you, you holding that the whole time? The whole time, six hours and 45 minutes. I could have gone between innings. Now in hockey and basketball and football, you have the intermission, the halftime between periods. So you can go in baseball. You only have two minutes if you're the play by play guy. So you don't have a lot of time. Um, never felt like I had to go and you don't expect the game to go to that, you know, to go that long. We had the four overtime game this year, uh, Carolina, Florida. You know, I know, Biz, you guys are in the studio. Well, yeah, like I was going to say, so baseball must be tough because there's just so much dead air. Right. So you, you actually asked me that earlier about the most difficult sport, the easiest sport, and I got sidetracked along the way. But um, people always ask me, and they think hockey would be the hardest to do play-by-play. Easy. To me, it's the easiest. It's like riding a bike. I've done it Because it's so fast, too. So fast. Done it for 33 years. So on radio... And I love, I'm, I'm so you know fortunate that I still get to do some radio because it brings me back to the early days. That's where you learn the fundament, fundamentals. You're calling the game. You have to be so descriptive. You know, Biz, I know you did it in, in you know, with the Coyotes for a while. I but loved it. The play yeah. announcer has to be so descriptive. You have to give the time and score a lot more than on the TV side. Um, on the television broadcast, you know, you can talk a little bit less, leave more time for the color analysts to come in. So to me, hockey is the easiest. People think I'm crazy because of all the uh, changes on the fly, the pronunciations, the European players. But <laughs> you you just you know you pick it up pretty quick. Basketball is similar to hockey, but it's slower. It's 48 minutes of continuous action, but more stoppages with whistles and fouls. Football to me is the most rhythmic. It's one play, and then it's 20 or 25 seconds. It's another play, 20 or 25 seconds. Now for 10 years. I worked with Moose Johnston and Tony Saragusa, uh, the late Tony Saragusa, who was the absolute best 
one of the most fun guys to be around. Biz, you would have loved him. You just would have loved him. Uh, live life to its fullest. Would always want to be when we had free time, you know, out doing some crazy activity. Um, but he was he was our third uh, member of the crew, but he wasn't in the booth with us. He was down on the field, similar to Jonesy, Bush, Pierre Maguire, when that second analyst is down at ice level between the benches. And you don't have that uh, verbal communication with them where you could turn to your right and see them and give each other some hand signals. So it's a challenge and really learned a lot during those years about leaving more time for the analyst or for Goose to come in from the field. But football, you know, I, I set up the play, I call the play, I wrap up the play, and then I get out of the way to let the analyst come in. Baseball to me is the most challenging because you have all that downtime. And I don't do that many games. Not as much downtime this year with the pitch clock. So that's helped out a little bit. Um, I've called other sports, boxing, which is a lot different. There's no ball or puck. Um, I've been assigned to call some track Fuck, and field. There's, no, there's nothing you'll say no to. You'll do it all. You know what? I learned that early on that uh, don't say no. The more versatile you are, uh, the more people that might want you to call an event. Now, the one sport that I felt like I had no clue what I was watching. I was about 26, 27 years old, working in D.C., and I was assigned to a college wrestling match. And I <laughs> did all the homework, and I watched some other events, and I actually spoke to an Olympic wrestler. If you guys remember Jeff Blatnick, I was oh, connected yeah. with him, spoke yeah. on the phone for a half hour. So we start. Luckily, I had a great color analyst with me who had been a wrestler. I was the traffic cop. I would give the names, their record that season, where they're from, what year in school. And then when, when the match started, I had no clue. So this guy took over, and he was great. They're grappling down there. You're like, and he's got his yeah. ball. Uh, yeah. His groin, I mean. <laughs> I had no idea. Now, for some of the other sports, I've actually purchased track and field for dummies, volleyball for dummies, <laughs> horse racing for dummies to start the preparation. When I, when I was assigned to volleyball at the Olympics a couple of years ago, I um, actually sat down with our local high school girls volleyball coach, and I said to her, teach me everything, the strategy, the rules, the history. And it was a tremendous, tremendous help, a great lesson in, in learning a new sport. Kenny, I was, I was going to get a pickleball court put in my backyard and I was going to throw like an annual pickleball tournament. Would you by chance maybe want to call it one year? I played two times this summer. So okay. I've not played three times in my life. Uh, but if you have a pickleball tournament, I would love I don't know what it. your day rate is. I don't know if I can afford it, but just maybe, you know, send me a, send me an invoice. I'll I'm, see if I'm we there. can cover I'm, it from I'm, the Barstool Sports. Um, <laughs> uh, just send me pickleball for dummies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Um, what type of advice would you have for any like, young broadcasters coming up? And there's some, so there's some unbelievable young guys in the pipeline, but just advice that you would give if anybody wants to do it. Oh, there are some great young broadcasters who are working in the NHL around the minor leagues. And um, I hear from a lot of them throughout the year and listen to some of their work. And, you know, the biggest advice, uh, you know, there's a couple of different points. Get as much experience as you can, whether it's in high school, college. You know, these days, when I was in college, we had the radio station at my school and that was it. And we had a fight for airtime with the DJs, with the music shows. Now, if you're at a college, you can broadcast games over the Internet. Um, I did a Q and a at Seton hall university in New Jersey yesterday and went over to visit the radio station. And they were telling me about all the different sports they do on the radio station, on the internet, uh, volleyball, soccer, lacrosse, basketball, baseball. So there, there are just so many ways to get involved and also behind the scenes jobs as well. Um, you know, on a typical NFL game that I work, there's probably 75 people involved in that broadcast, the NHL games biz that we do on TNT. Uh, not only do you have the announcers, but you have the producer, the director, the cameramen and women, the graphics folks, the replay producers. I can go on and on. Um, on a personal note, my daughter, who studied communications in college at Syracuse, had a great internship with the athletic department. Um, she would be involved in editing highlights at sporting events at Syracuse that they would then uh, put out there on, on the school's Instagram and, and Twitter, on social media. And she's now working at the NHL office in New York as a video editor slash producer. So it's not only for the broadcasters. There are there are so many jobs out there in sports at various networks behind the scenes as well. But the biggest advice would be just do as much as you can. Internships, college radio stations, college newspapers, uh, podcasting, you know, whatever it might be in front of the camera, in front of the mic, behind the scenes. Just do as much as you can. 
And then I was going to follow up with like, as far as like iconic games that you've called, what do you think would be your, your, your pinnacle, your number, your number one, where not only just a great game, but maybe it was a championship, like the call itself. There are a couple that you guys might not, uh, you know, they might not be the ones that come to the top of your head at first, but I assume you're a Blue Jays fan, Biz? Yeah. Yeah, Joe Carter. Joe Carter. Oh, well, more recently, I had the Bautista call, the home run, bat flip. Uh No way. I was there for that one. And ironically, I do less baseball than the other sports. That's the one that I get asked about the most when I speak to a lot of these broadcasting camps, college students. People ask me all the time about that Bautista game back in 2015. Um, Hockey, I mean, two men in a name. You know, the last two, uh, two of the last three Stanley Cup finals uh, with NBC, uh, Tampa Bay, Montreal. Um, And then this year, of course, with Vegas and Florida, you know, getting to call the Stanley Cup on national TV in the U.S. is, you know, just such a huge thrill and and career highlight. Um, Was actually on the call for NHL radio in 94, the Rangers Canucks, when the Rangers won for the first time in 54 years. And then I've worked six Winter Olympics for NBC, men's and women's ice hockey. And the one that stands out is the women's gold medal game in 2018. I was in Pyeongchang, South Korea, uh, with A.J. Malesko and Pierre Maguire, and we called the gold medal game. Canada had won the previous four Olympics, and the U.S. won this one in a shootout, uh, defeated Canada to win the gold. So that's right up there. Uh, Football, I've had a number of memorable games. Uh, once worked a Sugar Bowl game with Terry Bradshaw and Howie Long as my analyst. That's Notre amazing. Dame LSU. There was a New Orleans San Francisco playoff game in 2012. Uh, four touchdowns the last four minutes. Drew Brees and Alex Smith going back and forth up and down the field. But then I have certain moments, uh, not not necessarily full games, but I had. If you guys remember Terrell Owens stomping on the Cowboys star. Oh yeah, you did that game. Yeah. Oh, no shit, man. Eh? Game. That's awesome. I did Michael Vick early in his career. He had an iconic 46 yard overtime touchdown run in Minnesota, zigzagging his way up oh the field. God, and ran yeah. out the tunnel. I had the Victor Cruz 99 yard touchdown from Eli Manning for the Giants against the Jets on their way to the Super Bowl. Um, actually called the Super Bowl. It was the international feed, the world feed. So it wasn't on in the U.S. And again, if if uh, I have a feeling uh, some of you might be Patriots fans, but it was the Giants Patriots Super Bowl Forty Six. But I'd had the opportunity to call a Super Bowl uh, for, for other countries, not the U.S. Um, you know, in hockey, just so many memorable games, playoff games, overtime. You know, Game Sevens, that four overtime game this year, have done a number of triple overtime games. So uh, again, too many to name, but but the Bautista game. Um, the, the cup final games, uh, some of the other ones that I mentioned, the U S Olympic women winning the gold in in 2018, actually last year. And again, I keep, I'm not even doing this on purpose, guys. I've already brought up the Red Sox Yankees. I brought up, uh, you know, a couple of other Boston events, but I actually worked last year, the, the crazy ending, the Patriots in Las Vegas with the laterals and the Chandler Jones interception right at the end of the game. One of the, wildest endings in NFL history. So I had that. I don't one. know what I don't know what game that is. You guys know what it is? Oh yeah. It was it, it was almost like the the Stanford band game kind of like just right. like the crazy. I, I, the end of I it. actually mentioned the Stanford band during oh, the call. Yeah. <laughs> it was a tie game, Biz. It was tied with about 10 seconds left, about to go to overtime. And the Patriots on on the last play start laddering lateraling the ball. One of the players, I think, thought they were losing, forgot that it was tied. And the last lateral wound up getting intercepted by Chandler Jones of the Raiders, and he brought it back for a touchdown. Oh no! It was, was a Monday. Check the was, coach. Was it a night game or was it a four well, o'clock? Uh, uh, four o'clock yeah. Eastern game. Belichick yeah. was the coach. Was he losing his mind? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It was, it was last year, right? It was last year. Oh, yeah. that was la- oh shit. Okay, I didn't yeah. know it was Regular that season that, uh, game. Yeah. Okay. And then speaking of speaking of Vegas biz, uh, we had a great night with the entire TNT crew going to the David Blaine show. Biz was called oh yeah, up. so so how do how do you know? Or your daughter works for him? My sister. Our my sister, 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 works, sister. Yeah, yeah. My sister works for David Blaine, the magician, illusionist. So wow. we took the whole crew: Hank and Liam and Anson. Uh, how about Eddie, Pete Davidson was there, and Eddie he was he was, he was up on stage. Pete Davidson was there just with his buddies, like do at a bachelor party, yeah, yeah, and he got called up by David Blaine. He was hilarious. He was for five minutes. He was making everybody laugh. How about when our group went down and we got to see the tricks, you know, the card tricks from close range in person? Oh, amazing, yeah. This guy it? is nuts. 
It's crazy. Like, you just like, how do they do it? You just want like, how do they pull this stuff well, off? Like, two feet in front of you. This was two. This was three inches away from him. It's crazy. But he's also doing like mind over matter stuff, where he's putting his body through things that like right, most right. people just can't. And like, I don't think that that's not necessarily magic. It's just he just somehow tricks his mind to not. It's an illusion. Not, like, there's no pain there. Ten Whatever. minutes in a water, ten minutes in a water tank, not not breathing. That was yeah, he did. Yeah. He did ten straight minutes in the water tank by just getting this these deep breaths beforehand. All right, you were laughing your ass off there like a couple seconds ago. What was so funny? The the David Blaine stuff? Oh no, just well, yeah, just it's crazy. I've I've hung out with a magician late night on the Cape one time, and I'll never forget. He put a, a penny in my hand. He said, "Close your hand." And he and he tapped my wrist, and I opened it up, and it was a diamond there. And it was like right. like like how how do people do this shit? It, yeah, we saw similar things with cards, right? With with yeah. you and Henrik. He he would flip cards, you know. Yeah, it just cards. doesn't make any sense how how quick they are with their hands, and I, I couldn't even imagine how many reps it takes to master all that. But uh, yeah, hands like hands like witty on the PP. Well, the crazy thing is sometimes too, like if they, I mean, I guess they don't they don't give away their tricks, but I've had a buddy show me like it's pretty simple once you see how they do it, but it just looks so ridiculous. It's 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 unbelievable. I didn't know that about. Uh, are you play. just? Are you just sports, sports, sports? Like, what do you do as a hobby? Like, what do you do in your spare time? That's a good question. I enjoyed the summer when I had a lot of free time. Um, worked a couple of baseball games here and there, but um, actually snuck away on vacation during the All Star break with my wife last year for the, I think, the first time ever. We went down <laughs> to Cancun. I had four or five days. Cancun. Um, in the summer, uh, I like the first tennis. time she heard your real voice. You're like, you're like, what do you want to talk about, <laughs> honey? That might have been. Uh, <laughs> but enjoy playing tennis. Did play pickleball a couple of times this year. Uh, you know, watching TV, movies. But when when things get going, it's it's uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, you know. I always tell people from October through you know May, it's absolutely crazy. October, November, December, the football, hockey crossover, some basketball as well. So. It's mostly work, but, uh, and my wife likes to tell people this too, you know, there's so much work and travel involved, but I've never, I never feel like I'm working. I've never felt like I've worked a day in my life, which is, which is a great feeling. Um, you know, sometimes the early morning travel, you know, might get a little old, but, um, no, I mean, we, uh, you know, we did a lot of family stuff over the summer, went to a couple of weddings, went to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, one of my former partners, Ron, uh, Ronde Barber, was inducted, which was a great weekend. Um, you know, with two kids, they're 24 and 20, and I grew up around it with my father and his crazy schedule, so I was totally used to it. Uh, when my kids were young, I was barely here on weekends, um, probably away 48 out of 52 weekends a year, um, but they got used to it. My wife's been so great about the schedule for, we've been married now 27 years, although we joke, I've only been present for about 14 of the 27 I don't know for the other, for the other that's half. why you're still married exactly exactly but, <laughs> no, they've all been great about it and I would try when my kids were young during the week I was around more often than most parents would be who go to an office somewhere I might have games at night occasional travel but I would try to drive to school you know pick up go to various activities during the week when my older daughter was two we signed up for this sports class where she would roll roll around the mat and kick a soccer ball and Etc. And I think it was myself and 14 moms who probably <laughs> wondered why does this guy not work? How is he able to bring his kid to this class every Monday at one o'clock? Watching the soap uh, operas we, with him. We had uh <laughs> we had Joe Buck on once and he had us dying laughing, talking about how every fan base says he hates their team, right? And it's kind of a deal a thing I think that you guys, you play play by play guys deal with. Have have you ca caught heat from from fan bases always complaining that you're rooting against us? Oh, absolutely. With yeah. social media, uh, you know, you can't hide from it. And all sports fans think that the announcers hate their team when it's a national game. Fans are so provincial, and I get it because I do the Rangers and I do a bunch of Knicks games, so I work on the local side as well. Uh, you know, Biz, you know from the Coyotes days. But fans love their local announcers, and they should. Um, you know, those are the voices they're hearing on most of the games. So when the national guys come in, uh, for a Wednesday TNT game, for example, that that's not on, you know, whether it's MSG or Nesson or any of the, you know, the local regionals, um, we're 50, 50, we're calling the game right down the middle. They're used to hearing 70, 30 or 80, 20. Um, you know, in football, it's different because there are no, 
uh, team announcers on television, on radio, yes, but every football game's on one of the national networks. But they still think we're rooting against their team. So I'll hear from fans in various cities. Um, you know, I'll, I'll 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 even convince people when they ask me about it. You know, Troy Aikman's not rooting against the Giants if they're playing the Cowboys. I know for a fact I've worked with them. He's calling the game right down the middle, 50-50. Um, you know, the one time I do have to kind of remind myself is when I am doing a Rangers game on TNT or NBC back in the day, I do have to remind myself to get just as excited when the other team scores because I am affiliated with the Rangers. So it is a conscious conversation that I have with myself. Um, but no, I get it. Again, fans love their local announcers. And I think when it really comes to play in hockey, basketball, and baseball uh, is after that first round of the playoffs. In hockey and basketball, the local announcers still do the first round on yeah. TV. And and that's one of the beauties of radio. The radio announcers go all the way through to the cup final. But um, no, it's it's pretty funny to look at some of the comments. We don't take too much, uh, too many of them seriously. You know, we also get blamed as broadcasters. Uh, the jinxes. For, shut, for shutouts, oh, ending, yeah. for no hitters. No if you hitters, mentioned yeah. there are no hitters. Oh, I would there. just be stirring has, the pot. He has a Mr. Field going 700 years. Oh, looks like he's going to get a shutout here. <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> left, not really facing much traffic. I wish, I wish that I had the power from hundreds of feet away to affect what goes on on the ice, but I really don't. Uh, you mentioned Troy Aikman. He must be a blast. I've been so lucky to work with over 200 analysts in the various sports, and I worked three or four games with Troy. Uh, the consummate professional, great guy, three-time Super Bowl champion. You know, when I worked with his teammate, Moose Johnston, for 10 years, who was the fullback on those great Dallas teams, Moose and Tony Saragusa, just the amount of respect they would get when they would walk into a team locker room or a meeting with a coach. Uh, they were both Super Bowl champions. Uh, great players, pro bowlers. Um, I worked three years with Rondé Barber, who's now in the Hall of Fame. Now I'm working with Jonathan Vilma, who was a terrific player, Super Bowl champion with the Saints. Um, I've worked games through the years with uh, Joe Namath and Terrell Davis and Dan Fouts. And uh, I mentioned Howie Long and Terry Bradshaw, so many other Hall of Famers. And it's just great to soak in the knowledge from them and listen to, to their conversations with with some of the players and coaches, you know, we would meet with uh, Brett Favre, for example, before a football game, we have meetings with players and coaches prior to every game. And he would sit there for 45 minutes and he was the most regular guy. And he'd be telling stories about fishing and hunting and his family and, um, you know, meetings with Peyton Manning and Eli Manning and Aaron Rodgers. Last year, we had a Buccaneers game in Cleveland. Tom Brady sat with us for half an hour. No and shit. Sometimes when it's a home game, you know, they have places to be after practice. They have family stuff. But when they're on the road and they're just in a hotel, they're a little more relaxed. And, and Brady sat with us for a half hour that day in Cleveland. Uh, Peyton Manning uh, has it's a funny. photographic memory. And he's one of those guys that meets you one time, remembers your name five years later. And funny story. So I'm in, I'm in Denver with Eddie uh, Olchek this, uh, this past playoff. We had game seven of the Kraken Avalanche. And Seattle wound up winning the game. So... It's about 20 minutes before the game, and I've met Peyton five or six times. We've had production meetings with him. Don't know him well, but I, I've sat with him in these meetings on occasion. And uh, I walk out of the booth to go get a soda right behind uh, in the back part of the press box. And all of a sudden, there's Peyton Manning. He was walking back through the press box to get to the owner's suite. He was sitting up there for the game. And I, I stuck out my hand to, to shake his hand. And before I had a chance to say anything, he said, hi, Kenny, Peyton Manning. He actually introduced himself to me. Like, I don't know who he is, but Come on. That, that, that's one of the great things about him is he's just so down to earth and actually introduced himself when I ran into him at that avalanche game. When, when you're sitting with Tom Brady, are, were you guys just talking normal stuff? Are you guys asking him football questions about these crazy games that he's been through and experiences? Cause like, I mean, that's a, that's a modern day legend right there. Yeah, it was, it was mostly football, you know, about the game the next day and, uh, but it's funny, you know, you kind of you scope out the situation, see what kind of mood they're in. Um, you know, I, I'll get to a Belichick story in a minute, but, you know, if they seem like they're rushed and, and want to kind of wrap it up, you know, you don't go certain places. You but, don't go full court yeah, press like on you them, can tell, right? He was loose. Plus, he, is, he was already signed with Fox. He's supposed to start doing games next year. So our crew joked to them about, you know, being a colleague in the future, you know, not necessarily with us, but with, with Fox. Uh, with one of the other crews, most likely. But uh, 
Um, I you think, he, you think he's going to follow through with that? Like he's going to be calling games next year? Isn't it like a hundred million or two hundred million or something? Too. To say, um, I think it's thirty-seven million a year, from what I read. So oh if my you were god! Him, you, you <laughs> Jesus down? Christ! So anyway, I'm um, schlepping it up for for <laughs> across country every week for fucking. Biz is looking for like free Chipotle. Yeah, yeah. Just come on, pour over. I can't even win a fucking ball ho- my own ball hockey tournament. <laughs> You might bump into him on a flight. Who knows? But anyway, I, I had done my research that week, and and I read somewhere that uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but I read that this was his, I think, seventh career game against Cleveland, and he had faced six different starting quarterbacks <laughs> in the games against the Cleveland Browns. So the situation presented itself, and I said to him, "All right, I got some trivia for you. Uh, you've played the Browns six times. Who were the who were the six starting quarterbacks?" And he actually got four or five of them off the top of his head. It was pretty impressive. No shit. Pretty that is impressive. impressive. That is impressive. So that, what that was, was the Belichick was, story? Oh, yeah. So, so with Belichick, I've probably done seven or eight Patriots games through the years. They're primarily on CBS, on Fox once yeah. in a while. So you just know going into the meeting, he's not going to give you much about his current team, about X's and O's and strategy. So, so you, you know not to ask those questions. So. My analyst last year, Jonathan Vilma, had a good relationship with him because uh, before he was drafted in 2004, he met with Belichick at the Combine, and uh, they took a liking to each other, even though he never played for him. So Jonathan loosened him up a little bit with a couple of questions about the game. But I have been around him a couple of times where if you ask him a historical question about his time with the Giants, with Lawrence Taylor, or his time at the Naval Academy when his dad was a coach there and he was a ball boy uh, tagging along, if you ask him the historical question, he'll give you a great story and sit there for a half hour. So they were playing the Lions, and the Patriots wound up winning the game last year, 29 nothing. Bailey Zappi was the quarterback that afternoon for New England. So I said to Bill, I said, um, you're playing the Lions this weekend, and I know that your first full-time coaching job in the NFL, he had been an intern with the Baltimore Colts the year before. I said, I know in 1975, uh, you were an assistant special teams coach with the Lions. What do you remember? What are, what are the highlights from that year? Figuring maybe he'd give us a good story that we can use on the game. And sure enough, he went into this entire story about all of his memories coaching on the offensive side of the ball. He was the assistant special teams and helped out with the tight ends. So he wasn't always a defensive coach. And he talked to us for about 20 minutes about how much he learned about defense that year by coaching the offense and learning from the defensive coaches. And then he told a story, which was, I had never heard this before. It was incredible. He said, we were the first team to ever use two tight ends on the field at the same time with Detroit in 1975. They drew up this formation. He was one of the coaches. And he said to this day, over 40, 45 years later, they refer to that formation as the name of that formation is Detroit because he was with the Lions that year. And for how many years have we seen, you know, whether it was Gronkowski, Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez and then Gronkowski and other tight ends later on. We've seen the two tight ends on the field have great success for New England, but it all came, it all started with that Lions team in 1975. So if you go in well-prepared with three or four questions, not about the current Patriots, but about some of the historical stuff, he'll give you great answers. Doesn't he, he's a big, he, he loves like reading like old war books too, doesn't he? He's like he big, on, he's big on the history of the United States. He is, and he's a hockey fan. Um, so Dave Maloney is my partner on Rangers Radio. Biz, I know you know his brother, Don. Yeah, very well. awesome GM. Team. Smart guy. Great, he, yeah, great he, could a, he could squeeze a nickel so tight the beaver will shit. Well, and, <laughs> Especially and he's working for the Coyotes. I got to through the years with the Coyotes right now with Calgary, but great family. I've known them forever. Worked with Dave now for 19 years. So uh, I was once going to do a Patriots game years ago, and Dave told me, he said, I doubt – Bill Belichick remembers this, but when he was an assistant coach with the Giants, he came to skate with us, with the Rangers. Dave was the captain of the Rangers, and they practiced at Rye Playland in Westchester. And he said, Bill came with us to skate, and then he came to the bar with us after practice. So sure enough, again, I I kind of scoped out the situation. We were done with, with Belichick. This is 10 or 12 years ago. And as he's walking out of the room, I said, by the way, coach, I don't know if you remember Dave Maloney former captain of the Rangers back in the day, he says hello, he sends regards. And 
Bill's face lit up. He said, Oh, tell Dave, I said, hello. I had a great day skating with, with the Rangers, you know, back 30 years ago. So he, he remembered. He, he has if a you could memory. get him to crack a smile, <laughs> you should yeah. have the Nobel yeah. peace prize. When, when I mentioned that he then said to me, uh, he mentioned Chris Kreider who grew up in the same hometown, I guess that, that Bill lived in at one point. So he said to me, Oh, speaking of the Rangers, how's Chris Kreider doing? So he's still following his hockey. That's um, awesome. Grinelli oh, sent wow. over us uh, some cool notes on your career and stuff, just leading into this interview. And, and one of the things mentioned a, a cool Mark Messier leadership story. So this was back in the late nineties when Mark was, uh, with the Rangers and it was one of my uh, first couple of years with the team. And it was late December. The team was on a road trip to Western Canada. And we were in Vancouver. We had an off day. And then there was a game in Edmonton the next night. Now, back then, the Rangers had so many former Edmonton Oilers on the team. They had Messier, Kevin Lowe, Craig McTavish, uh, Charlie Huddy, Adam Graves, Jeff Bukaboom. I'm not sure if they were all there on this particular day, but there were five or six guys on this Ranger team who had family or friends in Edmonton. So the team was scheduled to fly in the afternoon. And then all the former Oilers had plans to meet up with, with friends and family that night. So we get on the charter in Vancouver, the team plane and the pilot gets on and he says, there's a bit of a mechanical issue. They're going to get another part, but it's going to take four hours. So we just have to sit and wait. So the team, uh, you know, traveling director, uh, arranged. He, he checked out the commercial flights from Vancouver to Edmonton. And he said, uh, we're able to get six plane tickets. So the former Oilers who have plans tonight, you guys can go on a commercial flight from Vancouver, the flights in an hour, and then we'll meet you there. They're like, and no thanks. Yesterday, who was the captain stood up and he said, we traveled as a team. Either we all go or none of us go. And they waited. They waited for the airplane part to get there and, and, and probably missed their plans that night in Edmonton. Cheap as yeah. man. I, Ken, I want to ask, what's the biggest upset you ever watched, whether you call the game or just as an as a, as a audience member or observing it? What's the biggest upset in, in sports that you've ever seen? Wow, that's a great question. I've never gotten that one before. Um, there was a bowl game I called. Um, it was Alabama and Utah, and it was a Sugar Bowl, the second Sugar Bowl that I worked. Nick Saban coaching Utah. They were heavy favorites, and a couple of offensive linemen wound up getting hurt in the first quarter and Utah took a 17, nothing lead or 21, nothing lead and went on to win the game pretty easily. So, you know, that might be the biggest one that I could think of. I mean, I, you know, I've worked football games that were probably big upsets uh, through the years, but that's probably the biggest one that comes to mind that I worked the Utah, Alabama sugar bowl game. You ever met a president of the United States of America? I met uh, George Bush senior. Um, there's actually a picture behind me. Uh, my father was one of the hosts of the baseball pregame show on NBC back in the late eighties. And George Bush had played baseball at Yale. He was a big baseball fan. So they arranged an interview uh, at the white house. So they were going to do an interview in the oval office. And, and my whole family came along, my mother, my younger brother, younger sisters. And uh, we took a white house tour, never expected to meet the president. And then at the end of the day, uh, when they were wrapping up the interview, somebody came and, and got us and called us in and he said, the president wants to meet you. And uh, we took a photo, which I have behind me. He was such a gentleman. Um, funny story out of that one, actually. So my younger brother, who's six years younger than me, he was in high school at the time. And the next day he went back to school and told his teacher where he was. And she believed him because she knew, you know, she knew that our father was a sportscaster and that he wasn't making up a story that he went to the white house. But as a joke, she took an absentee slip that they used to have to fill out in high school and sent a letter to the white house. It said, uh, dear president Bush, uh, Brian Albert tells me he was at the white house with you yesterday. If that's the case, can you please send this absentee <laughs> slip and mail that's it back how to they him. used to do it. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, uh, it came back to the high school. It the said, uh, dear Mrs. A Buffman, Brian was with me. Please excuse the absence, George Bush. That is so fucking cool. You're like the Forrest Gump of sports. <laughs> Unreal. You have a story you know, it, for it, anything. It, it feels like it. Um, you know, working with so many analysts through the years. Um, a couple of friends tell me that I have a photo for everything on my phone. When Jimmy Buffett passed away last week, I have a photo with, with 
with him and Bill Moss, who was my partner that game on the field in New Orleans. He's a big Saints fan. So I pulled up a picture with Jimmy Buffett. Uh, I have a picture with Taylor Swift. She was sitting two seats over. I was calling a Knicks game and the celebrities sit right next to the TV uh, area. So got a picture with her at halftime. So you never know what, what might pop up on the phone. I have a great picture with Biz and Henrik Lundqvist from the David Blaine show. We took yeah, just selfie. don't hand it over to Babcock. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't oh, shit. On that one. But you guys probably know more of the details than I do. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, sorry to put you on the spot there, buddy. I jammed you up a little bit. <laughs> He's like, keep me out of this, Biz. He's like, gotta go. Yeah, oh um, my, uh, Ken. I, t- I told my dad we were interviewing you. And he said, "Yeah, uh, he said you're fantastic. Runs in the family. Tell him, tell him like you. I'm a big fan. I just want to pass that along." And you mentioned uh, Howie, Howie Long and uh, Chris Kreider. They actually both uh, lived in this town. I'm Charlestown. Howie grew up here till he was like 15, and Kreider left as a young kid. So, uh, in that vein, I got a Boston trivia question for you. Uh, who's the only guy to play for the Red Sox, Bruins, Celtics, and Patriots? I figure in the four sport. Played like for you all do. three three teams. Well, it's, four, the, four. it's the organist. It's the organist, right? Yeah, John Kiley. Yeah, it's a little trick question. Yeah, John Kiley played for all four Boston teams. Good yeah, job. They, they have that same trivia question in New York about uh, the former organist at Yankee Stadium. Eddie Layton also played for the Knicks and Rangers, played the organ for all three teams. How, how good do you think you would be at Sports Jeopardy? Do you think you would be that? Who, who's the guy who ended up going on that crazy run? Uh, pretty good. You know, I, I might, I, I, I probably wouldn't be. Uh, you know, in the top 10 or 20 percent, because there are some people out there with crazy minds who study this stuff all the time. But no, I, I would do pretty well. I would do very well. You know, I've been doing the puck doku. Have you guys been doing that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get shriveled on there when, when, when my name's one of the picks. They don't have a picture for me. It's just a peasant, peasant. No look picture. For What's going on? But no, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty good. Did you like that, Biz? I, I, you know, I got I, I got the right answer from Ari's question there about the organist. Oh, yeah, you're buzzing. Yeah, I, I figure there's not much that you don't know about you didn't sports. Think, you didn't think I would get that one. I, I, uh, no, I, I, I wasn't surprised that you nailed it. Now, here's my favorite, one of my favorite sports trivia questions. And he just passed away recently. Who's the only person to play on an NBA championship team as a player and coach in a Super Bowl as a head coach? What? It's from way back. Wait, Holy. play? So, do you repeat that play as a played for an NBA championship team? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Head coach in actually multiple Super Bowls. What the hell? No clue. I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. Minnesota. Bud Grant. Bud Grant. You got it. Nice. He played the NBA. Bud ah. Grant was actually he didn't play much, but he was on the Minneapolis Lakers. No back shit. Back in the early 1950s as a player. And then coached in the NFL. Wow! Hey, did did you grow up in Port Washington? I did. I did. Port Washington, Sands Point, from when I was uh, five or six, right through high school, and then uh, still went back in the summers during college. When I, when I was prepping for the interview, uh, a couple of names uh, jumped out at me. Guys who are from the hometown: uh, Bert Young, Paul Pauly from Rocky, from from that neck of the woods. You you ever meet him yeah, by I any chance? I think you lived there at one point. And uh, well, Citizen Kane himself, uh, William Randolph Hearst, he was a. Uh, Port Washington guy too, huh? Did I think you know so. That? I heard that yeah, too. we had we had Bjorn Borg at one point, the tennis star. Oh I yeah, was, yeah. Huh. Kid, he lived in Port Washington. We had a lot of the 1986 Mets. Oh, don't please, you kill, Ken, you're killing me with this stuff. Oh, <laughs> okay, you've, you've won three. You've won three since then. But a lot of the 86 Mets. Some of the Islanders live in the area in some of the neighboring towns. But it was a great place to grow up. Uh, I haven't lived there in a long time. I've been over in Jersey across two bridges for the last. Uh, 24 years, but did grow up in Port Washington. Okay, so you've been so generous with your time. My last one is, who was the most starstruck person you've ever met? Like, when you met them, you were like, ah, oh. like you got jammed up. You've met all these famous people, Taylor Swift, you named them all. Well, when I was about 14 or 15, it was Wayne Gretzky. He was the first one. And I have a picture behind me from that first meeting. And now, you know, how lucky are both of us? And oh, he, he wrote insane. one of the forwards. He wrote one of the forwards to my book, along with Walt Clyde Frazier. But I'll never forget, never forget the first time uh, meeting Wayne. But, you know, a number of other, I had the good fortune of meeting a lot of pro athletes when I was young uh, due to my father and my uncles. So uh, whether it was Dr. J, Julius Irving, uh, getting to meet him on a number of occasions. I actually have a, I mentioned the photos. I have a photo with Andre the Giant. I was about, 15 or 16 years old 
So I actually have a photo with Andre the Giant. RA has an yeah. iconic photo, isn't it? Your Instagram or your Twitter photo? It's on my uh, it's on my Instagram if you go to it. Yeah, like we used to go backstage well with the Boston guy used to have wrestling. They would go to the garage and we would be able, able to hang out there after. And we got pictures with him when I was like nine, 10 years old. And I mean, I got one picture. He's, lo he's looking down at me. And I was like a 10 year old kid. He's staring right oh, into the cool. camera. And he's smiling because Andre the Giant didn't smile all, all that much. I have, so I have a bunch of wrestlers. I have pictures with oh. Andre, Ric Flair. Oh, man. Uh, from when I was in high school. Um, I think I had have one with Sergeant Slaughter from back in the day. <laughs> It's, and oh. uh, a couple of others, but, but Dude, Andre, Andre's the good. Andre's the, the big one. The one yeah. that RA's got so cool because you were a kid and you were he, he was you know walking and he had the towel over his head and RA. You said he just loved kids, right? And that's yeah. why he, yeah. he smiled. So you 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 looked up and you snapped this photo with his. Uh, what do you call those old cameras? Uh, old I'm holes? gonna get you with the Kodak disc. Yeah, yeah the, the <laughs> I'm gonna get you. I'm not gonna miss. And it, it's. I mean, all right. It's an iconic photo, buddy. Yeah, it, it is good shit, man. It really was. Uh, Ken, I know you just mentioned your book again. I, I want to mention again for the for the listeners: a mic for all seasons. My three decades announced in the NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB, and Olympics. Uh, what what date in October does it drop? Well, first of all, thanks, thanks for mentioning it and giving it a plug. Oh, One of, of the biggest challenges was the editing process. I wrote it myself. No ghostwriter which I wanted to do. It was my voice, my stories, a lot of Good. fun. My wife and kids were a big help in the, in the editing process and coming up with some stories. One of my biggest challenges is the N's, the S's, and the T's in your name. <laughs> that's a lot. There's a lot two going on, buddy. See, no, exactly. Hey, I, two of each. That's easy. That's, why I, that's, how I that's why I failed my SATs. I still don't know right. how to spell it. Well, the SNT, right? But yeah. you're, you're in there a couple of times, and I had to actually Google you to make sure to make sure that I spelled it right. But it's a mic for all seasons. Um, a lot of the stories I just told are in there. Most of them are in there. Um, but it's really, you know, it starts early life, uh, broadcasting through high school and college, the Skipjacks, Capitals, onto Fox, Rangers, TNT, et cetera. But also, you know, a lot of family stories, travel stories, uh list of all the analysts that I've worked with, stories about the Olympics, the pandemic, how we did a lot of the broadcast during that time. So I felt like I had a lot of stories to get out there and and hopefully hopefully uh everybody will enjoy it. But it's available on uh as you mentioned, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target. Uh officially comes out October 10th. I received the first couple of boxes. So very exciting to to open it up and see it for the first time and like I said, a huge honor. Wayne Gretzky and Walt Clyde Frazier uh, wrote the forwards for the book. Oh, that that's awesome. And as a guy, I used to watch the Albert Achievement Awards when your dad used to call Letterman back in the day. To, to I think he, and talk. He, he was on Letterman <laughs> yeah. like 60 or 70 times. There you go, Biz. Biz, I don't know if there's enough it. pictures in there for you, but. I like the purple tie, too, and, and then the purple font. It's beautiful. I gotta, I'm going to take a picture of you right now holding up the book. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> that picture actually. Long story. Put it, hey, put it next to, to Taylor Swift in the camera phone, the, the camera I'm gonna lock. Do that. I'm going to do that. And it to you. Long story short, the picture was actually taken in Vegas, game two of the cup final, right before that game. So it came right down to the wire as far as what photo we were going to use. So that's actually from Vegas with MSG superimposed in the background. You got the TNT makeup girls working overtime. You look great in this one. Holy <laughs> jump. Oh, coming, man. Coming from you, that's, that's a high compliment. TNT photographer <laughs> as well. Um, but oh, Kenny, you're, you're such a joy to work with, buddy. Like you're the nicest guy in the world. We can't thank you enough for your time. And uh, like I said, it's just a joy. And congratulations on all your success. Uh, I can't wait to read the book, and, and all of you should pick it up. Kenny Albert, baby. What a joy. Thank this is so awesome, much, Kenny. Kenny. This is so great, buddy. Have a so great, great season. You guys are the best. Um, you know, Biz, last week we were with Charles Barkley, and he was telling us, telling you, he's never been – uh, more people came up to him to compliment him on the, on, you know, you guys having him on than any other interview was ever done. Right. Have yeah. He said it to me twice. I, I I don't even know what to say when he says that he just, yeah, people love them on here. And yeah, he, yeah, he said that. Yeah. He said that twice to me with in, in RA. He goes, he goes, I've done a lot of interviews and a lot of podcasts, but I never get, you know, people don't come up to me as much as they did. But when I did spit and chiglets. How was yeah, my I'm Charles Barkley impression? I'm a witness. I was there when he said that. But you guys are the best. I love listening on plane rides throughout the year and can't wait for hockey to get started. And thanks so much for having me on. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Straight Talk. 
A new Straight Talk Wireless offering is now available where you can get a Walmart Plus membership included on select Straight Talk Wireless plans for free. Only Straight Talk Wireless gives you unlimited data, talk, and text, plus a Walmart Plus membership included on select plans for free. Some of the perks of Walmart Plus through select Straight Talk Wireless plans are free delivery from Walmart stores, free shipping, no order minimum, Paramount Plus membership, member prices on fuel so you get those gas savings. Straight Talk Wireless is available at Walmart and Walmart.com. Huge thanks to Kenny for coming on us, man. What a great story to tell. Plus, I mean, anytime I got an A, an a on any of my impressions is always a good day, Biz. You know? uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Pump the tires a little bit. <laughs> I'm not talking about the Warthog. No, I'm I saying know. it's the fucking year of the Warthog. You're, <laughs> oh, you're, you you yeah, can't like miss it. right now. All right, You're uh, going to start yeah. dating Taylor Swift next, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> I maybe should learn her music before I do. All right. If you could date any celebrity like now or then. They'll say an actress from the 40s. Dude. Suzanne Summers, I bet. Huh. She passed Jane away. G- um, who who yeah, was your girl growing up? Back in the day. Pamela Anderson from Baywatch? The, uh, no, I was kind of late. The first, actually, the first like chick poster I had was Christy Brinkley. The first like. Yeah, post you know was who like, was was um i remember being like whoa something's going on down there uh-huh. you remember yasmin belief is that her name yeah yeah what do you mean oh. something's going on down there like there's, there's blood, something there's moving pants. and there's blood <laughs> rushing oh, oh i thought you meant maybe she had, had one i'm there's like what four inches she had a rock penis? hard down there yasmin belief like n- midnight yeah on the right yeah. she's baywatch yeah that's who she's ba- that's oh my yasmin god belief? that's her now <laughs> yeah hey no that's no she looks she looks good. great wow she still got it yeah. Um, Christy bring and then honestly, like Madonna, early Madonna videos. That's when I was like, "Whoa, what's going on down there?" That, that's when I started getting a uh, Madonna. Well, she always, was, Madonna's she was, always kind of disgusted me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. Ever since she pounded Rodman, she's like Jack too. Like I'm not a jacked woman guy. It's just kind of like, like I, don't I like girls. With I know muscle. you do. One time you showed me on Instagram. This is my style. She had. 18 like abs I want and like, clit so big it's like, almost like a penis i was like oh my god biz <laughs> like that's legit like a weightlifter like you oh, yeah. want a straight out body but i like a little mu- muscle it's tone. disgusting yeah you, you ever see her very old, healthy though <laughs> her old penthouse photos that she did like a photo shoot Ooh. age madonna she did like a, before she was no. a star she did these old this photo shoot like a nude shoot and then they like someone found them when she was a superstar she looked like the freaking amazon rainforest like hair under her arms big old 70s bush and everything biz it's really fucking, yeah i think the bushes are coming back now you i think, think that, yeah? oh for sure for sure i don't think they should have well because because like girls were lasering it off so you're in it, the game are you seeing bushes in the wild i mean i'm not going to get into the bushes in the wild okay you know, i'd <laughs> rather rather talk about snorting yeah. off of and, ra's and, pits and figure size uh, clips but you don't want to talk about that <laughs> um god who uh who who is uh yeah, who, oh who? uh carmen electra oh my god she still got it she 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 was um she was uh she had a poster like washing a car like the bubbles everywhere oh my. and by the way i was never even remotely close to allowed to have a poster of a girl in my room like, so i, I had a i had a that. i had a fox magazine which was like dirty mag oh like and I, had these, Hustler? I had this like little single bed at my parents house where the drawers on the bottom you could pull them out so i would hide it like i would pull the drawer out and i had the one magazine for forever i, I forget who the girl on the cover was i think it maybe it was sylvia saint but uh and it wasn't a playboy it wasn't like an article type magazine classy, it was like they they had, magazine. they had one one uh, they would always be like a featured girl and then there would be like the cum dart like the the you know they'd actually have the like the, the board they'd, the, they'd have your target they'd have the tar- i yeah. never used it yeah yeah you didn't <laughs> Wait, I know. By the way, it's so underrated that RA had a subscription to Playboy when he was 12, 12 years, years old. old. That's one of the crazier spit and chicklets that facts. Is, mm. I couldn't put a post but he up was, my room. He had a subscription to Playboy. When we talked about it, he's that. like, that's not that crazy. Yeah, he was like, what do you mean? And then it, what was even crazier was that his mom signed him up, signed it up. No, for him. actually, no. <laughs> that, no, like, no she, like maybe the CDs you used to buy. Remember, you used to get seven yeah, for a dollar, and house. then you had to buy a certain amount every month, month over month. No, you got signed up for the Playboy boy subscription she, by your mom no i uh, it was publishers clearinghouse remember that oh you might have already yes. won 20 million dollars so yeah. I, for some reason i got one in the mail when i was like 13 or 14 and i you had to subscribe to two magazines so i did it. sports illustrated and playboy you know they must have thought i was an adult my mother she didn't like sign me up she was fine with it though like but what pretty, happened when she got the mail no the, she no she was like okay she's like just don't you know bring it to school whatever because they like, just don't she, hit the like, target in the living like, room my stepfather <laughs> bought one she would like i don't my think mother playboy had the target it. 
Yeah, um, no, like the other one I've said is I, 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 I just threw myself around the room to the old uh, music video Wicked Game by Chris oh, Isaac. Oh, and, Chris and I've Isaac. said many times in the pod that I ended up watching on pop up video on VH1 that he was actually penetrating and having sex during the shoot of the video on a palm tree. You tell me right now if you can YouTube this music video and, not, you pull it up to uh, and not dumb yourself to this beautiful, oh, beautiful so, woman. Chris Isaac was a stallion as well. So I was a big, uh, <laughs> I was a big BET beater. I'd, I'd crank myself off. To oh, the really? BET. Yeah. Because like back like then, like the Nicki Minaj's before Nicki Minaj. No, it was uh, still Dre had some some thoughts in him. But I want to say one of the Saint Lunatics videos with Nelly had the best girls, where you would get slow mo's of them, where like the big juicy arses would get me going. Just I like think we, I think we spent those. Yeah. Yeah. Look, spent look, that look at that woman. I mean, this is he, who? Look at her. Oh, this is who? This is Chris Isaac, Wicked Game. This is how I was just dummying myself the, the at a very young age. a bit of a man missile, too. Yeah, that's Chris Isaac, dude. The guy could <laughs> sing. I don't even think this is his song. This Isn't is this a remake? Boring. Well, yeah, apparently when you see... Right there, they were penetrating. Oh. That's what pop-up video on VH1 said. That's all I'm saying. But what a beautiful young woman. And what a, you know, what a handsome young lad. But also... What um, a vid hey, it's, imagine you're the artist. You're like, all right, here's the video. Get me the hottest Superman woman on the planet, and she's gonna sit on my lap while I have a full fledged rocket up her vagina, and we're gonna hit the record button on a palm tree. Yeah, there you go. George. That's a <laughs> and, and and you know, two good looking people. They might just be like, let's just go for this. Let's do it. George she Michael. looks Euro too. George Michael had four supermodels in that freedom video back in the day. So was he bisexual? George? Yeah. I don't know if he was. Down he just with did the everything. Is that the one I, who got sucked like off fellas. in a stall in public, and then uh, people try to make a big deal I out of it? I believe that was him. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. He was a great artist. I remember a video, yeah. like, uh, a more recent video. Recent. This is probably twenty years ago. Do you remember Petey Pablo with that song? Like, or Croatia, Rwanda. He's listing all the girls' names. Oh yeah. There's a lot of sexy BET ones for you in that one. Oh yeah. So check that one, Petey Pablo. Uh, one last one. You mentioned Pasha's bedroom, like. That we put that picture of you sleeping in his bedroom. Someone goes, "Is that Bert and Ernie's bedroom from Sesame Street?" <laughs> I know. The two wooden twin beds. How about memes putting the the other twin bed and putting oh. Barry the big guy yeah, in the Barry, bed? Our boy Barry. Oh, yeah. Someone goes, "Biz does BBC." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so because 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 the name of the the uh. mockumentary was called Biz Does B B C. Pasha's bedroom was shit though, huh? Awful. Awful. Jesus, Posh. Awful. Seriously, you look like my grandparents' bedroom in the 40s when they used to sleep in separate beds. Um, Some of you people are like, who's Barry? Barry was this, I think it was yeah. during COVID, Barry. Everyone really knows, yeah, Barry. Everyone Everyone knows Barry now. He was a porn star who had a huge rope and it, yeah. it, there was the messages like, hey, check out what somebody's saying about you online. And you would click it. And next thing you know, it was Barry's hog staring you. It was face. really, it was really like COVID. Like, look what's locked down now. And you click <laughs> on it. Think the big news. <laughs> <laughs> Barry. All right. <laughs> Uh, Just, you needed a chuckle during those dark days. Uh, absolutely. Nothing like a Good dark hammer to, to turn around your dark day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for some reason, a six-year-old story on CBS News went viral last week. Uh, immediately heated up the Chicklets text thread once again. Uh, researcher Randall Bell studied the habits of the rich and found that if you make your bed each morning, you are 206% more likely to become a millionaire. It so, all right, you were disgusted at this in the group chat. I would assume you're not a bed maker. I'm a sack you of broken think? eggs. I always have an unmade bed. Yeah, man. I that's bullshit, dude. Bullshit. Like the, making the your stat bed. is bullshit. All right. All right. right. I agree. Like yeah. the, 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 you're more likely to be a millionaire in making your bed. At the same time, I responded. I said, I don't agree with that at all. That seems ridiculous. It seems made up. It seems to make no sense. At the same time, you're a piece of trash if you don't make your bed. And and I think <laughs> it's more about, it's more about. It's starting the day off the right way. Yeah. It's starting the day off with a little win, a little W, a little yeah. bit of success. All right, my bed's made. I'm ready to go. And more than anything, it's about when you get back home and you get back to going to bed that night. It's not an unmade, unkept, clothes everywhere bed. You're looking at a nice made bed, a nice clean room. Now, granted, since I'm married, I don't make the bed, but my wife does. <laughs> but, 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 but before I was married, I made my bed all the time. There was a couple of days I didn't, but I specifically remember brushing my teeth and being like, 
Oh, I don't want to make my bed. But that's the early victory of the day. That leads to success. I believe Merle said Barry Trotz is a big time make the bed in the morning guy. And it's one thing where it's just you think like. think he asks guys when he gets in first meeting? Instead of asking for the phone, he asks for, uh, hey, uh, you make the bed. And he, go, like found out, he finds out Yossi doesn't make his bed. He trades him. Yeah. So I, I think that for me, it's like start the day off the right way. And, and I think a lot of people who don't make their bed, I think those same people have clothes everywhere. They have because you're not hanging up your clothes, putting everything away, and then not making the bed. They're not it's washing the, the sheets so, either. They're not washing so, the sheets. Okay, so wait, I think you're uh, I think you're a genius in the marriage category because you. Oh seen, really? Yeah. Let's bring my wife on and ask her that question. No, but I, but in a sense of you seem to establish very smart rules. Whereas you, you establish the golf thing where you're like, hey, if you're going to take away from my golf, like I'm not going to be happy and then you're not going to be happy. Another thing is, is uh, yesterday uh, you couldn't do the interview live with Dolman because you had family photos. And I I'm like, oh, like the wives oh. <laughs> love the family photos. And where it goes, oh, no, 15 minutes, we're in and out. So it's <laughs> so well, that's the deal I made. I said, listen, <laughs> we'll do family the, photos. The deals, so, the deals he makes are incredible. You, did you also cut a deal on the bed making? Um, no, she's just like very like adamant about stuff like that. And like when I leave clothes everywhere, she's like, pick up your clothes. And it's, it's one of those things where like, I, I expect things from her as my wife and she expects <laughs> things as her husband. Like, don't leave you the room. You should be a fucking a NHL GM a with the deals. A disgusting mess. But in terms of the family photos, Biz, what we were laughing about was that you were like, those things suck. Like I had to do them. Like, if you're doing professional photos, if they aren't for like your wedding or engagement without kids, you're crazy. You're absolutely nuts. Like we have kids. These are Christmas card pictures. But I said, I go, listen, we will drive. I'll drive 40 minutes, but 15 minutes. We took 190 photos in 15 minutes in four different locations around this little park. So I'll tell you right now, if you're going to do family photos, tell your wife, you can save money, you can save time, and you can keep happiness and peace in your life. 15 minute photos are all you need. That's all you need to get done. It takes quick. It's the kids, by the way. I mean, try wrangling in Wyatt Whitney for pictures. The kid's an absolute lunatic. So once I tell him 15 minutes and you get a lollipop after, okay, dad. Okay. Dials we, it on. And he dialed it in. He's fixing his hair That's on his own. He turns three, November 16th. And, and I'm like, there we go. And when we finished, I said, how good was that? And she said, it's unbelievable. It was a great idea, babe. All we did need was 15 minutes. So it's one of those things where- That's if what you, I'm if, saying, if you dude. Get, if guys you, should be in NHL GM. No, hey, I don't know about Ari, that. No, wait, Ari's got the grind my gears. You need tips for husbands. We need a tips for husband segment, man. <laughs> Negotiating the bed making. The hey, the, the amount of family trips you're going on. Like how do you you're just dialed? I give me, I, I give know, me but another I feel example. Like, I feel like my situation is a you're little different. 300 rounds a year, no, buddy. I don't, dude. I do not anymore. I do not play you that play much more golf than anymore. Guys but, on the PGA. but it's not because of her. It's you play more golf than Kepka. <laughs> Dude, my rounds of golf is severely down. Let me tell you, it doesn't make me happy. And, and it's just one of those things like the kids get older. It's easy to play golf when your kids are real young. R Ryder turns six end of November. Like there's just more stuff going on. Weekends after uh, some uh, uh, your kid is like five, you're, you're done. You're absolutely done. So I think that my situation is a little different in the fact that... Um, I had all the money, so you're, you're, <laughs> you're able to kind of set some boundaries at the beginning. But if you're in a relationship where it's 50-50, or especially if your wife's making more than you, like it doesn't really work like it is for me. So I, I think that- Kevin it, Feller, it, Fellerline didn't care. <laughs> yeah, he worked. What a deal maker that oh, guy was. Yeah, he and he saw GM. that she was going to go completely cuckoo at the end. Yeah. Poor Brittany. Yeah. But I, I think that- uh, I, I, you just you just want to be open and honest when you meet someone. That's my biggest advice. Tell them what you're into, what you can live with, and what you can live without. And that way, moving forward, there are no surprises. There are no crazy things popping up. And you're able to live a life where she knows what you expect and you know what she expects. I didn't have uh, Britney Spears fans coming after our podcast on on, our, on my bingo card, but you might have just... Mar marriage is hard fucking work. R.A. will tell you. And I ain't yeah. trying to sit here and preach you have to work hard to have a successful marriage. It is legitimately one of those things where once you get late, like when I get lazy and when I start not doing what like, things I promised I'd be doing around the house, you just all of a sudden the tension rises yeah. and you realize I haven't been carrying my weight. So it's hard work. It is what it is. It is. 
It's, it's, it's very, I mean, any, any relationship, hundred percent right? uh, going back to the bed making, I, I believe that that is the case, but because it establishes discipline and I find people discipline. that are just, dis- it's not about doing things when you, when you, you know, oh, you feel like doing them people who are very regimented and it starts with just a little win, as you mentioned in the morning like that, I guarantee you more millionaires than not make their bed. Well, the big time millionaires have people making their bed for them um, in terms of like housekeepers and stuff. But the other thing is, I just love getting into a made bed. It's like, for some reason, getting into bed unmade, it doesn't feel the same. So that's my final okay. word on the bed making. Yeah. My early victory is just getting up, waking up in the morning. That's my early victory. Well, you wake up in the afternoon. <laughs> so I guess that's a win no matter what Wait, time so it is. So you're saying when Breeze away, you make the bed when Breeze away. Yes. Okay. All right. Take your word on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think he just undercover called you a liar. I don't put all liar. the pillows on. We have 14 oh, pillows, oh. which Women is a joke. So pillows, I don't put, I put the, I put the yeah. two pillows that you sleep on. Uh, so I don't get the rest of the whole look, which so, is so dumb. It's, but it's but the star pillow, the lumber spine pillow. No, it's just all like the, pi- the pillows for w- w- like Whatever. look. And it's like, nobody's even in there. So who cares? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the NHL, man, sometimes they can't get out of their own way. For reasons known only to them, the NHL decided to step in shit and ban the rainbow color tape known as pride tape. Uh, there are no reports of anybody clamoring to get rid of it. The league just come out of nowhere and said they don't want to make it available. It's too much of a distraction. I don't get what they mean by that. It's been the, this has been the rule since, I don't know, at least 2015. Adhesive tape of any color may be wrapped around the stick at any place for the purpose of reinforcement or to improve control of the puck. So they're just kind of coming in like they did with Sean Avery in the playoffs. They're just going to change their own rule. Like, what the fuck are they thinking? Like, just let these guys wear it if, they, if a team has that designated night. It's just they step in shit once again. And I think they're hypocrites because all they talk about is inclusive and hockey's for everyone. And then they do something like this and, and it sends the wrong message to the to the people that they're trying to send a good message. Yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, some people listening are like, I don't even want to fucking hear about this. Like, I just want to watch sports. Uh, I think this has a lot to do with how it all went down last year when a few members of uh, or at least one of the Philadelphia Flyers, I think it was Provorov. Provorov. He didn't want to wear the pride jersey because it's not in his faith as far as same-sex marriage. Uh, let, let me reiterate, and we've said this a million times, we are, we. If, you want, if you're a guy and you want to marry a guy, if you're a guy and you want to be a girl, we are here to support anything that you want to be on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Well, at least me. Can we all agree that? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So, this this didn't need to be kicked up. They could have just let this go and let the tape thing be a thing. But I feel like they tried to get ahead of it and they they made a shitstorm within their within their own stuff going on. The tape now situation to take it away is just it's it, idiosity because you can even hear some of these players saying like, "Well, I want to do that." So I think there's a big portion of people where they just want to go to sports to watch sports and not have to talk about any of this stuff. And that's where I think that most people lie with their opinion on everything. No. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think we all just want to watch the game, but you know, this is a a thing for the last several years with the league. And again, it's, they've been, you know, hockey's for everyone. They've been like beating that drum and then they turn around and just say, Oh, you can't wait with this tape. I think some players are going to come out and just wear it. Some game willy. Didn't Lawton already say he's going to. Well, what's the thing? It's just like, the Jersey thing was an absolute clusterfuck last season, okay? So they make the announcement, and obviously there was a bunch of noise and a bunch of chatter. How are you doing this? It was over. It was all over. Like, the fact yeah, that they, yeah. like, it was done. Like, they, if they were going to do this, do it then with the jerseys. Deal with all the backlash then. They just come out of nowhere right as the season's beginning when there was just no need to mention anything at all. It was just ridiculous timing. But I'm going to go to the fact of the real issue with the NHL for me right now, this fucking app is something Mm -hmm. else. I'll tell you, they decided to redo their app this summer. It is the worst app on the app store. I looked the other I designed day. it. It's yeah, it looks like you designed it and then did the coding for it as well. Right after hanging out with RA and his and his ski titties. I'll tell you this though. I looked every single game right now, it says it whatever the score is, which isn't always correct. All the goal, the goals are lit. It's the same goal score, the same assist guy. Every game, it's broken. And like, if you're gonna redo the the app, actually was okay before. I don't remember like having complaints about it like this. So you're gonna redo it. You're gonna drop it, and it doesn't even work. It's unbelievable how they're able to just like get in their own way constantly. Because now I'm not even using it. I got to go to the the score. Because so you can't so even I find even out. I even find the the website, they've changed the website as well. And that's where I go. I don't even use the app. 
I feel like the website sometimes it's not even working in some of the same problems you mentioned. You mentioned Dude. they're always changing it every two, three years where you finally get used to it and then boom, it's different again. So and if the ESPN app is incredible though. I mean, I just go there because you can watch the games now too if you have ESPN Plus so, on there. So, so on the new NHL app, you can't even go in on the app and see like the time on ice and stuff. And last year you could. It's it's crazy. They've they've somehow made their product that much worse with an improved in quotations app. It's unbelievable. Like no other league right now has an app that, that doesn't work. And on the main page, like if you click on like certain goalie stats, they have like their record, but they don't have the losses on there. It's like how many games they played, their wins. And it's like they're missing one of the main st stats on there. And earlier they didn't have like, I think it was goals against or save percentage. It was like, those are the fucking main things people are looking for. And they didn't have them on certain players. It's, I don't know, it is a clusterfuck win. I agree with it's on that. It's just crazy. Yeah. Brutal. By the way, we've talked about the uh, the banana tits. Shout out uh, Melinda Dillon, who played Suzanne Hanrahan. She uh, she passed away last year. Oh. Gotta give, no, we got to give her a shout out. She was uh, the mother in uh, Christmas Story too, Biz. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that movie. Yeah, great um, yeah, another thing I forgot to bring up just quickly, Carolina, a uh, great win in LA to start the year. Then they lose to the, the Ducks, but something to keep an eye on. Um, uh, what, Jesus, what's his, I'm blanking out. He played on the Bruins last year, the D-man, big signing. Dimitri Orlov. Orlov, who was the best player for the Bruins in the playoffs and maybe one of their best players after he came over at the deadline. He's minus seven in two games and playing 15 minutes a game. So I don't know. Let's just let's see where that goes. Who knows if Brindamore saw him in camp and wasn't overly impressed, but just a stat that kind of popped out. Well, right the away. one thing about them is they also they have, have so, so many, many D to snap it around to. And and uh you can I mean, I, I remember Thomas Caberle when he was playing for the Leafs, he was getting, you know, 25, 26 minutes a night, and then he got traded over to the bees. Yep. And all of a sudden he was playing in that, you know, 17, 18 minute range where you're not used to getting your reps and getting snapped around. And all of a sudden the game declines quick to the point where I want to even say during that playoff run, he might even been a healthy scratch. Yeah, I think he where was. they traded like a couple first rounders for him. So for a defenseman in that perspective of going from a high number of minutes to now all of a sudden where you might get even lost. It just feels like you, you the puck feels heavier. You, you're not making the right reads. You're not playing with that anticipation you you once did. So that can become difficult. But they're loaded on the back end, and and you know that's not that's not an ideal situation, especially for the amount of money you're paying them. And on top of that, you got D'Angelo back in the mix too. So seven point seven five for the next this year, and next year. That's, I mean, he was so good. It's like, a lot he, of dough. he's a player. It's just kind of odd to see yeah. a start like that. Yeah, uh, your old team, the Penguins. They lost their first game, then they won two. Games games in a row, but four nothing over the Caps, five two over the Flames. Gino had six points in those two games, but uh, Sid, longest tenured captain now at 18 years, 18 consecutive seasons, averaging a point per game, only one guy with more, Wayno at 19. But here's the record they, these guys have. Sid, Gino, and Chris Letang hold the North American record for longest team, teammate trio with 18 seasons together. Those the No three guys have ever had this many seasons. No together. way. In and any, they're in any North American and they're still yeah. bringing it. Gino's yeah. off to the hot start. Uh, Riley Smith looks good. Riley Smith looks great. Listen, I know Dubas is a Leafs trader, and you, some of you say, oh, they fired him. Shut up. He stabbed him in the back. What he has done in the offseason to revamp this lineup is is nothing short of a miracle with the fucking tricks that he was able to get Carlson over with and, and make all the trades and get rid of cap situation, bring over Riley Smith. He had the connection to Achari, bringing him over the Leafs last year at the deadline. So it seems like that bottom six has that sandpaper that they needed that they were missing last year. The top guns are going. Gensel's playing for a contract right now, and he was actually supposed to miss the first five games of the year rush back to get back uh, with that ankle injury and uh, the Nadelkovich looked great in the game that he was thrown into Jari looked great in game two if Jari can get back to to two years ago when they they uh before he got hurt um when they lost to the the New York Rangers in playoffs if they can all get together get to that place they are very much a, a Stanley Cup contender in my opinion it's a lot of ifs lot, lot, buddy but hey to revamp the lineup the way that they did, if you're a Pittsburgh Penguin fan, you have to be thrilled about what you're seeing so far and the fact that the, they look like a rejuvenated team. I saw some tweet going around. I wish I knew who it was from, or maybe it was on Instagram. Like, gotta love Crosby. He's still wearing his Ramuski Oceanic jacket from 20 years ago. The guy is just a machine. So yeah. he looks great off the bat. And I think Gino said when asked about his start, yeah, I wish season ended tomorrow and I win the Hart <laughs> Trophy. Yeah. 
Uh, a lot of rookies making news in the past week. Gee, we got a great quote from Paul, Paul Maurice. Want to run that one? A few players have the opportunity to make their NHL yeah. debut. Uh, what's the biggest key in managing some of the emotions and pressures? Yeah, I, I, I don't want them to. I don't. I want them to be nervous. Like, they get they get a standard speech, but it's true. You can win five Stanley Cups, five hard trophies. You, you, you can be in the Hall of Fame, but you only ever get one first game in the NHL. And that's not your game, actually. It's mom and dad's game and all the volunteer coaches that helped you, teachers, everybody. So when they come to the rink, I tell them, I really don't care how you play tonight. I want you to be nervous for the national anthem, be overwhelmed, take it all in, but do it with a smile on your face and have some fun because you only ever get one of these days. This quote is so cool. I had a bunch of people send it to me and and, and right away, it definitely like hits you hard as, as a player because it's so true. Like you'll, I'll never forget my first game. I'll never forget the feeling of getting called up. For me, warm ups. My parents came down to the glass. I just got to see them and like just a, a a a wordless thank you. I can't believe this is happening, and it was awesome. And and Paul Maurice has 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 always been an unreal quote. He's he's very uh, well spoken, and he he delivered the perfect one there. And in describing it, no matter what you accomplish, it's all about remembering and and the memory of your first game and your 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 dream coming true. He, he's so eloquent. Every time yeah. he's asked a, a question, I mean, it was it was on display during that cup run last year. But how does he find the right words every goddamn time? Oh, he's been doing he's this a for poet. a long time. Too, he's a man. fucking poet. He could run for president. You know, he's oh, one of those type nah, of guys. He, was, he wasn't born in America. I think he's he could he could sell me a fucking Ponzi scheme in four minutes. Oh yeah, but so could the guy on the street corner <laughs> on Newberry Street. <laughs> well, uh, L.A. King rookie Alex Laferriere, his family's certainly going to remember it. He went. They went fucking nuts, that scrap. Who did he fight? Oh, Logan O'Connor. Did you yep. see the absolute UFC takedown? That family was going bananas. And he went to fucking Harvard, too. Wait, wait you don't usually see too many Harvard guys. I, I think it was Colby Armstrong who texted to our group chat that he thinks he mouthed to the guy in the box that he fought. He goes, that was my first fight ever. I mean, chances, really? chances are if he went to Harvard, he wasn't scrapping there. And uh, oh. he's he's from New Jersey, so you could tell his family are, are used to maybe seeing some uh, some scraps outside the bars there at the, the, the dirty south shore we'll fuck up some smart kids uh i wasn't the only rookie to drop and johnny beecher the bruins rookie he fought uh chicago's jason dickinson a little hit hit who did he hit from behind i forget the guy's name but the dickens come over nice little scrap he did it right for himself ng yeah i mean i think that fourth line in general has looked awesome and i was talking to biz about this last night where i was told that when lucic came in this offseason in in training camp They've made such uh, an effort to be a harder team yeah. to play against and just being real sons of bitches out front. They got to be the big bad Bruins. Exactly. G. And you look at a guy like Brandon Carlo, his game is, it's not fully changed, but he is a motherfucker to play against this year. You said, you said he laid out uh, Hall, Taylor yeah. Hall. He's just out front. He's just a bastard to play against. And back to the fourth line, Lauko, Lucic, and Beecher. It's just life. Every game so far, they've been the best line. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, Frederick, we talked about him earlier, too. He's got some piss and vinegar. You know Marshawn's competing his bag off every night. So, uh, so far, how how have you guys felt about the the, the Zaka and Coil experiment one-two punch? Oh, and we didn't – you that rook, rookie kid you mentioned – how about that fucking play Patra. he made that? Incredible. Patra. Did we get the, the, the uh, how do we say his name? Patra. It's Patra. Okay, so Patra. I, I wish, it, I liked Patra, but it's oh, not. Same here. Oh, you I said got it. Patra. I got it right from the horse's mouth. Pa Patra. Patra. Pa Patra, yeah. Patra. No. Pa what? You're saying Patra. different things. Patra. Well, yeah. no, Patra. Well, Patra. Patra. No, Patra. But, oh, Patra. Oh, yeah, it's in my yeah. head now. Yeah. Patra. Not Patra. It's regardless okay. of Patra. Practice lines today. Just remember Pot. All right. I do. Pot. I do. Pot. He, he doesn't forget that. Uh -huh. So he's been playing on that third line with Frederick and Geeky, but as of today, they bumped him up to second line. Now he's playing alongside Brad Marchand. So he played with Marchand all preseason, and you could tell after every shift, Marchand's coaching him up what to do. I love them playing together. Yeah. I love that. Oh, hey, I mean, they, they, sometimes they get these sneaky picks. They've been criticized in the past about some of their drafts, yeah, it's been especially tough. the one when they had the three the three first rounders where they whiffed on everything. Or was they the got Bruss, the Bruss. They got the yeah. Bruss. I guess they didn't whiff them on all of them, but they missed on, on, on Matty Barzell. But this kid's got a lacrosse background too. So as far as body position, the way he's able to protect the puck and, and, and make plays and also get to the dirty areas and take that punishment – People who have lacrosse backgrounds, they're used to the getting hacked and whacked. So that's a good thing where I wouldn't say he's the biggest guy, no. but as long as you're able to take punishment and protect the puck and go to those hard areas, that's all I fucking care. Marshan compared him to Mitch Marner. So they dropped, um, really? Yeah. So they dropped Coyle to third line? Coyle is now okay. third line. He's a third, Coyle is a, a, he's a great third line he's center. He's an incredible third line center. Just like uh, Adam Lowry is exactly. in Winnipeg, like that type of player. Oh, did you see that highlight? 
of yeah. the bench. Um, Josh Morrissey, uh, Lowry loses his stick and he's kicking the puck up to himself. And Josh Morrissey hands his over on a two on one rush. It's half the size of Lowry's stick and he's bending over and then throws a backhand sauce over. I forget who it was, but it was a cool highlight. Usually it's the trainer, how good they are on their toes, but it was Morrissey who handed it over. It was pretty cool. That reminds assist. me of uh, a couple of times like Ray Whitney just being like, you fucking idiot, where like a righty would lose his stick and, and I'd be over good. the boards like, here, take mine, take mine. <laughs> And uh, yeah, e even worse, they would ask me sometimes like what guys, what guys on my line, what way they shot. And I wouldn't be able to tell them. Oh shit. Yeah. I was pathetic tough. where some guys, I would say that, well, Yans was obviously you the can hard. Do that. Can't you, can't you name every Yans was, he could tell you what fucking color tape they use and what their curve was. And, and really when they found, <laughs> when they started quizzing me guys on the team, like, I think they asked me, like, I bet he doesn't know, even know what the way like chip chip Chera shoots. And I kind of froze up and he's like, you don't know which way he shoots. So they started <laughs> grilling me every guy on the team. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. They were like, you're fucking pathetic. No wonder you never put it on the tape. But yeah, Wiz would give me shit about handing the, the righty a lefty when they lost their stick on the bench. At least I was alert. Come on, Wiz. <laughs> uh, Columbus opened the season on Adam Phil uh, Adam Fantilli's birthday. And did you see that video? Uh, they had his awesome. parents. Awesome. So brother, nice. Real sweet. Tough not really to get emotional for him watching that. Oh. His brother and his parents. It just, yeah. that was really cool. I think he, at the end of it, said thank you to whoever did it from Columbus. That was well, an no, awesome Well, no, it was video. Babcock. That's why he was looking through his phone. <laughs> That's where he was getting all the clips. Yeah, it's too long to play here. But if, if you can check it out, by all means, do so. Uh, he got a text from Wayno, too. Uh, Saying good luck, happy yeah. birthday, right? Yeah. That was good stuff. What's the first text from Wayne Gretzky like? When you see that, like, hey, it's Wayne Gretzky. Like, what are you feeling when you when you get that? Uh, you feel like the coolest person <laughs> ever. And the best thing is, is he FaceTimes me from time to time now. And it's, yeah, he's just, I don't know. It's just fucking like, cool. Like you talking about your summer when you're like, yeah, I got to go visit Wayno for a couple days up in Gaza. Like just that one well, sentence. Well, it was a little awkward thing. when he caught me sniffing his underwear in his underwear drawer. <laughs> up <in a> <laughs> 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 you're like, what the hell are you doing in there, Biz? Like, wait, I love you, man. I just want to like, smell Biz is trying on his cup rings. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he comes in. I'm in his boxers. I got his fucking cup rings. Wearing on my, the old Jofa. Where, 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 I got it's his like Jofa. when Barelli was in robe. the uh, Islanders locker room yeah, and he was trying on Tavares' shoes. Yeah. And I got his walk in. I got his Gucci Gucci flip flops and robe on. <laughs> uh, Fantilli had an assist his first game. Played 13 minutes, 40 seconds, five out of ten on faceoffs, two shots. But looked good out there that first game. I'm not sure how much you saw of it. But wait, did you see the end of that game? Philly covered the puck line with 0.1 seconds. Oh, did you have Ray, it? You must no, I didn't. I didn't have it, but you would have thought it was. I mean, I'm just over the moon anytime that happens. Whoever has it, but yeah, yeah I was connect, connecting. Connect, it was it. like shoot it, shoot because he had the whole fucking zone himself. 0.1 seconds left. Busy. He's he, looked if great. He didn't miss that man. He's looked great. And uh, and shout out to Couturier. He he spent a lot of time not playing, and and he's back in. He looks a little bit thinner too, so he's moving around pretty decent for a guy who's been dealing with some back issues. And uh, I mean, buddy, like I would say for a good three, four years there, one of the best 200-foot game centers in, in the yeah. league. Yeah. Did he win a Selkie? If he didn't win one, he's been up for it. He's a guy. I think he. I think one year he put up 100 points, and he's a motherfucker to play no, against. Oh, he's never had 100 points. No, never had 100 points. Am I, am I out of my mind here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was the most he ever had was 76. Fuck me. I was uh, going good with the close. numbers, too. I mean, last two years, though, last year, only 29 games played. The year before that, only 45 right. games. Was he over a point a game that year when he had 76? Uh, no, he's never been God over. Damn, my business. Come on. Uh, when Columbus played the Rangers, uh, they got a nice little tribute for John, Jonathan. Hilarious. Quick. Did, you see, did you see that? Oh, my God. His, his reaction, the fact that they panned the bench and, and showed his face. So everybody who doesn't know the story got traded there last year um, at the deadline for, what, 24 hours? If that. If, that, if yeah. that. And they gave him a little tribute video, trolled themselves, and then right on the Jumbotron right after, panned down to him on the bench, and he was losing it. So that's the, that's the stuff right there. Yeah, pretty that's good the stuff. shit. Uh, the Flames uh, held an emotional tribute to Chris Snow before their five-three win over the Jets to open the season. Uh, his wife Kelsey dropped a ceremonial face-off puck, and son Cohen had fist bumps for all the boys going out, going out, and coming back after the game. Uh, just a real nice tribute to Chris. We, you know, we talked about him last episode. And hopefully, hopefully the family's doing doing okay with what they've dealt with uh, in the game itself. Uh, Markstrom versus Hellebuck. What a great goalie battle, battle that was. Both guys. I mean, I think both those guys have a little something to prove for different reasons. Markstrom had an off year last year. Hellebuck with the new contract. 
contract. Yep. Uh, entertaining game. But I think the real battle between Witten and uh, yeah, Winnipeg and Calgary last week was in the uh, AHL. Did you see that scrap? Oh, my God. Jeff, uh, that was Man old school. Manitoba's Jeffrey Veal, Calgary's uh, Alex Gallant. I mean, talk about turning back the clock. Just throwing fucking straight up bombs for fucking three minutes. I don't punch know, in the face contest. I, I don't know the kid for, uh, for it's Manitoba Moose, right? Vail? Yeah, Jeffrey Veal, yep. I don't, I don't know him. Obviously, he can fucking chuck him, but I fought that Gallant twice and oh really there's they're brothers i fought both of them one of them was playing for bridgeport one time i got a funny story about that too so if you fought two times a certain amount of times you would get a game suspension so we fought the one time and i think he kind of lost his edge so he wanted to fight me again and i was like oh god fuck this guy's so tough as nails and then i found out the next day he got to go fishing with his buddies because he got suspended because he'd he'd hit the two fights in one game so many times so it wasn't about falling he's like i just want to get suspended so he, so he got <laughs> sussied so we had a three and three and then we played them on the saturday sunday so sunday's game he was off fishing with his buddies he's like buddy thank you so much i get the day <laughs> off but you're like uh, ice in your eye you're like no problem but I want to say they're brothers or cousins. And then this one that, that you uh, just fought for uh, Calgary's farm team, uh, he was playing with the San Jose Barracuda. But these guys, pound for pound, are just nail guns. They just go. Western they're, boys? They're, they're, no, they're from, uh, I want to say they're from uh, PEI. They're, they're from out east, aren't they? Look, look, look at Alex Gallant. I want to say they're from the same place as the coach Gallant. And they might, there might even be some relation there as well. So these two guys, I was actually shocked to see the fact Summerside that he's, PE. PEI. Yeah. So these guys are just from the, gotta be from the rock related to Gerard. It has to be related to Gerard Gallant. And these guys are just nail guns. So the fact that they're st still doing it, shout out to them. And, and also like the whole, like fighting on a hockey thing, that was probably one of our most like, not viral, but like liked tweets do you see how many like how much engagement that had it's Fifty thousand it, it, likes. it just it. shows like people just love it they, they love the they eat it up uh, we got a, a special guest for uh grind my gears this week uh grind my gears always brought to you by big deal com slash finder and biz you're our special guest grind my gears this week and uh let's see what it was he got tuned up for us oh f i'm glad you remind me this <laughs> Jada Pinkett Smith grinds <laughs> my I was thinking of talking fucking about <laughs> gears, bro. But Will Smith might be even worse. Uh, what no, else? no. He's, Do something, Will. Yeah, yeah. Do something. He did. He fucking smacked Chris Rock to defend her because she was disgusted with Chris Rock's comment. So he goes up there and tries to be Lance Romance to all of a sudden, months later, after this guy gets sussied from the Academy... And she goes on to say, we've been separated. He's not even my husband. She fucking throws her husband under the bus. She's a piece of She's shit. She's a piece of shit. She goes, I don't even know why he said wife. Why is she even getting interviewed for these podcasts? If it wasn't for Will Smith and the fact that she sucked the dick off of Tupac's torso way back when. They, when were, so, they were soulmates, she said, too. Bullshit, dude. That's what she said. Bullshit. <laughs> she also said that she was slinging rock back in the day. Uh, she said that uh, Tupac proposed to her when he was behind bars in prison for whatever he was in prison for. She is the fucking worst. She grinds my gears. The fact that these quotes are still coming out and she's still being interviewed why is she famous she's famous for for marrying will smith am i out of no, line here no i just can't believe will smith like will smith maybe not now he was an a-list celebrity superstar actor and he is getting walked on i mean she was a nutty professor that 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 movie still slaps sherman ain't never had no relationship yeah, but <laughs> no i can't listen <laughs> will's gotta just Step up and say something. Well, he's dude. so in deep now. He's got to cut her half of what he's worth, and he's made all the dough. What What do you think Will Smith's net net worth is? Net, net worth got to be a couple hundred. Oh, easily. But like any marriage, you never know what goes on behind closed doors. You take a Hollywood Hollywood marriage. That's times a hundred, man. You this all. It's all a lot of PR bullshit.